And welcome everyone. We are here for day two of Stormbreak. And guess what? We are starting out spicy. Okay, for day two. We are starting out right away here. Gonna be watching Sayonara versus Seafoam. My name is Rissa, joined here by Falco. Falco, how are you doing this afternoon now for you? Yeah, I'm doing good. Clock just struck noon for me, so a perfect time for some Splatoon action. And like you said, this is actually the matchup I was looking forward to most with uh, what we saw in the bracket, Sayonara and Seafoam. We've seen uh, Seafoam do some really great things in Proving Grounds lately. Sayonara, a team that every every top level player and every low level player kind of knows of too. So this is just such a fir great first match that we're going to start off with. Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, when you look at teams that are in the top right now and really stand out you get to see them a lot on twitter these two teams are the ones that you get to see a lot and especially i've been watching both of their growths as of recently and they've just both been growing so much as teams you can see that they've really been practicing together and working together to get that much stronger so this is going to be a great set to start out here and starting out too uh i believe today is a uh best of three starting out am i correct um, I don't know if I'm the person to ask that because <laughs> I, I didn't really check. Um, but I, yeah. I think, okay. <laughs> yeah. Looking at it, this is going to be, uh, starting out here, a best of three. And then I believe right after this turns into a best of five. So, uh, we will be starting out here. It'll be quick. Uh, but, uh, it'll be a nice little window into looking at these two teams and how they play together so round one here going to be starting with splat zones haggle fish market and then after that turning into counter picks yeah so sayonara coming off of winning their bracket they got a 3-2 win yesterday over ascension in the winner's final sifo made it by winning the loser's bracket getting a 3-0 win over ozone so um you know, on paper too, I, I think people would say that Sayonara is favored and then, but Seafoam, again, they're just such a fun team to watch. They are, they're really fun. And I feel like it seems like like over the past week or two, they've really like started to grow as a team and you're starting to see their synergy build up. Um, and I've just been getting to watch that and see how well they're playing together. Uh, I'm excited too, I've heard that over the past couple days, Barry on Seafoam has been playing Heavy Splatling, so I'm interested to see if that's going to be true or not, but I've heard that it really pops off. And it's going to be really interesting looking at when you're against a, a charger like Q, Q, who's just absolutely amazing with E-Leaders and Snipers, uh, you know, is that Heavy Splatling going to come into play or are we going to see the Barry E-Leader come out for this? Yeah, you know, it kind of would be fun to see that Charger versus Charger. Of course, uh, both of these players are very well known for how well that they can play um, Chargers. So again, with um, a stage like this, you know, Splat Zones, Hagglefish uh, being pretty flat, you know, it's not uncommon to see Chargers. But yeah, if we uh, if we do see the Splat Link, that'd also be interesting to, to see what they can pull out. Mm -hmm. And of course... This map, I feel like you got to have at least one crab, if not two. And that's just the state of the game right now. You got to have one crab or two. <laughs> but yeah. this one in particular <laughs> definitely uh, is a really good map for crab. I mean, you can sit back on your side of the zone and shoot the expo shots, shoot just regular shots, or you can sit on the top of the canopy and uh, have that safety high ground to utilize that crab as well. Certainly. And, you know, with more at stake here, it, it's hard when the first round is going to be a best of three. Um, and it, of course, with the day two, you do have the losers bracket that you could potentially do well in as well. But, um, you know, the stakes are set pretty high, uh, pretty early in the game. So counter picks are just going to be all that much more important. Yeah, I didn't even think about that when it comes to how high the stakes are going to be for day two. You really have to really, really think about counter picks. I mean, of course, always going to be really thinking about counter picks, but you're at the level of the game when you reach that day two alpha bracket, when you're against Sayonaro and you're versus, versus Seafoam, you know, you really have to start thinking about the really deep intricacies of what this team's, you know, what will be the map pick and game mode pick that might stagger this team that you're playing against. 
Yeah, because, you know, counter picks definitely, you, you think about what am I good with versus what w could potentially the other team struggle with and uh, with the high profile players on both sides. And I mean, all of Alpha Bracket for that matter, all of the bracket that we're going to be showing today, uh, definitely some things to consider. Oh, absolutely. And I, you know, this first one here is going to be the only best of three that we get to watch on stream, but I'm not going to lie. I kind of hope that it is going to go to that game three because I really want to watch these two teams play against each other. Yeah, certainly. And I mean, if both teams can kind of get their lockout situated and able to push up, we could see uh, we could see some great things. And again, having um, having these players then push back, you know, getting kind of control of tent too to help push forward using your specials, throwing them on the zone and all that good stuff will uh, mm -hmm. will definitely benefit them. But again, mm -hmm. two teams like this, they, they know what's coming. Mm hmm. One thing that also came to my head here is when I'm looking at the Sayonara roster, I haven't seen them. I know that, of course, they definitely play with Legend um, a lot and previously have in Splat 2, but when it comes to thinking about Sayonara in Splatoon 3, I haven't got to see them play with Legend yet. So that's another thing that comes to mind where I'm excited to see how they mesh and play with Legend. I know Legend's a really, really great frontliner, really aggressive, really mechanically skilled. So seeing how they work around that and play around that will be really good. Of course, Dot Q is going to be on the charger uh, or backline anchor role. And then Sun, you know, typically has been known to play support, uh, whether that is going to be, you know, Splash or Junior. Uh, we'll have to see when we go into this set. And then, of course, Leafy, also another great frontliner aggro who can play a multitude of weapons very skillfully as an aggro. And then looking at the roster on the other side for Seafoam, Max uh, and Madness, great frontliners. Uh, you know, thinking about the meta right now, Max previously has been known as being a slosher player, but with the meta right now for Splatoon 3, you know, slosher isn't necessarily a weapon that is in the meta, so we'll have to see if Max does stick to playing slosher. The, I feel like Kyo and Max are the only, like, sloshers I see really die hard, like, trying to play it, but we'll see if it actually comes out here in this match. Shadowwind, I know, has been playing support, which is, like, Junior, Splash, Barry, of course, talked about that anchor role, possibly going to be playing Heavy Splatling or E-Leader. And then Madness, like I said, another great frontliner who can play a multitude of weapons really well. Yeah, um, they they are, and I, I think they're finally getting ready to get in the lobby. Um, I know we had a few more things that we were kind of, kind of waiting on and getting situated with, but, uh, you know, it's still, it's still pretty early. We mentioned um, for you, it's just after 9 a.m. So some of these players too could just be uh, just be waking up as well and uh, getting yeah. situated for, for day two. I know it can be really hard to do that. Um, so, hey, it looks like we're finally hopping into our first game. So let's get started with the day two of Stormbreak of Sayonara versus Seafoam. All right, so looking at the comps here, gonna be really interesting. First thing right off the bat I see is I believe that's Q. Yes, Q playing Flingza. Definitely a thing that has been in the meta right now, anchor players switching over to playing Flingza so that way they can utilize missile for their teammates. And then on the other side, we get to see that Barry E-leader come out right away. The zone here gonna be in favor of Seafoam as this match gets started. Yeah, and we are going to be seeing that double splash come out like we had mentioned before on the side of Sayonara. And with that, Seafoam is going to get the first cap and actually get a few players down as well. So they're making very quick work of this, being able to take the zone and pushing forward. So now here we see this, uh, we see the splash just trying to paint up and build some crab as Sayonara is now finding a way to break back in with Sun and Legend. Look at this, Legend already approaching the zone, sharking up, trying to take out, uh, take out the crab, not able to do so, but now two players down on Seafoam and Sayonara gets the cap with their own. Sayonara, that was really good of them. They knew that they just needed to push up and get to the zone to at least cap it. They know that they have these sides of the zone to paint, but the, it was really important for them to at least push up and get the zone capped. That has completely pushed Seafoam away. Now Seafoam, though, none of them went down necessarily, and they are able to just push back right away with specials that Inkjet and uh, this crab coming out here. 
Yeah, and look at this. We see them trying to avoid the crab and now the missiles as well. I love, I love to see a frontline crab like that, and that's actually going to help Sayonara take back the zone. Uh, but it's not going to be not going to be for long because Seafoam is going to contest the zone and actually take it back. So not necessarily the push that Sayonar was hoping for at this moment because now they have 27 penalty points just from not having the zone capped for roughly uh, like three seconds or so. This looks like it's getting a little bit hairy. Looked like it was for a little bit there, but finally Seafoam able to just team up, make sure they paired up to take down the remaining members on the sides there of Sayonara, able to push up, cap the zone, and now start counting down these penalty points. But I mean, Sayonara came back right away really fast. Leafy does go down there, so that is going to stagger sayonara coming back in and this oh my gosh this crab and zuka 1v1 zuka able to overcome that crab and now seafoam once again has his own and is pushing up throwing bombs making sure they are guarding the zone yeah, that was really crucial for Seafoam. Use your special just to get the last player alive who's a crab. You need to use your uh, Trizuka to do that. So that, that is definitely going to benefit Seafoam as they now are dwindling away at their points. Sayonara finding a hard time to break in. We see Seafoam just waiting for Sayonara members to drop down. It looks like a crab is going to be ready for Seafoam. Missiles coming out, and look at that. Three players are now going to go down. This is going to be a cap for Sayonara with just over two minutes left. They have some time that they can work with, but they really really want to focus on this lockout and look at that snipe there by Dark Cube. That was an amazing snipe there uh, and <laughs> by Barry they're able to just spot out Leafy. I mean with that close range using that E leader able to get that snipe. Now Seafoam once again with getting Leafy down able to start getting in a position to push up. You can see they all avoided those missiles really nicely. Now trying to push up and get the zone with two members of Sayonara being down right now. You can see Madness there coming up on the left side of the map, trying to get a flank in, but Q just turns around and is able to spot that flank out with that Flingza. Flingza has actually been uh, really interesting to fight close up because if you're not careful, that thing will take you down. And that's exactly what we got to see there. Now the zone is just completely juggling back and forth right now as both teams are doing everything they can to get the upper hand. Yeah, we see Legend over here on the side trying to flank a little bit and get some picks. It doesn't look like it's going to work out now, but we do see the crab ready on Sayonara. We see the blue bomb thrown by Seafoam, thrown into the zone to try and contest it. We are going to see a trade too, and another crab ready on Seafoam's side as they're trying to cap 2v2. Uh, this is where it's going to get a little tricky for Sayonara because you really want to make sure you have the player advantage. And with the missiles to help displace some of the members on Seafoam, that's going to help. And now Sayonara has the zone on their own. But what they struggle with is keeping it capped for more than just a few seconds. They do. They aren't able to necessarily cap the zone and then push up past that. So that has been an issue for them that they, they're they going to have to figure out how they need what they need to do as a team to be able to push up past the zone and be able to work together. Right now, Seafoam in the last 30 seconds here does have the zone in their control and they are just completely pushed up. I mean, there is a crab just pointing directly at Sayonara's spawn here. Now, Sayonara coming out with their, a crab of their own in the last 15 seconds. Let's see if they are able to at least cap the zone. Yeah, with 10 seconds left, it's going to be hard. In Seafoam, this was the most that they were able to push up and start and continue this lockout phase. But Sayonara are quick to respond. We do see the crab that was in the zone. And now uh, that looks like the machine able to get a few picks too. So again, Sayonara has the zone right now in overtime, not really having any player advantages. 2v2. They just have to stop Madness and Barry from poking into the zone. The help of the Waybreaker, it's not going to work. So Seafoam getting the win on game one. Seafoam, they just did a really good job at, you know, it seemed like they weren't really necessarily going down or if they had a member of their team go down, they were doing a really good job at playing off of that and not pushing in too far. Um, and I mean, that long range presence of that E leader, I think really helped them too. Barry was able to watch flanks really nicely with that E leader and their teammates were able to just really follow up off of that really nicely. So now with Seafoam winning game one, that means that Sayonara will be coming out with the counter pick for game two. Yeah, what I really liked about that first game is how 
Sayonara, they were close, and we mentioned that they couldn't really keep the cap for so long, but they never let Seafoam push up too far until about one minute remaining, which I think is when it was very crucial for Seafoam to kind of seal the deal. But Sayonara, you know, it went into overtime with the help of the missiles, help of, uh, help of everything that was kind of thrown towards the zone, they were able to contest. But again, at that moment, you can't afford to let the zone get uncapped and give Seafoam an opportunity to recap. So uh, definitely a challenge for Sayonara in that one. And yeah, we'll see what they choose as their counter pick. Mm -hmm. That'll be really interesting. Like you said, too, it seemed like Sayonara, they absolutely could get to the zone and cap the zone. And then by the time they were able to start painting up the sides to get ready to add more presence to the map, it just felt like Seafoam just got their specials and regrouped so fast that Sayonara didn't necessarily have time to react to that. So that'll be, uh, you know, a part of their play in the way that they play around each other to see how they can play around that going into this next game. And speaking of this next game, the counter pick has come in here. As we see, it's going to be Tower Control on Inkblot Art Academy. You know, this is a... Uh... This should be no surprise to a lot of people who have uh, watched some of these high-level tournaments lately. This is just the the counter, the default counter pick that every team has been going with. Uh, you know, familiar all around, and again with two two very strong backliners on these teams. This this really should be no surprise. Mhm. Mm yeah, thinking about you know, assuming that Dot Q will play E leader or Charger potentially. Uh, Slings, of course, definitely I could see that coming into play here too, but uh, just just imagining, you know, those two really, really strong E-leaders here. There's so many areas where the E-leader can get positioned safely and get really good snipes. So I could see that being a really, really good counter pick and potentially, you know, maybe this map will, since it's not just, it's not just a big open map like Hagglefish, potentially this will give you know, Sayonara, the ground cover and air ledges that they needed to be able to safely play. Well, let's see these weapons coming out. We see Doc Q with the charger and we do see Barry with the E leader. So again, chargers on both sides, uh, the double splash coming out on the side of Sayonara once again, and uh, a very similar comp to what we had already seen from Seafoam. Mm -hmm. One main switch up I see is uh, Leafy actually going onto the gal instead of the machine this time. I think that's a really, really good play. That killer whale could really, really be a good point for them to potentially push back that uh, charger. So let's see how it is going to play out here. Looks like the first uh, pick is going to go onto Sayonara. Now two members down on the side of Sayonara, two members down though on the side of Seafoam. Three members, actually that's a complete wipe all of a sudden. Now Sun instantly pushing up into Seafoam's base, getting ready to get a push going. Yeah, what was really nice there for Sayonara, they knew they had a small player disadvantage and were just prepared for defense. And that's what helped them get the very quick lockout and able to make a counter push of their own. We see them already getting past that first checkpoint very, very quickly. And it seems as if this tower is uncontested. Maybe the Trizuka was pushing up, but look at this push up too from Sayonara. Uh, not able to get the splat, but allowing Doc Q to stay on the tower using the ink back too, but two players are now gonna be down. If this could be enough to get them to the third checkpoint, get some of their members to jump in, it could be very crucial, but no, it looks like this push will be done, but getting all the way to 21, with a minute and a half into the game. Very, very good push by Sayonara. Really good push. I think it really, really shows through of, you know, this was their counter pick and it seems like they are really, really comfortable on it. I mean, Leafy and Q and Legend already pushing up into mid onto the sides, just already acting as a nuisance to Seafoam. Seafoam having to play this really carefully. You know, they haven't had time to necessarily paint up the map and get mid right now. So they are just having to play this really carefully as Sayonara in turn is playing super aggressively right now. Yeah, and Seafoam now doing a good job taking more control of mid. Uh, you know, Say Sayonara is finding ways that they can try and flank. Unfortunately, it's not going to work. So this could be Sayonara's push if they want to continue pushing it. And it looks like they do. They really want to try and spot Leafy, who's up there on the top left. 
um, as the Trizuka is trying to aim that way. We do see the Crab also trying to roll in from Sayonara. Uh, not able to get many picks here, uh, but Seafoam, you know, you go, you get trades in this situation. Unfortunately, it's not going to help you push. You're now going to be three players down, and uh, it's going to give Sayonara another opportunity to take control of mid. Yeah, Sayonara just instantly playing off of those picks that they got onto Seafoam and instantly playing off of that backup Seafoam had to do. Now Seafoam once again in this position, stuck in their spawn, stuck in their bats, trying to play defense right now and having to play this really carefully. Uh, Sayonara is just continuing to have this aggression, having that killer whale come out, having that vacuum come out and Seafoam just trying to juggle those specials as they are just trying to stop the tower and get in a position too. Yeah, one thing we saw, it was Madness who was sharking by the tower, waiting to try and get the players from Sayonara who were going to push up. And that helped them get the stop. I mean, still, the tower went all the way to about 30 or 40 in that position, but a good stop by Sayonara, uh, if, or sorry, a good stop by Seafoam. So they're now, uh, now going to be trying to push up into mid as well. Uh, taking control of the left stack, that's gonna be really good to get uh, to get Barry on and try and get some splats, but I know uh, I know everybody knows <laughs> where they're gonna be standing, so. Uh, mm -hmm. Max now going up for the Booyah and the Trizuka. This could be the push to extend their, uh, their points for now, but a few players are gonna go down. The Crab are gonna be on the top left, and still some more picks coming out. Still more picks, and you can see this really, really good aggression in the bats following up that crab that had... That was a really, really nice play, but Sayonara just kind of auto-focused the tower, and they're making sure that they are stopping this tower when it comes to getting to the second checkpoint. Now, Leafy and Legend just grouping up really, really nicely together to get those picks onto Madness and Max. So right now, Seafoam, you know, they are not going down with a fight. They are just continuing to keep this mid presence. They are not giving up mid as we go into the last 30 seconds. They're going to have to figure out how to get these final picks onto Sayonara to get a really, really strong push with 46 and Sayonara having the lead at 21. It definitely has the potential for Seafoam to be able to take the lead here. Yeah, and look at this map control. You pointed it out earlier at mid, but now on the side of Sayonara's side, I was going to say they need to push some of their players up and use their specials. That's exactly what Seafoam did, but they are going to be one player down. Leafy now trying to push up and get Shadow. Uh, Leafy's still going to be... Uh, oh, they're going to be going down, but now Sun is on the tower just trying to push it out. They know that Max here is going to be trying to get them, but no, it's not going to be enough. So, uh, once again, this... Uh, a very, very fun game, but this one now going to Sayonara, and it looks like we will be going into a deciding game three. Yes, this was exactly what I wanted. I was like, seeing these two teams, I was like, I want to see a game three. This this has got to be, I want to see it. And that's exactly what we get to see. So now, since that last game that we watched, Tower Control on Inkblot Art Academy was Sayonara's counterpick, Seafoam lost that counterpick choice so now going into this game three will be seafoam's counterpick uh and man thinking about that last match i mean that was so good of sun just to get on the tower and crab and just get it away from seafoam potentially even getting the lead and since sun was in crab too you know there's not nothing that uh, seafoam could do it's a crab what are you gonna do <laughs> Yeah, something that we have seen a lot of these players do is just use the crab kind of as a baller in Splatoon 2, just as a defensive mechanism of, I'm going to stand here, you can shoot at me, I probably won't get splatted because I'm just going to be rolling around and be a distraction, so... Uh, that, that's always good to see. And I mean, having a 1-1 one, one should really be no surprise at this stage uh, with these players, Sayonara and Seafoam. Again, if Sayonara wins, uh, then, or if Sayonara loses, then this will be their first set loss because they won 3-2 in the winner's bracket yesterday against Ascension. And Seafoam winning in the loser's finals over Ozone uh, with Oro Jackson winning that bracket. So, um... Again, Seafoam hoping that they can pull it off, but you're going to have to, you, you do have your counter pick, which is going to mm -hmm. be nice. So you you are in control, but uh, it's, uh, I mean, you, you can always win on the opponent's counter pick, especially with these mm -hmm. two teams. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. With teams, these two teams at this high of a level, you can absolutely win on the other team's counter pick. I mean, these, these 
teams are just constantly playing these maps that are, you know, in rotation in tournaments. So they know what they like to do for certain maps and modes. But, you know, sometimes it just comes down to you're going to be thinking about when it comes to this counter pick. OK, do we want to play something that, you know, we know that maybe Dot Q can't be on Charger or it will be kind of awkward? Or are you going to play something that you just know you're really comfortable with? I mean, it seemed like for that last match we watched Tower Control in Claw Art Academy, it almost felt like for Sayonara counterpicking that, it just seemed like something they were super comfortable on because they just came out really, really dominant. So there's so many factors that come into those counterpicks. And you can see Seafoam is really, really thinking about it, how they want to go into this game three. Yeah, I was just about to say, uh, <laughs> typically these counter picks don't take that long um, with just knowing what could be coming up. And you're right, like, mm -hmm. um, th but this is the moment where you need to have your right counter pick. You want to stay in the winner's bracket. You don't want to go down to the loser's bracket and have um, potentially more games that you would have to play if you want to end up winning this tournament. And again, there's 16 teams playing in this alpha bracket, so uh, 16 of the best teams, and it looks like we will be going to Rainmaker, Sturge, and Shipyard. So once again, uh, not a map and mode that people should really be surprised with. Mm -hmm. This is like like you said previously, Falco, about the Tower Control Inkblot Art Academy. This is another one of those maps and modes where, okay, we're so used to playing this. We've played it so many times on, in Splatoon 2. We know how this map and mode plays, and it's definitely more comfortable to us. So I could see this being uh, a good counter pick. And thinking about, you know, it's Rainmaker, Sturgeon, you have to play a lot more fast, a lot more, uh, you know, not as stationary. So I'm wondering if this maybe will potentially put Dot Q off of that charger. But then when you think about it too, you know, of course, Seafoam does have Barry on E leader and that's another really, really stationary weapon. So gonna be really interesting to see what uh, the Seafoam has in mind for their comp for this one. Yeah, and you know, that's what those players are thinking of too, potentially. What is the other team going to be changing? What could we be changing? And I think it kind of starts with what the, what the back line is going to use, because then you need to adjust your play style by that. So let's take a look, and it looks like we will see the Flingsa come back out for Sayonara uh, with Doc Q using that, and Barry once again with the E-Leader. Okay, so looking pretty reminiscent of the first match that we got to see, having that Flingza back. But actually, Leafy, instead of going back to Machine, is going to be sticking on that 52. I think that's a really, really good pick. Okay, and as we were looking at weapons, two members of Sayonara are down already. Shadow instantly grabs the Rainmaker to start trying to push it to that first checkpoint, but is called out by missiles. So really, really good missiles there from Dot Q on the defense, having those ready right away. Yeah, that's something you really want to take advantage of. If you can set the tone early, take advantage of having a two two players on your side just to get that early push, just get the Rainmaker over on that left checkpoint. And uh, again, set the tone against Sayonara. And it looks like they're going to attempt this, but missiles are coming out at the perfect opportunity uh, for Sayonara to, to help contest this jump. Again, it's really hard to pull that off when you have missiles coming on you. And now we're able to see Sun and Dot Q and Leafy all just drop on this left side. But Barry is able to make it up to the top. And now two players are going to be down on Sayonara. So Barry's just going to make an audible with Max and take it to the mid checkpoint as well. Uh, so they are going to get to 55 and get that early Rainmaker pop. I was I was so glad that they switched to that right pedestal because so many members of Sayonara were on that left pedestal. So really, really good play from Seafoam, switching it up to at least get that first checkpoint. Now three members down of Seafoam. It's just Barry there backing up on that E leader and Sayonara pushing into mid, popping that Rainmaker and starting to get ready to get a push going of their own. You can see they're just really working on regrouping. They do have three specials at the ready, so they just have to get in a position maybe potentially get a pick so that way they can start getting the momentum for a push. Yeah, and look at this crab all over here on uh, on the moving part of the platform. Uh, so Sayonara, they had control of mid, had didn't really find an opportunity to push up, and it looks like now it's going to happen with the help of the killer whale. But no, uh, Doc Q is going to go down to something. I believe it was a bomb of some sort. I couldn't see what it was. Um, but, you know, 
hoping you can get to that checkpoint, but again, you, you push the Raymaker, you make it over the jump, that's half the battle. Of course, you have to then go up and grab the Raymaker. So just like we had seen before from Seafoam, Sayonara now opting to take it to the right pedestal, but just coming up shy. It, it felt like deja vu there. They were doing the exact same thing so Seafoam did, recognizing, okay, all, all these members of the other team are on this side of the map, let's go to this side of the map. So I think that was definitely a good call, even though they didn't get the checkpoint, that was definitely a good call for them. Now Seafoam here popping the Rainmaker Shadow, grabbing it just to make sure that no one from Sayonara can sneak up and try and grab that Rainmaker to get it to that first checkpoint. And now with two members down of Sayonara, this is th now three members actually, you know, Seafoam did have the Rainmaker, it does go down, but Seafoam here is doing good still. They have this mid control. They are just waiting for Sayonara to try and get into mid. Yeah, what I like there, Seafoam had a very patient game, just like taking their time to try and regroup and get back to mid, and you just had one player flank and push up on Sayonara to get the splat. So at the end, that is going to help Seafoam because now they do have control of mid. And once again, as soon as they're trying to push over and jump up, we do see the missiles come out, but Shadow able to make this jump right now. And again, this is a very, very close game, just favoring Seafoam ever so slightly, but one strong push is all it takes to make a, make a difference and change the lead. Mm -hmm. A Rainmaker moment could happen at any any time. I mean, if, if Sayonara is able to just get that one opportune moment, they have a minute left, so it could absolutely happen. Both teams have one member down. Now two members down of Seafoam. This could be exactly what Sayonara needs to get the lead. They do have to be careful, though. Barry there on that E-leader is watching on that top right, so definitely have to be careful of that. Think about how you want to position this push as all the members, now it's just three members of Seafoam are coming back on the defense. Yeah, and look at this, trying to flank up and get the crab, but it's not going to work. They are going to be spotted by Shadow, um, <laughs> who's going to get the stop, and now three players down on Sayonara. So this is just going to work for Seafoam. Play the patient game like they had played before. You have the lead, you don't have a pretty lead, but just keep control of map the map and you know call out all of Sinar's flanks but no there are going to be opting to grab it and pulling it back so once again the risky move but look at sun they lost the rainmaker oh my gosh they lost the rainmaker they are grabbing it once again and pushing back missiles come out from q you can see seafoam is just oh doing gosh. everything they can to avoid those missiles and run back that got really scary there for a second for seafoam but they were able to make the right call. Barry just running for their life, running backwards, avoiding those missiles very nicely. And Sayonara definitely came out really, really nicely with those missiles. Q able to just use those. And the team, you could see they were trying to play off of those really nicely, but it was just so close to the end there that Seafoam able to take that game three and take the set. Yeah, oh, such a risky ending. You know, it, typically you think, okay, we have five seconds, so we're going to be good. But no, Sayonara showed aggression and were able to stop the Raymaker once. And we're very close to having to avoid missiles. And I forget which member of Seafoam who got very close. Um, now they could have splatted the Rainmaker. I don't know if they would have had enough manpower to try and pop the Rainmaker and pick it up. It would have been crazy points if it were to happen. But uh, regardless, Seafoam's going to be winning the set 2-1, to one, knocking Sayonara down to the loser's bracket. So that, with Seafoam winning that, moving on through the winner's side of the bracket... We will have to see what comes up next. And uh, before we take a quick break, I just wanted to say that don't forget that you can donate to the prize pool. It's at $1,326.11 right now. I'm sure that someone in chat will be able to do the donate command. And that way you can see that link there. Click on that link if you would like to donate to the prize pool and help out these teams that are playing in this tournament. Uh, and with that being said, don't go anywhere. We are going to take a very short break and be back with more action for day two of Stormbreak.
Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Stormbreak Day 2. I am Falcofire, joined here by Rissa. Coming up next, we're going to have the second uh, match of the day. It's going to be winner's quarter final match between Alliance Rogue and Ascension. Alliance Rogue going completely undefeated yesterday, winning all of their sets 3-0. And Ascension winning in the loser's final of the bracket that Sayonara was in. They won that loser's final 3-0 over 19-04. Um, so, again, uh, some good matchups today already, and we saw, you know, we had just seen uh, Seafoam beat Sayonara 2-1, to one, and earlier today, Ascension beat Oro Jackson 2-1 to one with Alliance Rogue uh, winning based off of a, uh, a DQ no-show from Hex. Mm, okay. Uh, so, I mean, Falco was going over, you know, who's won what so far and it's just really interesting watching you know which teams have beaten this team but then this team's beaten this team so i mean this is just starting out we are starting out day two just with so many interesting sets and teams going on here and now moving on to this one that we get to watch next alliance rogue of course a very well known team kiver gray urza and jay gonna be on the roster today and then uh ascension you know has been doing really really well i feel like they've just been playing together i've seen them playing in multiple tournaments and doing really well shinex evan swin and twig uh they are known to play just super aggressively and super fast so this is gonna be i mean i feel like alliance rogue also plays super aggressively and super fast so i think this is gonna be quite the treat to watch uh the second set of the day on the stream yeah and i do want to point out too alliance rogue they actually competed in uh i'll say two tournaments yesterday with having the splat world championships being more in the morning early afternoon for them and then having storm break day one so they've had a lot of of course we all know who these players are we all know how great alliance rogue is uh they've had a lot of fantastic games yesterday too so anytime you can go completely undefeated, sweep the board in day one, uh, you're definitely going to be a threat. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, I mean, of course, Starburst is in this tournament. Sayonara, Seafoam, Alliance Rogue. Uh, the Kyo's uh, pickup that Kyo has for this. There's so many strong teams and it's really, really going to come into play what's going to happen here and who's going to be, you know, the top team today for this tournament. I think this will be a good stage setter for that. And uh, so that last set that we watched was a best of three. Now moving on to a best of five here for this second set that we get to watch. And we will be starting out on Splat Zones Museum. After that, we will continue with, like we saw previously, the counter picks coming into play and counter picks coming out for the rest of the best of five set yeah now you have a little more opportunity to breathe uh if you're ascension you won your very first set uh with having only a best of three alliance rogue you know didn't play in a set prior to this one so um starting off fresh but again <laughs> a team that you probably don't really need to uh mm -hmm. to probably doesn't need to warm up very much uh, in order to do well. So this will be a test for Ascension uh, to see how well they can do. Mm -hmm. I was also looking over the bracket too. I mean, looking at some of these other teams, uh, Melangod, Kyo's team uh, with Japanese players went 2-0 over Hypnosis. Uh, and then Starburst going 2-0 over Last Resort. Uh Graveyard Shift goes, uh, and Cat Meta, Cat Meta goes 2 0 over that. Comet goes 2 0 over Cherry Limeade. Um, so, some notable sets and some notable teams that we all know throughout this tournament. Some teams going into the loser bracket still going to be in the running for this tournament, of course, as they fight their way through the loser side of the bracket. Yeah, and yesterday there were, I believe, um, four teams total who went completely undefeated that being Melon God, mm. Comet, Alliance Rogue, um, Oro Jackson, and Starburst. So I believe five teams uh, total. Oh, wow. So it's it's really cool to see. Um, you know, some of the brackets you had a three-two final, such as Graveyard Shift over Penguin. Uh, but a lot of these teams, it's it's kind of to be expected too. Um, so when when these teams get to face each other potentially in the winners uh, winners semis, winners finals, that's those are going to be the good sets to watch too. Mm-hmm. Those will be when the teams that have all been going five uh, 
are completely undefeated fight against each other that's going to be so interesting to watch and see how they play around each other uh and i feel like it we're already seeing it right now in this tournament and but once we get to then the meta and what the meta is going to be what it is right now i think will be really really telling and we're already getting to see some of that as we watched seafoam versus sayonara this next set, of course, I think will be really interesting too. Alliance Rogue versus Ascension uh, and what weapons these teams play. I feel like, you know, I haven't got to watch Alliance Rogue play much of Splatoon 3 yet. So that's one thing that I'm really excited to see. and See what weapons they play, see what comps they run. Uh, There's so many players where I just think about the weapons and comps that they played in Splatoon 2. And I just associate them with that weapon and that comp with their team but then i come into splatoon 3 and their weapon pool has completely shifted around so still in the early stages of splatoon 3 i think it's so fun to watch as a commentator and viewer and player and see what these players play what the meta is and how they switched up the weapons that they play generally yeah, let's get started with our second set of the day against uh, Alliance Rogue versus Ascension. So here's the weapon choices that we see. You wanted to see this, Rissa. We see the machine. We see the expo coming out from Alliance Rogue. And we see the tri Slasher coming out um, from the side of Ascension with Genex using that one. Genex has been so dedicated to just playing that tri Slasher. I've seen it over the past couple months here. And they play it so well and so aggressively and so just flank heavy with it they're really aggressive with it using the ninja squid that it utilizes as well now two members down at the start of ascension right now as alliance rogue has the zone you can see you can see alliance rogue they grouped up they knew exactly where that last member of ascension was and they make sure that they made that member jump out now ascension having some specials ready starting to try and push in with that inkjet and that crab yeah, they just painted that map so quickly and were able to push up. And now Ascension able to get a few picks, and we see one person making it to mid. That is going to be Shinex, who's able to get some paint. I don't think it's going to be enough to contest as they're trying to build up their special to get the Inkjet, but still able to get some picks. This zone is now being contested, but the help of the rain from Alliance Rogue isn't going to help them. And like that, two players are going to go down from Ascension, and Alliance Rogue is going to hold on to the zone. Alliance Rogue, once again, I mean, they have the zone and you can see they know exactly where those members of Ascension might be sharking or just waiting. And you can see they're calling that out together, making sure that they play together so nicely to call out these members of Ascension. Shinex here having Evan jump in, trying to do everything they can to paint the zone with their weapons at the last second. But Alliance Rogue just had an eye on exactly where all the members of Ascension were at all times, it felt like. So Ascension, not able to at least cap the zone here. Alliance Rogue going to be taking this game one. Yeah, Ascension had a few opportunities where they were able to break into the zone, but unfortunately, there just wasn't really any support. You know, I go back to think when Shinex was doing that, uh, breaking into mid, trying to, trying to paint, but really having not much support. So... Um, all of the attention is going to be drawn on you whenever that happens. It can serve as a distraction for the other team, but Alliance Rogue, they know to take you out and go right back to continuing the lockout phase. So a uh, very, very tough game for Ascension, uh, but any game against Alliance Rogue is going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. Alliance Rogue definitely have, they have so much synergy that they've built up over time. They are able to carry that into Splatoon 3 and utilize that. Synergy is a really, really important part of a team and team play and knowing how your teammates play and how to play around that. So we could definitely see that there in that game one. But now, oh my gosh, is this deja vu? We are, I was just going to say it was Ascension's turn for the counter pick and we are going back to Tower Control and Inkblot Art Academy. We saw this previously, Sayonara picking this as their game two counter pick so we are going to be going straight back to tower control inkblot art academy i think this is a good pick for ascension i mean having that tri slosher able to utilize all the ledges that it has the tight spaces i think this will be a good counter pick for them yeah what's going to be really important for ascension too is to just not let orion's rogue get that early <laughs> wipe out uh mm -hmm. to just push that tower so um Again, Alliance Rogue did a great job in game one with just the map control after taking the zone. And you know that's going to be their agenda for the second game. Just like get the early push and set the tone early. So 
something that Ascension will try and have to combat as, uh, as yeah, we go on to this game too that I'm sure all of us are very shocked to see <laughs> as Tower Control Inkbot. <laughs> I think it's funny how you said this is at this high level, this is the map in, a map and mode that we just constantly see and we are already seeing it right away here for this counter pick. And I mean, when I think about counter picks, I'd want to play on two. I definitely would want to play on this. It's it's comfort. It's a comfort pick. I know how to play it. I know all the different stages of it and um, know how I want to play around it. So I think this is definitely a safe counter pick and we'll have to see. I'm wondering, I'm wondering too, of course, if there will be any weapon switch ups. I believe Jay is actually a uh, also a charger player that plays charger really well too. So is that X flow going to come back? Are we going to see more charger? We'll have to see. Yeah, I, it, it's possible too with um, it being tower control and um, again, just ha like you mentioned before, you, we know these players and what they played in Splatoon 2, and it's interesting to see what they pick up in Splat 3, just mm -hmm. having a diff slightly different loadout. So uh, definitely things to consider, especially for your Ascension. Um, you know, if you lose that first game without taking the zone at all, there there definitely will be some things that you want to kind of counter and think, OK, well, you know, Lion's Rogue, they had they had an Explosher and a machine. What can we use to counter that? So uh, you know, mm -hmm. that's why we see this kind of taken a little bit. I'm sure Ascension is taking their time to figure out their comp. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Think about their comp. Think about what their game plan is. If there's anything they need to be doing differently as they go into this game two on tower control. So looking at the comps here, comps are coming out. Ooh, that is okay. I was not expecting that. We are seeing a double machine double splash on the side of alliance rogue was not expecting that and then on the other side we get to see swen going over to the e leader twig on that 52 of course evan on the machine and shinex still on that tri slosher but look at this this is a change of pace from what we saw in the first game alliance rogue had two members who were going to go down ascension unfortunately couldn't get on the tower to cap it they only got on just for a brief moment so that would have been their opportunity to push it but alliance rogue doing what they do best and just getting that wipe out this is exactly what ascension didn't want to happen but alliance rogue with their comp they really don't have much range but they have just such lethal power on their side to get picks and we see jay just standing on the tower when the rest of alliance rogue is able to push up and just spread paint everywhere oh my goodness yeah spreading paint everywhere utilizing that double splash the paint heaviness of the splash is so so present here i mean having the lethals of these crabs paired with the paint pa paired with the lethal of that machine is just allowing them to push up really really aggressively you see shinex there tried to come around and just flank the tower at least and that was a good point of stalling the tower for ascension that allowed twig to drop into mid here we see twig just instantly painting mid here knowing that they need to get that mid control getting that whale ready and using it right away they know they have to play really aggressively and really fast if they want to keep up with the aggression of alliance rogue right now yeah, and we can't see it right now, but Scar's over there on the right side trying to find an opportunity to potentially break in. Um, I believe now they are coming up with the Fizzy. Yes, they are going to throw it to help get some more map control for Alliance Rogue. But Ascension doing a better job this round, just getting the picks and identifying the members. But Alliance Rogue more spread out this time because they know that Ascension needs to be aggressive to try and get some of these picks. Now, finally, Ascension taking the tower and starting to push it to this first checkpoint. But Jay there on that machine just sits back and machines the tower, gets that pick onto Swen. But Shinex here able to just follow up, jump on the tower, make sure that they get past this first checkpoint, allows Swen to jump in. And now this could be the moment for Ascension to try and push up and get past the second checkpoint, at least getting to it. Swen there gets called out there as they try to get as many points on the board as they possibly could. So they are now able to at least get past the first checkpoint, take a little breather, make sure they build up their momentum here again as they start trying to push into mid as alliance rogue has instantly taken mid control 
Yeah, that was the most aggressive push that we have seen from Ascension so far. So we know that they are capable of doing it against Alliance Rogue, but Alliance Rogue once again just on this counter put uh, on this push, trying to push up and spot some of these members. And we can't see it here, but Gray is over at the very top right of the map, who's already pushed up into Ascension's base, <laughs> trying to get some splats. That is going to force the wipeout now as Ascension trying to get some more map control. Um, and there's still some action there. As <laughs> look, it looks like. A uh, I believe that's Kiver who's still alive um, pushing up over on Ascension side. So as long as Alliance Road just keeps up this aggression, keeps getting these picks, look at this, three players down 2v1 in the situation in the wipeout. Alliance Rogue, they are playing very aggressive. They don't need to be since they already have a pretty comfortable lead. But as soon as you can just make Ascension scramble and make them more uncomfortable, it's going to make your game easier. Mm -hmm. Alliance Rogue, like you said, they know that they have the lead, but it looks like they are playing for the knockout. They are in it right now. They have Grey on the tower using that crab to just safely push the tower, getting more points on the board as they get to the second checkpoint. Finally, though, Ascension able to fall around the tower and stop that tower push that was going on. But unfortunately, two members of Ascension do go down. Kiver and Scar just pushed up, with Jay even, just pushed up so aggressively, uh, trying to just safely get in a position to not let Ascension play any defense right now. This aggression from Alliance Rogue is insane. Yeah, and even if the tower just kind of stays up by this tree, that's going to work out for you if you're Alliance Rogue. You can just keep jumping in members and getting these 1v1s. And again, trades just are going to benefit whoever is leading at this moment. And that is Alliance Rogue, as the tower is definitely on their side. Um, a very nice save staying alive there by um, by one of the members from Ascension. But yeah, it, it, it's going to be hard for them to break back in. I don't know if you can rely on or potentially get a wipeout at this moment because Alliance Rogue has control of mid and they're able to 1v1 you. So um, it, it's going to be hard, especially now with a two player disadvantage. Definitely. We're in the last four seconds here. Three members down though of Alliance Rogue, but a lot of pain ahead that does need to be painted into Ascension's green ink. So in order for Ascension to be able to push this tower even safely, we see Swen here on the tower trying to just peek out and get any snipes that they can. This Booyah Bomb does come out from Evan there as they are continuing to push past the second checkpoint. Two members down of Alliance Rogue right now. Shinex jumps in to secure the tower. Swen there holding down as much as they can of the tower and just those jump ins. The holding the tower allowed Ascension to get the lead there. Ascension gonna be taking game two. The best move came at when it was needed most from Ascension. Getting that push, making Alliance Rogue scramble, they were able to do it. I'll be honest, I didn't give them enough credit towards the end of uh, the end of regulation of that match, and they proved me wrong. As Ascension, such a good job on identifying where Alliance Rogue members are, being able to push up and just keeping the aggression. And again, tying the setup one to one, you put Alliance Rogue now in a position where they have a counter pick. This is a this is a juicy set, Rissa. This is um like you were you saying has has anyone taken any games off of Alliance Rogue that you know of so far? No, that was Alliance Rogue's first loss in this entire tournament. Oh wow! So that's definitely a big thing for Ascension to be able to you know going into the game two of this set all of a sudden last second take that game off of Alliance Rogue when no one else has so far in this tournament and it seemed like just last minute the scrambling that they did the jump ins to tower it didn't seem like they had enough paint up ahead of them to be able to do that but they just played off of you know Alliance Rogue coming out of their spawn so nicely and so perfectly that allowed them to finally get the lead there last second so now with that being said Alliance Rogue will be going in for this third counter pick so let's see what they pick as we move forward yeah and keep in mind they are allowed to choose this exact same map and mode combo and I, I wouldn't be surprised if they do because it was so close but <laughs> Alliance Rogue could have something up his sleeve as well um not a it's not very common that we see them making counter puts just because they tend to win a lot of their games. So mm -hmm. I'm just as interested as you are to see what they will choose. Mm -hmm. And I think another thing that makes it really interesting is I, for one, was not expecting 
the double machine, double splash comp to come out. I mean, I feel like we see teams run double splash, but with different, you know, weapons. Or we see double machine, but with different weapons. Was not expecting to see the two of them combined. And that really showed me that Alliance Rogue has quite the weapon versatility when it comes to the weapons that they play. So in terms of a counter pick, you know, there's so many things that we could see when it comes to that. They can play based off of any of these different weapons and comps that they play moving forward. Yeah, and just a reminder too, if you, you see all you see all these great teams, there is a prize pool at stake over thirteen hundred dollars for the winner. You guys can donate to the prize pool if you'd like exclamation point donate in chat. Uh, we have the PayPal link that is scrolling occasionally at the bottom of the screen. We love to give all of our support to these players and the community, so definitely donate if you can. Yes, and I think right now the prize pool is still, I believe, right now at $1,326.11. So that is the prize pool right now for the teams that make it to the top. What a prize pool these teams are fighting for. Um, so I think that's great. And you guys can definitely help add to that if you did want to donate, like Falco said. Yeah, uh, definitely good support. And this is one of the largest prize pools that I think the Splatoon community has seen. So always great to see this. Of course, um, with all these top level teams coming out to play, uh, it's it's always fun to see. And we also have other tournaments that go on during the uh, well, first the Splatoon community in general. You can see that scrolling in the top right, uh, such mm -hmm. as Minnow Cup t uh, Tower Control, which is going to be coming up February 5th on Sunday. Uh, Minnow Cup, I think, is a fantastic tournament. You are able to play one specific mode, various maps on that mode to help get you practice. Definitely catered towards uh, lower level teams, able to generate some more practice um, and prepare you for, for the Splatoon 3 competitive grind. Mm. Yeah, there's so many good tournaments that are showcased up there at the top right. I mean, right now we see Triton Cup going to be happening on Friday, December 30th, which uh, is in, what is that, two weeks? Um, and then, yeah, and then uh, Dapple and IPL, of course, the other orgs in the scene right now doing great things for us. A lot of great tournaments coming out and a lot of great orgs that are helping support this that's Support right. Mm -hmm. And we do see the counter pick. It's actually going to be Clam Blitz on Scorch Gorge from Alliance Rogue. So let's hop right in and see these weapons. Um, of course, Alliance Rogue, they are, they're going to be sticking with the same mm -hmm. cop they had in game two. We do see the Charger and the tri are coming back out from Ascension. Okay, so this counter pick, Clam Blitz on Scorch Gorge. And uh, seeing Swin actually switching over from the E-Leader e over to the regular Splatter Scope. Uh, but a lot more paint coming out on the side of Ascension's comp. I like to see that. We see the gal and the splash coming out. So I think that paint is really, really going to help them as we move through this game three match here. Two members of Ascension do go down, but it looks like the defense right now from Ascension is still good. They are making sure they play safely off of these specials that are coming out from Alliance Rogue. Yeah, and we see we see Lines Rogue pushing up with the crab early on. Um, you know, don't really have the power claim quite yet. It looks like they will be in a position to try and form one, but no, they're actually going to go two players down now as Ascension able to get some of those players push up towards mid as they are blocking out some of these or pushing back some of these Alliance Rogue members. So again, um, claim blitz can be a little skirmishy at the beginning. You just try to get the picks where you can, try to form the power claim when you can. And if you're Alliance Rogue, now is going to be want the time you want to do that because you do have a three-player advantage. So we do see that they have it formed, just trying to get in a position. It looks like Gray might be going to the crab to help push forward. Uh, as Ascension is now trying to get in by the basket. But look at this, the flank by Twig, able to get the crab, but then going to go down to Kiver. So this power claim is going to still be alive. Looks like Scar's able, maybe going to try and pick it up. But no, I think it's, uh, it's actually going to be picked up by another member on their team. But uh, this is Alliance Rogue's push that they want to try and get in. Mm -hmm. You can see they're pretty, seemed like they were pretty dedicated to trying making this push happen. Uh, finally, they'll with that stalling and twig flanking uh you know the crowd coming out from alliance rogue that has actually allowed time for ascension to be able to come back into mid but speaking of coming back into mid three members of ascension do go down right away i don't see what caused that triple there to happen but 
Alliance Rogue playing off of that right away, scoring that power climb in and continuing to score clams in as we see Gray using this crab, Kiver using a crab also and just not letting any front from Ascension come into the basket. Yeah, anytime you can get a crab in that position, it's going to be absolutely crucial um, for Ascension, Ascension to try and counter. They had one player alive who immediately had to jump back to the basket to try and uh, try and help but defend, but not before Alliance Rogue is going to get all the way down to 62. So again, Alliance Rogue keeping up the pressure. I believe they have two. They, they have one power claim at the ready, uh, pushing up towards this basket, using the fizzy to help. Uh, to help move some of these Ascension players and paint. Uh, and that power claim is going to go in. It's just going to be gray with the crab. So they're likely, I, I would say, not going to get any of these claims in. But look, they're going to get two. Are they going to form that power claim and get it in? And they are. Very, very good move by Alliance Rogue. Oh my gosh. It was just gray on the crab. And gray held their ground there, got getting two picks with the crab and then scoring another power claim. And that was crazy, just holding that down by themselves. Alliance Rogue, it seems like they've been playing really, like, even if they have one or two members down, they just hold their ground and they do not give it up. And, you know, as we move through this match, Ascension's really going to have to figure out how to counter that because... Alliance Rogue is not letting down. I mean, we see Kiver right now in mid, just holding mid area, making sure that he's going for any picks that he possibly can. Gets finally called out by Evan, though, and this might potentially be something for Ascension to play off of to try and get a push going. Yeah, it looks like it was, and a few of their players are going to go down, but they are keeping up the pressure, keeping up the aggression. Uh, one of the power claims is not going to survive, but we do see Swen there uh, picking up. I believe that was the pity claim that they grabbed um, in order to try and capitalize on the player advantage that they had and potentially the map control. But we do see some of the specials. It looks like they could be getting up for a jump as Ascension was able to push up, but no, they're going to just swim up there. So Ascension, with their first score of the game, Unfortunately, not going to have any power clams right now, and two players are going to go down. They are able to get one in to follow up. Twig now trying to stay alive, just scrambling by mid, trying to stay hidden. So you broke the barrier for your ascension, you scored, but now, now you need to have that last 30 second amazing score if you want to try and win. Yeah, there's only 30 seconds left on the clock. Twig just held that spot there. I was watching this crab and was kept looking down at the bottom right of the screen. That shark there from Twig definitely allowed them to their team to follow up behind that and try and follow up and get that mid control and get the aggression that they need. This machine and crab 1v1 happening. The Evan there on that crab able to win that 1v1. But right now in the last 10 seconds of this, there's three members down of Ascension. I don't think they have a power climb at the ready either to be able to get overtime. And with that, Alliance Rogue taking this game three. Yeah, you know, we saw them just start off very strong and getting a few of those points. And Ascension, they had opportunities. They were able to score. But again, they, they got the power claim in. But Alliance Throw just quick on the defense, getting those splats. So only allowing one power claim and one follow-up in from Ascension. Uh, overall, Alliance Rogue very dominant in that game, and they just need to win one more of these next two games in order to move on to the winner semis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And looking at this, of course, it now will be Ascension's counter pick once again, moving into this game four. So in order for Ascension to stay in this set, they are going to be needing to win this next game to take the set to a game five. But if Alliance Rogue wins the next game, then they will be the ones moving on through the winner side of the bracket, sending Ascension to the loser side of the bracket. But man, thinking about that last game... Just the way that Alliance Rogue was just, even if there was two members up only of their team, they were just not letting down. They were holding their ground, not letting Ascension be able to move safely or move peacefully. They were putting down a fight and just holding their ground really, really nicely. So I have a feeling, you know, they are going to continue with that double machine, double splash comp, but uh, we'll have to see as we go into the next game. Yeah, and unfortunately for Ascension and uh, everybody in chat, they cannot choose Tower Control Ingval Art Academy since they had already won on that counter pick. So <laughs> that is that it will not be coming out uh, for this game. Uh, but who knows? It could be for game five if uh, if 
uh, well, no, actually it can't because Ascension will need to win this one. So, um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, but who knows? We could see Rain Ma Rainmaker Sturgeon like we had seen in the first set. Again, a very mm -hmm. popular map mode that uh, we, we've seen a lot in Splatoon 3. I did like the Clan Blitz Scorch pick. It looks like it's going to be Re Rainmaker Eeltail Alley. So uh, a map that mm -hmm. we haven't seen yet today, Rissa. Yeah, we have not seen this yet today on the stream. Uh, so I think this will be really fun. I, it's always fun. Uh, of course, of course, Splatoon 2 maps are, you know, they're comforting and we're all familiar with them. But I think it's really fun to watch these Splatoon 3 maps and how these high level teams play them. Because, you know, you really start to learn things as you watch these teams and how they play it, what weapons they play, how they play around the map in general. That's right. And again, no surprise with Alliance Rogues comp. And we are seeing the same exact comp actually from both teams from these sets. Um, so once again, um, Ascension needing to win this game in order to stay alive. Alliance Rogue hoping that they can get this win to move on to the winner semis. Right now, Alliance Rogue able to get the initial pop of the Rainmaker, but of course, I feel like this map, this map can get so stally in mid for it can last a while. So we'll see what happens here. Both teams just kind of painting around, seeing who can get the first initial picks. Finally, Alliance Rogue able to get one member down of Ascension. Now that's two members down of Ascension as Alliance Rogue has grabbed the Rainmaker. Gray there has to play carefully though. There is that crab out from Evan but finally finds the right opportunity as Kiver is in Crab there to follow up through the Crab and get to the first checkpoint. Yeah, and this push definitely isn't done for Alliance Rogue as they had a th two player advantage when they got to the checkpoint, but Shnex just rushing towards the Raymaker, trying to get some momentum, gonna go down immediately. Uh, that's gonna give Alliance Rogue another opportunity as they're opting to push now towards right and going up the ramp. So they are able to push. Are they gonna get this dunk? Oh my goodness, all the way to one. A very, very aggressive move by Alliance Rogue, who's not done yet with a two-player advantage. And it looks like this could be a knockout very, very quickly. You could see Ascension doing everything they can to guard the Rainmaker. They even grab it. That way, Alliance Rogue can't be the team to grab the Rainmaker and dunk it. But in that happening, all the members of Ascension go down. Alliance Rogue able to grab the Rainmaker there, throw in a Booyah Bomb while you're at it, and just completely KO the Rainmaker. They are going to be taking game four and moving on through the winner's side of the bracket. Yeah, this game looked exactly like what we saw in the Splat Zones game during game one on Museum. Uh, just Alliance Rogue taking control of the objective, pushing forward. And Ascension, you know, it, it, it's hard in that situation because you want to move the Rainmaker. You want to make those sneaky moves. But each time you do that, you're just going to put yourself a player down. So Alliance Rogue, even though they didn't need to be, they did a good job just like coordinating the specials and helping push up and mm -hmm. securing that dunk with just over a minute into the game. And yeah, Alliance Rogue, like you said, winning 3-1, knocking Ascension down to the loser's bracket. Mm -hmm. I think something that stood out to me there that Alliance Rogue did really, really nicely was the crabs in particular. They were making sure that if one person was crabbing, that they played off of that other that person's crab. So the rest of the members of Alliance Rogue just made sure they waited for the crab to come out and then pushed in with the crab, pushed in through the crab shots. I think that was so important. And you'll tell Ali, once you get to that first checkpoint and then try and get past it, it can get really, really stally for the other team, which we saw there. So Alliance Rogue played that really, really dominantly, really, really nicely. And now Ascension moving down to the loser's side of the bracket. They are still in the tournament. So don't count them out yet. Uh, we'll have to see how they do too and watch through this uh, course of this and see how they do on the loser side as well. Yeah, Ascension will moving down to face Graveyard Shift, who beat Last Resort 2-0 in the first round, of the first round of the loser's bracket. Other scores that happened in the set, Melon God 3-0 over Penguin. We saw Lions Rogue 3-1 over Ascension. Starburst 3-0 over Cat Meta. And right now, Comet and Seafoam in a 2-1 set with Comet leading that. But before we get started with the next match, we are going to take a quick break and get some of these sets wrapped up. But you guys don't go anywhere. You are watching Storm Break on Malway IT.
Welcome back. We are here once again for day two of Stormbreak, and we are in for a treat. Going to be watching Starburst versus Common. Yeah, it's going to be a good matchup. Uh, two teams who have who went undefeated at day one. We saw Comet squeaking that game out um, against. Uh, who did they beat prior to this? Let me check real quick. They beat Seafoam 3-1. to one. So yeah, uh, Starburst still on a roll, has not lost a game all day, I don't believe. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be a very exciting match starting on Zones Wahoo. Zones Wahoo going to be a great... I feel like it's a really good, you know, neutral state to see the way that these two teams play. I mean, it's a familiar map like we've touched on previously in the last sets uh we know it from splatoon 2 and it'll be a good way to see how these two teams play against each other yeah and of course um starburst a team that we all know comet we mentioned i, I believe is a team uh from japan so we don't know much about the players and what their weapon pool is going to be looking at the comp from starburst i like the the stamper uh the yeah the yeah Swatana stamper choice and uh the dually uh squatchers on the side of comet Ooh, a lot of interesting things to take in here flingza coming out from the side of comet as well dually squelchers of course the double splash and starburst having a flingza of their own gonna be utilizing the missiles as well for this so right away comet gonna be the team that gets the zone first hand here but two crabs come out one from each side and both teams are doing everything they can to get that first initial picks to see who can really start taking the upper hand at the first part of this match yeah we have a uh, we have starburst here in yellow and um comet in the purple so again comet able to get the cap and maintain it and uh hold on to it you know starburst they're doing a good job trying to find an opportunity to break in with the help of this crab it looks like they're finally going to be able to cap the zone giving 39 penalty points to comet uh, so th this could be the push that they haven't had an opportunity to do yet in this game. And of course, we're only a minute in, but um, we're so used to seeing Starburst just be dominant from the start. So uh, this will be a chance to see how Comet's going to break back in. Zipcaster coming in to try and counter this crab, and if not taking down the crab, at least displacing it. So that way that crab is not able to shoot Starburst's teammates down and just completely displacing that crab shots. But Comet has another crab right at the ready. So they are, seems like they're just gonna keep constantly chaining these crabs and adding pressure with these crabs. And it's playing off really nicely for them. As Starburst is pushed back, they are regrouping and trying to get their specials ready to get back in to the zone. Yeah, and we see the Dooley Squatchers just down below trying to avoid some of these missiles and these shots from Starburst. They're able to pick them as Starburst now trying to push back towards the zone. A 3v3. Um, but no, three of those players are now going to go down. So Comet capping the zone once again, not having any penalty points they need to worry about as Starburst now dropping from this right side on Comet's side. But you see one of the players going up and flanking. It's going to be the Squelchers who's going to be pushing up on this side, making sure that Starburst can't push down on their right side as are now spotted so this will be starburst opportunity to try and break in they're going to be using the crab they're going to have some missiles on them too going to be using the zip caster will this be enough to cap the zone theoretically with two players down it should and they finally do get it getting 62 penalty points for comet oh my goodness able to get those specials at the ready at the very last second starburst using them really nicely to at least come in and at least cap the zone now both teams have one member down on each side and as Starburst just continues to push up and gain space. They have no penalty points and they are just doing such a good job at calling out these members of Comet that keep dropping down into the court area. Yeah, so Starburst again doing a good job just holding onto this zone, but the pressure now coming from Comet with the missiles and the crab breaking into the zone. That was Starburst's best opportunity so far in this game. And with two minutes left, anything is still possible. But you, it's hard to fight on this zone with how small it is. Uh, just a few specials can just help completely turn things around. And that might be what Comet could be saving up for at the very end of this game. Again, still have plenty of time before that could happen. But Comet not shy about using their specials and pushing up and showing their aggression. 
Mm -hmm. Both of these teams are doing such a good job at playing off of their specials so nicely. I mean, you can see each of them using their crabs around other specials so, so nicely, and that's working out for each of them really well for both of their pushes that they're getting in here. So now with the flings down on the side of Comet, Starburst once again trying to push up, gain momentum, gain space. This Zipcaster coming out once again from Nori just continuing to add the pressure and displace the crab. I didn't even think about, you know, using Zipcaster to displace crabs like that, but that's such a good idea and use of the Zipcaster, learning new things from these teams constantly. So now with no penalty points though, Starburst is looking to close in on getting the lead right now. Yeah, they might be able to do it, and it looks like they will. Now, can they hold on enough for the lockout? And they will. So Starburst with an amazing comeback against Comet, where Comet just kind of seemed dominant at the very beginning. Starburst being very patient, and like you said, using the Zipcaster to just push away from the, uh, the crab is going to be so crucial and so key. But Starburst winning game one uh, in, in a comeback situation, so very good win. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did a really, really good job. And like I said, in the middle of that, you know, it seemed like both teams were doing a really good job at using specials together. But right there at the end, we got to really see in particular how Starburst, they would crab and use missiles and then also use the Zipcaster through that. So while Comet is just completely displaced by the crab and missiles, all of a sudden a Zipcaster comes out of nowhere too in the middle of that and just really, really displaces everyone on the team. And I felt like Starburst finally in the middle of that started to get a really, really good grasp on using their specials like that. Yeah, and we want to welcome everybody who is watching Dapple Productions. I believe some Ludi sets were going on over there. You are now watching Stormbreak. This is the winner semifinals, Starburst versus Comet, with Starburst getting that first win. So uh, best of five counter picks in place. We'll see what Comet chooses to uh, chooses to play. Mm -hmm. So since Starburst won that game one on Splat Zone's Wahoo, it will be Comet's turn to counter pick in this best of five set. I, I don't even want to guess, you know, what they could pick. I, there's, I, I feel like there's a multitude of things they could pick. And we are, like we, Falco mentioned before, you know, we're not necessarily so as familiar with Comet as we are with Starburst. So in terms of what their counter pick would be, I have no idea. And that's kind of, it's kind of fun in that way in, in not knowing what it's going to be and seeing what it's going to be firsthand here. Yeah, definitely. Um, of course, we could go back to the classic game two, uh, Tower Control, Inkbot Art Academy. You know, I'm surprised uh, Jub, our producer, has not just like hard coded that into the second counter pick slot at this point. But maybe, <laughs> maybe we will be surprised, um, as it seems that Comet might be taking their time to decide. And uh, which, you know, there's no reason you need to rush to make these counter picks too. You definitely want to plan something out, especially this far into the bracket in the winner semis, because it, it's going to be harder mm -hmm. if you do drop into the loser's bracket with, uh, I believe, having a best of three. So, uh, yeah, Comet taking their time to pick. And Rissa, like you said, uh, since we're not as familiar with Comet, we don't really know what they could potentially be planning out. You know, we were kind of surprised by the Dooley Sculpture pick. So uh, we might be surprised by a map mode counter pick as well. Mm -hmm. That's the fun in it, you know, not necessarily knowing what it'll be. And I think another thing that is really interesting about it is it could actually, you know, I for one, I'm not so familiar and haven't got to commentate any like area cups or anything like that. So I don't really know for the JP teams, you know, necessarily what they are picking, what their meta is and how different it is from these NA and EU teams that I typically get to watch. So that's another thing that and I think a fun factor in this is seeing if there's going to be anything different when we get to see what the second counter pick is. Is it going to be similar to things that we've seen? Uh, I think that's going to be fun to watch and see if it's different and then if it's not different, you know? Yeah, that's true. And we're also keeping an eye on the other game that's going on right now, Melon God versus Alliance Rogue. Right now, Melon God is a game ahead of Alliance Rogue, uh, leading 1-0. So a lot of competitive matchups happening in the winner semifinals, and we'll try and keep you updated as we can. But uh, the, like we had mentioned, the, the final four teams here, Melon God, Alliance Rogue, Starburst, and Comet in the winner's bracket, 
all went completely undefeated yesterday, sweeping their bracket, and now in a position where, okay, I'm going to fight the other powerhouses of whoever won their bracket. So mm -hmm. uh, the, the nitty gritty, the, the good matches, the taking your time to choose Splat Zone's Hagglefish as your counter pick, which is what Comet is doing. And I, I like the Zones pick. You know, we see we see Zones very common in Japan. Uh, mm -hmm. To be honest, shouldn't be surprised with this mode pick. Um, and Hagglefish Zones is just a very a very classic map and mode combo. Mm -hmm. Absolutely a really classic one. I think from the start of Splatoon 3, this has been a map and mode that you see come up no matter what the tournament, I feel like it's just a really kind of like tried and true, almost in terms of Splatoon 3 Splat Zones maps. Uh, it's wide, it's an open map. There's the flanks that are easy to watch, but they're also easy to, you know, if you are the one flanking, they're easy to try and make happen. So I feel like it's a really good balanced map and mode. And we're going to have to see, you know, what Comet's game plan? Are they going to have weapon switch ups? Is Starburst going to continue that Flingza method that they were doing previously? Let's see as we get to see these comps come out. Looks like Starburst sticking with what we saw them previously play. And okay, <laughs> Comet coming out with three splashes and yeah. a Flingza. Wow, wow. Was there are... that. <laughs> We have five crabs, here, five crabs here on the map. I was going to say, this is a good map where you get your crab in a, a powerful position. Kama is going to have three opportunities to do that with their weapons, and of course having the flings on missiles to help support. But look at this early zip caster by Starburst trying to push out and get some of these members of Comet. Starburst is going to now take the zone, and it looks like they will be losing it right before they are able to take the lead. So, um, again, this <laughs> I, I'm just amazed that all the the crab picks but i i shouldn't be but anytime you get more than two splashes you're like okay okay this is gonna be a good game <laughs> okay I, it's like they're like okay you're gonna keep displacing us with your missiles and uh zip caster all right we'll just add another crab to the combo while we're at it you know why not that way you can't just keep displacing our crab <laughs> so that is proving to play out really really well already for comet i mean they have the zone they have no penalty they are using one crab gonna chain it with this other crab and guess what they have another crab at the ready to chain with that as well so starburst trying to do everything they can with the specials that they have to just at least come into the zone and cap the zone finally getting one of the members down on the side of comet able to push up through that and at least cap the zone now you can see they're trying to hone in on getting these members of comet down on the sides here not gonna be able to get them down three members down now aside of starburst but at least starburst was able to come in and cap the zone and give those penalty points over to comet you know, Risa, you uh, you pointed to this during game one with having the zip caster kind of displacing and chasing the crab. And I think that's what Starburst is going to have to do here. The, the crab takes a while to change direction. So if you can use that zip caster to just go around, flank on the crab and get the picks, that might be your key to win because it is hard with all the paint that Comet has been pushing out. But look at this. This is going to be Starburst's first cap in quite some time, giving 36 penalty points to Comet. Crab v. Crab on the zone here. We see Bagel now switching over directions on the, uh, the left side as another crab is coming out from Comet. So again, if there's not a crab active in this game, then there, there's definitely something wrong. <laughs> Seriously, with having five crabs on the table, I mean, you can see Comet has one of theirs at the ready. It looks like they are going to use it from that canopy. That is going to allow them to help their teammates take two members of Starburst Stone. Now push in, get the zone, and now start pushing up Starburst, having to really carefully jump back. Looks like Nori actually able to, in, in the middle of their teammates jumping out, gets one of the members down on the side of uh, Comet, and then... Now their team, actually Starburst playing off of that really nicely, that initial pick, able to push up through that, get the zone, get another pick, and just keep uh, pressure into Comet's base right now. Yeah, this has been Starburst's best opportunity thus far into the game with being able to push up and get some splats. And now the Zipcaster trying to push up um, is going to be hiding, but no, it's going to go down to the splash as two players now going to go down on Starburst. So Comet going to get that cap that was much needed because they lost the lead during that exchange. Starburst got all the way down to 33. So now, now Comet is in a comeback position with a minute 30 remaining. They have plenty of time to work with 
And again, it, it's just a matter of getting a two-player advantage and pushing forward and using some of these missiles to help displace. It looks like Comet might be in a position to do so because Bagel's Crab is now going to go away. So with that, Comet able to take the lead, continuing to push up this pressure. Comet just making sure that they guard the zone and doing that allowed them to get the lead. Now both teams have one member down. Looks like this 1v1 gonna be going down. Uh, and now that allowed two members on the side of Comet to be taken out. Starburst now with 20 penalty points that are counting down. The lead could potentially swap. There are 50 seconds left of this match, so speak about commentators curse two members of starburst do go down and that's going to be the perfect opening for comment to push up and cap the zone and give penalty points back to starburst now it's just getting so chaotic in the last 30 seconds here as starburst knows they need to get into the zone and they need to cap it but they do have one of their members down yeah, and Comet knows they don't need to try anything fancy to hold on to this zone. Just protect it. Don't let those missiles distract you. Don't let Nori get in a position where they can just splat you from behind. Like, oh, it was going to happen right then and there. But no, Comet able to kind of respond and get the splat at that moment. So 10 seconds remaining. Comet just needs to hold on for a little bit longer. But the zone is going to flop over in Starburst's favor. So now Starburst in a position where they can't afford to lose the zone as we approach overtime. Starburst doing everything they can to keep the zone painted. Their Flingsa is down, but on the side of Comet, they do have their splash down as well. Now Nori goes down on the side of Starburst. There's only one member up left of Starburst. That is going to be the moment for Comet to paint the zone, and they do just that to take this game two on their counter pick. Now it will flip over and be Starburst turn to counter pick since they lost that game two. Yeah, Comet tying the setup one to one in an amazing comeback and able to save the zone and not letting Starburst push forward. So really, really good game there from Comet. I I, I mean, I liked what I saw, even though it was three crabs. <laughs> I like I like how how aggressive they were with their with their playing and hey um, that's kind of that's kind of the meta that we're in right now it's it's to be expected you know we mentioned okay two is normal to see three a little I don't want to say unorthodox because we have seen it before but just not what you expect and I think what you had mentioned too Rissa the the missiles to complement the crab just mm -hmm. really seemed to work out there for Comet yeah that was like the perfect I feel like you know, fourth specials to add to that triple uh, comp. I mean, able to sit back and use those missiles to start displacing members of Starburst and then just constantly chaining crabs, I think is a good way to uh, utilize that. That's gonna allow those crabs to be able to spot out anyone running from missiles and just keep just constantly displacing the members of Starburst and keep chaining those four specials together played out really really nicely for them now starburst counterpick has come in we will be going to clam blitz on museum this is going to be the first time we've got to see clam blitz museum on the stream today so and remember this is starburst counterpick so they are the ones who picked this yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing this because I, I enjoy Clam Blitz, but I enjoy top level Clam Blitz even mm -hmm. more with just how aggressive some of these pushes can be and how um how great these flanks can be too. So yeah, um this is a map it's easy to get a quick score just if you have uh kind of have that player advantage but going to be hard if uh if you don't have that player advantage especially if you have the aggression from the crabs that we saw in comet too and it'll be interesting if starburst will change up their comp from what they mm -hmm. had they seem pretty comfortable with what they were running in the first two uh first two games but when you lose there's always something you want to reconsider even if you just barely lost the game like they did in game two mm-hmm that's a good point. Thinking about, okay, is there something about our comp that we need to switch up? Or is it just something about the way that we are playing in particular against this team? So we'll see as we are going into game three here. Starburst counterpick. Looking at the comps here. Biscuit going to be switching over to the machine. Uh, and going to be having the rest of their comp is going to be the same as what we previously seen. Now on the other side, Comet, you know, sticking with that triple splash, of course, but instead of a Flingza this time, going to be having a Junior. So talk about paint control. My goodness, that comp is going to be so paint heavy for Comet. 
very paint heavy. We're gonna see the bubble coming out for I think one of the first times today too. Uh, the Duel Junior, not something we see as often now that Custom Junior is also into play, especially on Clam Blitz, but uh, it, uh, you know, Comet's going to lose the range of their main weapon, too, with the flings on having no missiles. But once again, you still have three crabs. And we see Starburst was trying to go up and get an early zip caster splat, uh, trying to take out one of the one of the crabs, not able to do so. So Comet now getting more map control as Starburst having to back out a little bit. And Starburst with two power clams are pushed all the way back by their basket. So uh, if Comet keeps up, keeps up this aggression, Starburst might be losing those clams. And now Comet trying to make a push of their own with the Junior holding a power clam. Comet pushing up, getting that machine down on the side of Starburst is going to be the perfect opening for them to start pushing in. You can see they used that bubble to try and be a kind of a safety net there as they were getting ready to push in via wall almost, but that Zipcaster came in, displaced them a little bit, but in turn, two members are now down on the side of Starburst, three members down now, and this is going to be that big score for Comet right away here as they get their initial clams in. They are crabbing, they have another bubbler out, and they are just working to get clams so that way they can continue scoring. Yeah, you, what's better than getting a wipeout when the basket's open? The best part about that is getting a wipeout as soon as the basket has been open for at least like five or ten seconds because you know you have that much more time to go out and gather clams. So with that Comet getting all the way to 23, looks like two of their players are still alive but not in a position to score. So a wonderful push there by Comet. Uh, now having 38 penalty points, two power clams will get rid of those penalty points. But Starburst needing to make uh, make an impact happen if they want to contest as we are about two minutes into this game. Mm -hmm. You can see Starburst trying to do everything they can to paint mid, get into mid. Unfortunately, Nori does go down. You see Bagel there on the right side of the screen trying to use this crab to start creating space. Ice follows up. Uh, never thought I'd see Ice on Splash, but... Ice definitely on the splash, using their crab as well to just put pressure in. This double crab there looks like it helped Starburst a little bit to start trying to push in a mid, but they have to be really careful. The crabs coming out, a counter from Comet is keeping them from, you know, being able to safely push up. There's constantly crabs and not a lot of space for Starburst to be able to move. Yeah, and there's one player flanking on Starburst. That is going to be the Splatana Stamper who's pushed over on Comet's side um, trying to get some picks. And it looks like they might be able to get a few of their members. Um, yeah, look at Nori all the way up in Comet's base as they prepare for a Power Claim jump. That Power Claim is going to go in. Two Power Claims in for Starburst. Two players down now for Comet. So Starburst hoping that they can get all the way to 23. Again, they need to have an amazing push if they want to take the lead here. And uh, the Crab is alive. Biscuit going up for the Booyah, Nori score, having more clams, able to score them in. Ice with some clams as well. Will this be enough for them to take the lead? Just one clam shy of it. Biscuit now is a clam. Biscuit is going to throw a few in, get some picks all the way down to 15 now. What a fantastic push by Starburst. Great push. And you can see once there were two members down on Starburst, I think that was Ice there completely jumped out, Bagel backed up, and now they knew, okay, I love that awareness. They know, okay, it's not worth it to die here. Jump back, let's get our defense ready, and because we know that Comet is going to start pushing up right away, as we're seeing Comet do right now. This, able to just completely look over that crab that Ice had out, get that crab down. Now, Comet using a crab of their own, scoring their power clam in, and let's see if they can get any more clams in as we go into the last 40 seconds of this. Yeah, that's actually going to be the wipeout. So they had the clams, they had the players, but Starburst just one step ahead using some of those crabs to get some to move some of those Comet members. And this is a tricky situation. You have 30 seconds left. You have your pity clam and you can still form a power clam on the field. But again, you need to make this a good push uh, with getting one power clam in and a few to follow up with. So... I, Comet can definitely do it because they did it earlier in this game and they're doing a really good job getting more map control So it's a matter of now just forming the power clam getting that jumping and scoring and with all these crabs coming out It's gonna make it harder for Starburst as we approach the last five seconds Last five seconds here definitely overtime is gonna happen since Comet does have that clam ready 
in the back left and they also have their pity clam under their basket two members down on each team you can see comets doing everything they can to get this clam in to get in a position to score but the defense right now from starburst is on point they have completely guarded the basket they are making sure that they keep paint under their plat area under their basket and starburst doing a great job once they finally got their push in and then the defense at the end taking game three you know, what I really liked about that push from Comet, even though they couldn't pull it off, is they didn't even bother picking up their Pity Clam because they knew that somebody would likely get splatted, be able to jump in and get the win. Unfortunately, it didn't work out for them. Comet showed all the aggression in the game, but again, Starburst just one step ahead using the specials and guarding all the claims that kind of came their way. So a wonderful win, a good counter pick too by Starburst, as mm -hmm. like we said, they're winning this or they're leading this set right now, two to one. Mm -hmm. And that was such a close game. Uh, I think it was interesting. Uh, you know, I didn't have a lot of time to process those that the comps that we got to see there, but I think it's interesting that actually both teams switched off of Flingza there and I wonder you know what necessarily their reasoning was it wasn't just one team or the other both of them switched off of the Flingza so I think that's definitely interesting to know uh and neither team necessarily having that anchor or backline type role just playing that so aggressively that was such a fun set to watch it was and you know I think using the junior if you're Comet it, it is a good decision because like we said you just have so much paint at your disposal but yeah you don't have the anchor player on your side anymore no more missiles no one else to kind of displace the other crab members so um it it was so hard for Comet and they came so close they had an amazing opening push it's just that Starburst had the better push towards the middle of that match mm -hmm. it seemed like Starburst as soon as they got Nori I, we didn't necessarily get to see it from like Nori's point of view, but in the middle of that, Comet was completely pushed up onto Starburst Plat, and then Nori dropped on the right side and flanked into uh, Comet's Plat area. And as soon as they did that, that's when it really took a turn, and Starburst capitalized off of that and played off of that. Sometimes it's just like really making sure that you play off of things like that to make sure that you are able to get points on the board get the lead like they did and have that recognition is so important and that's exactly what they did and that's when that game really took a turn and now this will be comet's counter pick we saw before they chose splat zones hagglefish so they can't choose splat zones as a counter pick i will be curious to see what they choose we do have a bracket mm -hmm. update for you on the other side of the winner semifinal melon god defeating alliance rogue three to one so Melon God will be moving on to face the winner of this match between Starburst versus Comet. Ooh, that's really interesting. And then Alliance Rogue moving down to the loser side of the bracket, of course, going to uh, be in it for the loser side of the bracket and make a run there, see how they can do there. They are not out as well. Um, now, since it is Comet's counterpick, they're taking a little while. And I mean, it... The first thing that comes in my head is, okay, like I mentioned previously, this is not necessarily a team that I'm super familiar with, so anything could happen here when it comes to the counter pick and what they might pick. And then also, you know, with the way they have been switching up their comp so much, really anything could happen. They could just play off of what they think is best, what they think would be best against Starburst, uh, since it seems like they can really switch their comp up and play basically anything they want to switch around different maps and modes. That's right, and it looks like we will be going to Tower Control Sturgeon Shipyard. So we, we get to see it in the set. We were told by uh, our lovely producer, Jub, that that's going to be the next map and mode that's coming up. So again, if you if you missed it from sets one and two, don't worry, it's back. We, we have it. <laughs> well, this is uh, so Tower Control Sturgeon going back to Tower Control. We've previously seen Tower Control. We've previously seen Sturgeon. Now we get to see the two of them combined and uh, back to a familiar Splatoon 2 map this time around getting to see how this is going to be uh, played. And I, I have, a, I don't know. I just have a feeling we're going to see some crabs. We're going to see... <laughs> I think the flings is gonna come back, but I could be wrong. So I don't, you know, I don't even want to guess because with the way that Comet has been able to switch up their comps, anything could happen here as we go into this next game. 
Yeah, missiles would be a good choice with a lot of a lot of verticality in this map. Uh, prevent people from swimming up walls, especially if you're a crab. Uh, getting your crab perched up on one of these walls can be very dangerous. So again, um, will we see the three crab from Comet once again, potentially, that we saw in games two and game three? Um, mm -hmm. Again, Starburst, they really haven't changed their comp, and I don't mm -hmm. know if they will. They're already winning two to one, so they can afford they can afford to lose this game and have the counter pick in their control if they don't want to try anything fancy. But let's hop into game four. This is match point for Starburst. Okay, looking at the comps here, Starburst going to be sticking with their tried and true comp that we've seen from them previously. Not bringing the Flingza back. I still on the splash there. And then on the other side, Comet uh, switching it up a little bit here. Not having that triple splash that we've previously seen, though. Switching out one of the splashes this time for a machine. That's right. So they're going to have a little less crab, but um, still, still plenty of paint and still plenty of uh, lethal paint on their side. Now Starburst getting the first tower, approaching the first checkpoint, have the Booyah ready to help contest. And it looks like this tower might be uncontested. Ice standing on it alone. They are two players down, but it was just the positioning of Comet. They weren't close enough to the tower. So that is going to be big for Starburst as Comet is now pushing Starburst over on this left side, able to take the tower of their own and push up and get some paint and get some picks as well. And that I would say it was going to be a delayed wipe, but I don't think it is, but uh, a really good comeback by Comet. Yeah, Comet just coming back instantly, really, really aggressively too, and really, really chaotically, but I think that was really good for them. That kind of displaced the members of Starburst a lot. Uh, now Comet here trying to get to through that first checkpoint. Starburst was able to get through the first checkpoint. Now it's Comet's turn to try and get through the first checkpoint. Though the members of Starburst are right here. I mean, we see a crab coming out. We see Nori pushing up and just acting super aggressively with this. Really, really nice team up there to shred that Booyah Bomb. Now Starburst using their Booyah Bomb here to completely get the tower back. Ice on the tower starting to push it once again. Remember, they did get past that first checkpoint, so they are going to be able to continue to get points on the board. Yeah, Starburst had a really good save there against Comet, just using the bubble, using all their specials and their players, attacking everybody on the tower. And it looks like Starburst was able to extend their lead just a little bit and might continue to keep it up as two players on Comet are now down as Starburst is approaching the second checkpoint. So getting in a good position, they have Nori uh, perched up above the tower. They had the Booyah that was thrown. Nori now trying to splat some of these mes <laughs> members just being a distraction as this tower is approaching the end. And it looks like that is game starburst defeating comet three to one and we'll be moving on to the winner's brackets final wow i was not expecting i mean of course starburst is an amazing team but i was expecting that with the previous matches that we've seen i was expecting it to be a lot closer than that starburst really really it seemed like a switch flicked in there in their gameplay and they knew exactly what they needed to do to counter comet comet was just wasn't quite able to get a graphs once Starburst got past the first checkpoint area to the second, you know, they continued rolling that tower out and adding their aggression and Comet not quite able to stop the tower, get their defense ready. So like we've said, you know, for these teams that are going down into the lower side of the bracket, they are still in it. Comet is still in it. They are going to be moving on through the loser side of the bracket. Starburst, though, moving on through the winner side, going to be facing Melon God here up next. Yeah, we mentioned that Melon God defeated Alliance Rogue three to one, so um, that is going to be that is going to be really really cool, um, a fun set to see. But hey, we have a few uh, we have a few ads that we would like to get through and uh, promote all of the exciting things that are going to be happening in the uh, in the Splatoon world. So we have the Megalodon Cup that is going to be on Saturday, January seventh happening at 5 p.m. UTC, uh, 1 p.m. ETC. It is going to be the Rainmaker edition. Um, I believe this should be 2023, but you guys you guys probably knew that. So um, what, a, what a fun tournament. I will pull up the doc because I am not reading what is on the script here. So <laughs> let, me, let me pull that up. Um, I don't know, Drissa, do you have it handy? <laughs> Guess what? I have the doc ready. All and right. for... Megalodon Cup dive down deep into a single mode tournament. Megalodon Cup is back in the new year with a new schedule. Running monthly starting on January 7th, 2023. 
with Rainmaker as their first mode. So get the Megalodon role in the Molaway IT, which is the uh, lovely org that we are watching the stream on now that you can get the role for this tournament in their server when signups are open for Megalodon Cup. Yeah, it's going to be super, super cool to see. And we also want to we also want to talk about Dapple Productions. Dapple Productions is an international Splatoon tournament organization. They host tournaments for Europe and North American time zones, but anyone can join their various tournaments. Dapple streams their tournaments live on Twitch regularly and uploads competitive YouTube videos. To find out more, check out their website at dapple.inc or follow the official Twitter at dappleprod. Now for Splatoon Stronghold Org, a stronghold is a competitive, excuse me, a stronghold for competitive Splatoon, providing resources to long timers and newcomers alike. The stronghold is on a mission to make competitive Splatoon more accessible than ever before. To find out more, check out their website at splatoonstronghold.com or follow them on Twitter at SPL Strong. And last but not least, I believe we have one more. Yes, we have IPL's Splatoon Advanced Circuit. So ring in the new year with IPL. SAC returns this January for a brand new circuit. Join us on Saturday, January 14th at 2 p.m. Eastern to start earning points for your team. The eight teams with the most points by the end of the fourth tournament will be invited to play in the finals and compete to be crowned the best mid-level team in Splatoon 3. Always a fun tournament to watch, Rissa. Oh, always such a great tournament to watch. Really, really good for that mid-level scene of Splatoon. And with that being said, we are actually, Falco and I are going to be checking out here. We will be doing a quick commentator swap and taking a really, really quick break to do that. So with that being said, Popgun and Shiny Hunter Zack will be up next on the mic to bring you more high-level, amazing Splatoon games that are really going to be really exciting to watch. Falco, do you have any closing thoughts before we head out? Hey, amazing, amazing games that we have seen. And it's to be expected with having 16 powerhouses compete in this alpha bracket. And of course, good levels, good teams are competing in beta and gamma and delta. And I believe there's even epsilon too. So a lot of cool brackets. But um, Rissa, it's been a pleasure commentating with you. Where can we find you? Um, you guys, if you would like, could find me on Twitter, Twitch and YouTube at Rissa High. How about you, Falco? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at FalcoFlyer11, Twitch uh, on at FalcoFlyer. I also stream Looty matches on Splatoon Tourney, so if you would like your Looty match streamed, uh, feel free to hit me up, message me on Discord, follow me on Twitter, ask me on Twitter for more information. We've been doing sets pretty much every weekend. Uh, they've been super, super fun and engaging, and uh, we'd love to have your team broadcasted. Perfect. So with that being said, we are just going to take a really quick break here, do a really quick commentator swap. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back for storm break day two.
Hello, friends, and welcome back to Stormbreak Day 2. I am Pop Gun, joined by the Shiny Hunter Zach, and we got a doozy of a set for you. I know it because I went into Kyo's chat and make sure they got into the lobby. They didn't know we were doing this right now. Melish God taking on Starburst. Uh, Zach, you had some information because I saw some idiots in chat saying some things. I didn't know if it was true or not, but you can confirm the players on Melon God, aside from C uh, Keo, won Area Cup today. Is that correct? Well, sometimes the legitimacy of chat can be dubious at best, but I think this time there there is some accurate, some accurate information in there. We do have some members who've had a pretty successful weekend today, especially Kurotan or Kurokuro, not just taking first place in Area Cup along with their other Japanese counterparts on this team for Melon God today, but also winning the Splat World Championship with Nice Shot alongside other members like Mashu, Naruta, and Tsurara. So uh, I have to imagine that they're tired uh, with the fantastic pot on the line that is available from this tournament. Uh, you can do the exclamation point donate uh, to help contribute to that if you would like, but uh, I'm sure that is helping to motivate them. And based on their performance, sweeping through their A1 pool and then only dropping one game so far to Alliance Rogue, they have to be feeling pretty good thus far. They should be. And when you look at the history of these quote unquote major tournaments that we have here, the super jumps, the 20 XXs, we've seen this story a lot. It's always Starburst versus whatever monster is staying up deep into Monday morning until they eventually have to go to school or work or whatever. Starburst in this particular match against whether it's the Kings or whoever, does pretty decently well. They either usually win this one or lose it in a game five. It's when they get to grand finals that when it's a reset against one of these, the same exact team they'll beat in winner's finals where the adjustments are made, where you see uh, the, the players from Japan start to separate themselves. So this one might not be a true indicator of what you will probably see in grand finals, but it doesn't mean it's not going to be entertaining to say the least. This is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, we're still in best of five territory here. It's going to be counter picks all the way through. We don't need a counter pick for game two. We already know it's going to be Tower Control Art Academy, so we'll worry about counter picks when it gets to game three. But game one here is going to be Splat Zones at Mako Mart. The question is going to be, are we going to see, uh, if you could bet channel points here, the poll that should be up right now is over under six splash o is going to be in the lobby. <laughs> You know, you, you bring up a couple great points there. You know, Starburst as a team, they provide this fascinating juxtaposition between being this meta-defining team and doing lots of research and scrimmages to find out, you know, what compositions are strong in the meta. And it just happens that that is several, if not, you know, almost an entire swath of splash o and crab tanks at this point. But, you know, they also bring in these interesting other components as well. You know, they bring in Nori, I believe it's Norishio, who has the Splatana Stamper, which retains that super powerful sub in the Burst Bomb, but a special that really has not seen much of the light of day up until this point in the Zipcaster, but it has worked. We saw in those matches that Falco and Rissa so adeptly casted before us, uh, it doing a pretty solid job at, uh, if not distracting, fully taking down those crab tanks, way, wearing down the duration and sometimes just wearing them down with the actual special itself. And as we look at, as you mentioned, Splat Zones on Mako Mart, it's got some really interesting lanes, those those super deep uh, and narrow alleyways that you can sort of shark around. Of course, I believe splash o will be doing that, but the zone itself in that sort of plus shape should provide, you know, an interesting area where those, those little alternate fires from the crab tank can do quite a bit of damage from range, even from on top of what would traditionally be a sniper perch. Yeah, Zipcaster and Stringer are two concepts to this game that a lot of people in the West, I wouldn't say scared or tried out, but more of weary to kind of attempt to put some effort into it just because, well, I need to win tournaments and I know how to use Splash and Machine, so I'm just going to stick with that. But some other people that have put time into figuring out how Zipcaster works, how Stringer works, have brought out the 
the potential of those things that we haven't really seen used up to this point. So Nero, I believe that is how that's pronounced, um, using Sipcaster in ways that we haven't seen before could be the difference in this upcoming set that we're about to see to your credit that you pointed out right there. And it's it's good for us because we're not used to seeing Zip. I, I can think of maybe Chara might be the only player at the highest level that actually tries to attempt it to some extent. Um, so it'll be exciting to see it used at this level. Completely agree there. And, you know, we have not gotten any alternate forms or kits for these Splatana variants. And and to your point about the Tri-Stringer, it feels like one of those weapons where, at least in ranked, it, it either goes 19 and 1 or it goes 1 and 19. So you really have no idea. And it, it is partially putting it in a position to succeed very much in the same vein or role as a traditional anchor weapon where it needs to have the spacing, it needs to have the high ground, it needs to have the ability not to be too worried about flanks and to call those out so that the rest of their team can adapt. And uh, flankers included to talk about that, Nori Shio is going to be a major proponent of that playstyle because they have been doing that immensely. They have been the main flanker and the zip caster helps them to do that so well that that is the person who is either going to get the first pick or is going to go down first, but tries to be immediately back in the action, similar to how in the Splat World Championships, Mashu was doing that on the Dark Tetra Duelies, and it forces out adaptability in playstyle if you can't find an answer for it, which of course Starburst, having the run that they've had, taking down Comet 3-1, to one, uh, and then before that, pretty clean record for them as well, sweeping through Cap Meta and Last Resort today, uh, doing a very good job at being that adaptable team while still holding strong to what they believe is, to, is the meta. Like we've seen Ice going over to the splash matic which I, I saw in the last set. They they said they would have had no idea that that would have ever been a reality. Yeah, it was sad to see towards the end of Splatoon 2, a lot of the chargers die off. And you saw players like Ice just drop charger altogether and start using things like Inzap and K-Shot. Uh, but as we see the meta kind of advance further in, you saw, like you said, Ice using Splash in the last set. Does it mean that you're not going to see things like Flingza or maybe, maybe a Charger at this point going forward? But yeah, you have seen some things adjust um, just in the first couple of months that this game has come out. But just this set in particular, I'm so excited just to watch this like th the fact that i'm commentating here cool that's great but i'm just excited to be able to see this set because this is the matches we want to see we want to see starburst going up against the best in the world uh we haven't seen you know we don't get to see these matches too often and when we do see starburst play it's usually against other teams in the west that quite frankly they've been dominating for about a year and a half to two years up to this point so this is the matchup we've been dying to see and uh i guess dying more so than the players because it's, it's been about 50 minutes and they still haven't gotten into the lobby for some reason but uh yeah this hopefully this will be a fun set going forward here well i mean to your point one of their biggest teams from the west competition wise especially in na has been sayonara and sayonara you know they become the second seeded team from NA to go into the Spot World Championships. They lose in the, the first round of that, it being a single elimination tournament. Um, and then today they come in, they make day two, as it were, they make this alpha bracket, but then they get upset in winner's round one by Seafoam. And now they're sort of having to claw their way through the loser side. They're still in it right now, but they're playing a best of three and they're down 1-0 to Comet in the loser's quarterfinals. That is a difficult matchup to be going up against and that's one of those teams that was also in this flat world championships also known as gugu otoko um but sayo you know not giving up playing uh cherry limeade and penguin uh successively beating them 2-0 having a close set against graveyard shift or as some may know from a different tournament graphy yard a hift uh they took a game off sayo but they come out to victor there um and then if they even beat comet they'll likely have to face what EU's best is because there is a uh, very strong battle going on right now in the other losers quarterfinal match, which is Alliance Rogue, the number one seed from EU in the Spot World Championship, taking on Oro Jackson, the number two seed. And Oro Jackson actually up in that set one to nothing. So tons and tons of hype matches, but this one for sure is going to be one that you want to check the VOD, you want to have 
the replay code if possible. You're going to want to mirror this behavior when you're trying to decide what do I play, how do I play, and what do I bring to my next scrim. You know, what sucks about those loser bracket matches and the winner's round one is that they're all best of three. And, you know, it has to be that way because eventually we all do have to go to bed and eventually Japan has to go to work. But it anybody's vulnerable to lose in a best of three, especially in round one. Seafoam beating Sayonara 2-1. Ascension also knocking off Oro Jackson 2-1. Now, if you've been following Ascension, they've been... They've been flirting with beating some of these teams. I believe they took Starburst to a game five in one of the Nintendo tournaments. But uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I believe Comet has officially knocked out Sayamara 2-0, unless that is updated wrong. No, yeah, Comet has already moved on to winner semifinals. And Alliance Rogue, who beat Oro Jackson very convincingly in the Proving Grounds EU qualifier for the Splat World Championship is currently tied 1-1 with them. So yeah, you would like to see those teams play more than just three games, Because, but you know that there's a lot more intensity in those matches. You can't screw up in game one because then you don't get to control the final counter pick in game three. Um, so there's a lot of stress going on in the loser side of the bracket so far, but this is a tournament designed to bring out the best of the best and i i've got to say there what is where is our team Wh where is everybody here <laughs> what is going on five seconds the voice in my head saying five seconds so we've we've been teasing you guys long enough no more it's finally game one splat zones make mark melon god trying to beat starburst and i see a tetras coming out from the side of melon gods and there is the flingza and stamper to go along with the double splash from the side of starburst yeah so take a look at the the loadouts as well we see the triple ninja squid and a couple of uh, object shredder of course that's going to be good for breaking down some of the things like if they had decided to bring a sloshing machine of their own on the starburst side they end up not doing it so they're not going to have the booyah bomb to get through but the crab of course is something that you want to get the armor of the crab down as quickly as you can it's going to be melon god getting quick control of the zone but starburst able to flip it back over and here's norishio doing exactly what he wants to do best getting some flanking around trying to find that proper angle they have the zip caster at the ready and finds the dis Distance kill there, uh, looking for the second, is not able though to avoid <laughs> the Booyah Bomb, and that is pretty heavily contested map for Melon God. You can't zip cast away from a giant explosion in the middle of the map, able to take care of that. The Tetras on Melon God, I believe that was clicks. You saw them at the very beginning of the set flank immediately and just try to take a 1v2. Didn't work out in their favor, but you're gonna see them do that constantly. Eventually, one of those flanks is gonna land and it's gonna work into their favor. You saw them try it right there again and didn't work out, but watch for that Tetris to be constantly on the move, trying to take every fight they can get. Certainly a pretty solid option, I would think, to the playstyle of somebody like Norishio, where they're going to be going on flanks and, and taking that uh, distraction and the focus away from the members of Starburst is exactly what they want to do. And they do so not just with a three down, but with an entire wipeout. You can see just how little of their own base they've had to paint as they made a bull rush toward the middle of the map. And now they are uh, pretty swiftly getting rid of the penalty that they have at their disposal. Norishio also going down there. And you can see just what? how heavily they are pushed up. Yeah, it's that Tetra player by themselves getting a double to say, hey, I'm over here. Everybody come at me. Finally, they take care of the Tetra players, but it causes enough distraction for the penalty points to be wiped away. And now the rest of the specials built up from the side of Melon God, a crab able to get a couple of splats there. It's a 2v2 situation. And time is running out here for Starburst to get back into this one. It's just Biscuit on that left side of the screen. And I don't think they're going to be able to build up a crab in time. They're going to have to wait for the rest of their teammates to come in and try to get a splat right here. Clicks, goes down, gets a trade. And now are they going to be able to stall the zone? They are. And they finally find a way to cap it. Wow. Maybe the Tetris went a little bit too in on that final play right there. But they were deadly at the beginning of that push. I have to say, that was a massive effort from Ice there on the Flings of Roller, just sitting behind the zone and flinging for their life. The Crab's actually coming out a little bit late there as we see the double from the Crab, and this is exactly the kind of plays you want to be making, just quickly going into the ball form to try and avoid some of those shots and then firing off your alternate fire, and that is exactly what they do, getting the swift double there, and another Crab is on the way. You think you've seen it all from the crap special at the point of this game with how often we see it going on. But they keep finding new ways 
to deflect the shots and find ways to repel new ones to get interesting splats across the board there. Still, Starburst hanging around in this one. They're able to cap the zone again. The question is, can they actually get some sustainable points out of this? Look at clicks. Just, there is Man. no such thing as retweet. It's just hold forward. Are they an NA player? Are we sure they're from Japan? <laughs> So Starver's chewing through their penalty here. They're going to have to wait to see if they can get any specials. The Booyah Bomb coming out here from Melon God, and they've taken over the zone swiftly there. It is such a difficult zone to defend because it is at that sort of highest elevation. You have to be sort of right in the face of the zone as we see the Crab v. Crab duels. This one won by the member of Starburst. I believe that to be either Ice or Biscuit, who's trying to keep this zone capped. And unfortunately for them, they are not able to until just now. They're able to get the pick on the Sloshy Machine. They're also able to get those pests tetras and for now looking a little bit defensible they lose to members of their own but look at how quickly melon god is jumping back it's like they never leave the fight at all yeah they're not backing up they're not building up specials they're just taking fights they're jumping in they're being hyper aggressive right now and it might be working against them up to this point look the penalty points are gone for starburst and now melon god's hyper aggression is starting to look like it's feeding right here as nero trying to jump in here with this zip caster Oh, able to get an interesting little assist on that right side, but they're flirting with getting the lead right now. Booyah Bomb coming down on the left side of the zone, and Keo trying to attack that right side, but Starburst looks like they're going to uh, hold off the aggression from Melon God there and take game one where it looks like for sure they were going to lose it. Melon God fed when it didn't look like they were feeding before. Yeah, that is a massive overturning of the odds there from Starburst. You know, they... Uh, have a couple of engagement and you know we we look at Norishio especially because that is the biggest shakeup to the meta that we're seeing in this tournament and with them being essentially a Splatana Stamper one trick here and they're doing such a great job of a few things first off his displacement getting the crab away from the zone having to either go into ball form where they can't shoot anymore or just full on try and target down that fast moving zip caster and even without the special they're doing a strong job of hitting those shots from afar and getting, you know, enough damage to where a, a direct with a burst bomb will take them out so they can use not just the range of their weapon, but the range of the special as well. That's complemented with some of the plays that we saw just to maintain the zone. They were down all the way to two Melon God was until... You know, we had Ice sitting behind the zone with that massive horizontal flick getting control back. And from there, Starburst never looking back and turning the aggression right back onto Melon God. How about the map awareness from that zip cast as well? You saw at the very end there, they zip casted all the way to the left, the far left snipe, took a fight there, turned 180 degrees and zip casted as far away. How far can you zip cast? It just extend anywhere to hit any wall? They literally covered the entire left to right side of Melon God's base. And that's just map awareness. That's listening to your call outs. That's knowing where you need to take those fights. It's hard to keep up with Spider-Man where they're going all over the place like that. Tetris, we, I talked about Tetris doing that same kind of thing, being a distraction. Tetris can't move that fast and cause that much of a distraction. Now, well, yeah, to that point, I think uh, the Dark Tetris were doing a very similar thing, and that that plays to Starburst's ability to learn and adapt on the fly. They basically say, hey, if you're just going to have your Tetris rolling around in our base, you know, we've we've got a special that does essentially that. And we're probably going to see that same kind of aggression coming out here with splat zones at Hagglefish Market being the counter pick. Now, this is uh, this is not a North American team making the pick. That's why Game 2 is not Tower Control Art Academy. I know some people are confused why this is not showing up in Game <laughs> 2. You're going to see that same kind of aggression, though. I think you're still going to see that Tetris come out here trying to... Essentially what they did in that last game, working the alleyways, on the, particularly on the right side there. They're probably going to do more flanks on the left side here of Hagglefish, but you're going to see those flanks constantly being fired out, trying to keep the fight away from zone while the rest of Melon God tries to push through in the middle. But clicks, it seems like they're just, just going off way by themselves. And it, for the most part, it was working up until the final plays there. 
So let's get into it. Game number two between Melon God and Starburst. The latter up 1-0 in this best of five. Taking a look at the compositions. Uh -huh. And we saw this in the Splat World Championships from Sugi. The heavy splatling does work on this map. You have great places, especially near the zone, to set up your sprinkler and hide your wave breaker so that it can do the most damage. Everything else looking pretty par for the course. An object shredder too, I want to point that out. Object Shredder we haven't been seen used a lot, but if you're constantly be going be fighting crabs the entire game, why not? Why not get a little bit of distance on them and try? Well, maybe you can also just ram right into them with a like a battering ram of a zip caster and knock some of them out as well. Starburst looking really strong in the opening 30 seconds. Yeah, some say it's bad to be bullish, but Nori taking that MO to heart and absolutely diving into not one, but two crabs. One absolutely going down at the onset of that. Now it's going to be Starburst losing control for a second, but the tent, uh, the tent missiles rather going to be taking them away. However, the Flingza will go down after using them. So this is an opportunity here for Melon got to chip through their little bit of the penalty there and take some of that aggression, bringing it right back to Starburst. And they've already done so, forcing one out and taking two out entirely different weapons same kind of play style work the alleyways make sure that everything isn't congested in the mid and make sure attention is split off to the side and this is where you want Keo to be I, I called them the lebron james of competitive splatoon that just make everyone around them better but when they were pushed up like that wisely able to jump back out realizing they can't really get any ledge camping with the machine up top there but jumping back allowing melon god to get the lead and staying alive and keeping that booyah as well that they should be firing right now well, and Kyo, to talk about them, has a competitive spirit that I have rarely seen rivaled in the Splatoon community, and they really are showing their stuff here as the zone continues to tick down here for Melon God, finally losing control and getting a penalty at 28. Kyo going to what? fall in what? the midst of the Zipcaster. I think that was a fall-off shot from the main weapon <laughs> itself. Nori showing us new ways to play a weapon that a lot of people don't dare to touch in competitive play. Yeah, when you look at something other than Splash and Machine, and you know what, when you're not used to fighting against that, it is kind of awkward, and you're like, whoa, why did I just die? How did that even kill me? I don't understand. That is the little bit of a mix-up that Starburst is using right now, and it might be enough to get them the lead, as we do see Nero actually getting taken care of. Biscuit trying to hold on to things on this left side. Getting the splat there, but clicks drawing attention away from the zone. Is it going to be enough for the rest of Melon God to cap it? It is not. Yeah, fantastic job there by Starburst. Able to get the lead. That shows some of the adaptability of the splash matic in terms of being in-air accurate. The fall-off shots and the relatively little RNG that that weapon has. But we see Kurotan, arguably one of the first players to hit 3,300 in Splatoon 3. Trying to keep things painted here, but they don't have quite the distance to keep the zone here. So it remains in contention. And multiple folks, including Ice, who we saw the heroics of in Game 1, trying to keep this zone painted. Backing off to fire off those Tena missiles. It'll get... Arguably one pick there as the Booyah Bomb comes out, but it's just not enough. And now Melon God under the two minute mark with quite a sizable penalty to get through, but still plenty of time here. You are Melon God. You've got to find ways to get this game over with before it goes on a little bit too much longer. I feel like Starburst is going to find ways to get wins if you just let them hang around like this. And you don't want to go down 2 0. They are able to hold on to the zone a little bit longer right now and sharking around this little bit here it already got the zip caster ready how many zip casters do they have ready it seems like the zip cast is their main at this point going up top going around the world and look at this melon god's not falling for it this time they didn't even care that they got right behind them and they got punished for it Wow, maybe not caring, but they end up paying the price regardless of what they do. Forcing a three down situation onto Melon God is Starburst, who will stop them at 25, regain the zone. And as we are about to enter the minute remaining mark, the Tena Missile is going to force them back. That's going to stop Kurotan from making full ability of this crab. However, Booyah Bomb able to come out onto the zone. It's one down per side as the Flingza goes down on the side of Starburst, losing control. And the Wave Breaker coming out that's going to finally allow Melon God to get things back here and the heavy splatling is doing exactly what it wants to do which is use the nice area of effect in the area that they have viewer of when they're actually standing on top of the zone and are finally able to push forward it looked like ice was going to feed into Keo there on the backside. instead they stay alive and that's huge because now they get to fire up the missiles the missiles look like it does chase melon god back a little bit yes yeah, starver's able to cap the zone yet again they're not going to hold on to it for long 
but Melon God's gonna have to do death by paper cuts here. They're chipping away. They don't have a ton of penalty points to work through right now. And once they get through all of them, they are gonna get lead. And if they hold on to it at the end of it here, they are gonna win this match. This crab tank being popped, trying to get care, uh, take care of Keo, does exactly that and fires some more shots onto the zone. It's not gonna be enough for Melon God to overcome it. Starburst goes up 2-0. I have to be honest with you, I was worried at the end there because I saw Nori pop their Zipcaster, get to the right-hand boxes next to the zone, and immediately get splatted. So I said, well, there goes Starburst's secret, their little ace in the hole, their tech for today, and they thankfully have just enough ink on the zone, and they have a crab on top of their uninkable tent there to use the alternate fire to get those remaining shots to take control of the zone. If that had gone on just a little bit longer, or if even that splat had happened happened a little bit earlier there might have been trouble in the overtime there for melon god but uh or for starburst rather but melon god not able to get the final ink there onto that large zone in mid and starburst going up two to zero here in our winner's final best of five it'll be one more counter pick on the side of melon god <laughs> the uh well I, I just got word of what the counter pick is going to be. I, I was just going to say in that game too, it was very tug of war-ish. It was very back and forth. It's just one of those games where, okay, whoever has zone, control of zone when the timer runs out is the one that wins. doesn't necessarily mean they outplayed the opponent. Um, but it just so happened to work out in Starburst's favor right there. Yeah, you kind of mentioned it It looked like Melon God was going to hold on. I guess just Keo dying in zone was enough to stall everything out. It's the perfect timing to have the crab there from Biscuit. But yes, it had to make an appearance at some point. When, when push comes to shove, if you have no choice and you absolutely need to win, Tower Control Inkblot Art Academy. Okay, so here's, here's why I'm so confuddled about why this map gets picked by everybody in every single tournament ever. It's If you're doing counter picks, if you're supposed to pick something that gives you the advantage over the opponent, if everybody wants to play here, how does this give you a bit? I guarantee you Starburst is thrilled to be playing on this map and mode because they counter pick it all the time themselves. Well, and it's not even the most popular uh, map for tower control. You've got things like Hagglefish, Macklemart, and Sturgeon Shipyard that arguably uh, are a little bit more favored. But as we get into this one, we see a pretty standard comp from both sides with exception to uh -oh. the Range Blaster, a personal favorite of mine and of several others I know. Oh. However, it will be the first to fall. That's one answer if you don't want to bring that heavy splatling that will still provide you with that uh, wave breaker that'll give you that bit of knowledge. The Blaster not doing much at the beginning of the game, but everything else is Keo instantly getting taken care of, but the rest of Melon God able to clean up and get control of the enemy plat as they approach this first checkpoint. The question off this push is, they got pretty good spacing right now. They took care of Nero. Uh, Keo's in a good position to kind of body body block for this third uh, second checkpoint. Can they clear this critical one? But there is a crab going back on that tower. It looks like it's raining down hell across of it, so they might not be able to clear it just yet unless they can find a way to splat bagel and they will not so starburst is very lucky to be holding on to that second checkpoint right now yeah speaking of critical i think kill coming back from that early splat able to get i think it was biscuit on the sloshing machine down getting the initial indirect and then able to take them out as they were trying to get their booyah bomb off we see the crab also falling here on top of this box it's crab the crab warfare as it's another three down situation for Starburst. Melon God losing a couple members, but it looks like they will have enough to try and push forward. And this is a very popular strategy on this map. Make sure your team has that far left ink rail painted so you can go up and hit anyone that might be trying to hang out on top of these overlooks. And they're in a great position again. Oh, that crab popped in kind of an awkward spot. And it's will, oh, it actually will get a double on tower. Okay, I felt like that crab was used a little bit too early before it got up there, but it seems like it was popped right at the perfect time, getting two players down on tower, and Starburst saves the checkpoint again. And look, even more importantly, they had control of mid throughout that as well, so they can just pick up right where they want to go and start getting the push going themselves. 
I mean, but boy, this is such a small map. You really have to make good use of your space because the tower is just going to go all around as much <laughs> as it can on this tiny little space. Click's going to go down. The Booyah Bomb going to go right out onto the tower. Ice having to step off and take a reprieve before pushing forward here. But this is going to be the MO on this map. It's just constant back and forth. It's a 1v1 situation. Nori expending the Zipcaster and they will indeed take out Click's. Not done yet, trying to find any additional spots. They're actually behind the team, but the timer for the Zipcaster runs out, and that'll be the lead, at least, for Starburst. You would expect them to stay on the tower, but they recognized, oh, I got teammates jumping in. Let me just Spider-Man all over this person and break their ankles and get the checkpoint and the lead to boot. What a heck of a play. Oh, you are seeing stuff you're not going to see anywhere else on Western Splatoon channels. My goodness, they broke their ankles right there. But now it's going to be Melon God coming back. They're expending both the Crab and the Booyah Bomb. We'll lose kill once again on that Range Blaster, getting a little bit of pain out, but it is just all of this shooting on the tower that is going to take them off of the tower, ironically. Having a Crab, but it getting melted down pretty quickly. I believe that was Kuroton having, being the last one to survive and hang around here. Nori hot on their trail, getting distracted there, though, and Clicks able to pick them off. The rail there still painted, but the, the tower, rather, not moving any further. Bagel kind of out of position here, potentially trying to bait someone from Melon got out of here. But still, I think, with how quickly these pushes tend to go and the, the fact that they've cleared through that first checkpoint, still plenty of time here for Melon God. There is, and that crab's in a good spot to keep distance away. But Melon God has taken two attempts at trying to clear the second checkpoint, and they haven't been able to do it just yet. That Booyah Bomb not really accomplishing anything. Said two more players going down. This crab's in a good position. Ice is not going to get there in time, though. They had too much enemy ink that they had to swim through, and that's going to be the difference right there. Checkpoint cleared. Lead falls as well, and Starburst needs to find a way to hold on to this third checkpoint. Otherwise, Melon God should post and find themselves in a comfortable position to put this one away. Yeah, this is dangerous territory here. Kuroton still on the tower here. Bagel able to take them down, but at two. So it's going to require essentially a full wipe, and the push isn't quite done yet. Able to get the last pick there onto one of the splashes. It will be ice, but a full wipe forced onto Melon God finally, but the damage is done. 30 seconds with how far this tower has to push. They basically can't afford to step off it for more than a second, which is difficult when you are facing the prospect of something like the counter Booyah Bomb. However, that will be the first teammate to fall. Kyo follows suit, so two down now on both sides, and they're going to have to regroup quickly if they want to make it onto the tower for overtime. Starburst able to get onto the tower. They only have one zip caster ready to go on their uh, special count. They do take care of one player. Belusa splash on their side, and there goes Spider Man instantly falling into the crab. But Bagel might be able to cancel this crab, knocking Clicks out of the way. So now you got a little bit of a pincer opportunity. Clicks can wait out this checkpoint and finally starts to spring right now. Takes care of the player onto the tower, buying enough time for a Booyah Bomb to come back out. And it's just Nori being the last player left alive. So great opportunity right there from Melon God for Clicks to stay alive. After their crab got canceled, instead of trying to feed into that one, went back, waited for the rest of their teammates to come in and then forced a beautiful pincer onto the tower, allowing them to take this game and keep the set going. Well, and this is the pendulum effect, I think, that TC Inkblot Art Academy has. Because these pushes are fought in such short range, because the map control is changing much more quickly because of the tiny area than it would on a larger map, you have these swings in momentum that are going back and forth, and Melon God just getting the best of Starburst there with that final push to two. Starburst with a valiant effort to try and get around. I was worried at multiple points. First off, when Clix was behind them, I thought, well, Clix just has to get that second splat and climb up onto the tower, but a well-placed Booyah Bomb is not just going to displace them, but take them out entirely. And then when Nori, being the last one around, they employ that same strategy of being risky in getting off that tower and trying to take down the front two members of Melon God. They're just not able to win the 1v2 there. Melon God, all they have to do, climb up on top of the tower, and they start what they hope will be a reverse sweep, but what Starburst hopes will end in game four.
it, what Melon God was able to do, it wasn't just that pincer that we saw at the end there. It was the entire sequence they used on the defensive end after they got the splat. When uh, they got swept as Starburst was getting back onto the tower trying to get back into mid, you saw a couple of players from Melon God just instantly rush the tower. They saw Starburst building up all these specials. They realized they had a lot of time to work. Let's, let's just feed in. Let's try to get a splat or two. Maybe shut the game down right now. If it doesn't work out, we're going to spawn back in and have plenty of time to defend that third checkpoint anyways. And they were able to get a couple of picks off of that, and that might have thrown off Starburst rhythm enough. However, Starburst gets their first counter pick of the set, and they are going to Clan Blitz at Museum. They won on this on the last time that they played against Comet here, and they're, <laughs> when in doubt, pull a third Splash-O-Matic out. That is what's going on here with Melon God. Well, and this has certainly been a common strategy for modes like Clam Blitz or even Rainmaker, which if we go to a game five will be the mode we see where having the triple or the third Splash-O-Matic going to be so strong to have those crabs where on a map like this one, you can sit on top of the middle spinner and still have an effect on the gameplay. Nori with another good flank there, I believe is going to help take down that member that was on top of the tower here. Ice going to go down, beautifully play shots there. That's going to help to build up the crab here for clicks. They see Biscuit at least or get the hit off on them and that'll at least force them back so far doing the better job of gathering clams as they are about to hit the 20 mark yeah so far map control in the favor of melon god and we see nori just make a living on that left side of the map right there constantly flaking uh nothing really landing so far into their favor but they, again we're still going to keep them keep trying that bagel able to get a nice burst bomb splat to just kind of stall things out right now. It seems like Melon God's won the first minute, even though they haven't put up any points. They've got all the map control, they got the clan economy in their favor, and finally, everything is starting to work out into their favor. They're starting to put up some points. Question mark? Actually, no. The only player who has clams is Keo. Building up a power clam and isn't gonna get there anywhere close in time. So an empty push for what could have been a promising uh, opening push there for Melon God. Yeah, but this was also what we saw in the winner's semis against Comet on Clam Blitz. It was basically all Comet for the first three, three and a half minutes. They do the first couple of pushes there, and then Starburst comes out of nowhere. And they don't just get the push, they sustain the push. And that's where Melon God had trouble. They're only getting that Power Clam in. We have one Crab that's sitting on top of the spinner here, but they lose Nori. Looking for a pick, anything that they can, but they're being beset upon by Kyo. Kyo spotted out here, getting hit a couple of times by that alternate fire. A teammate able to finish them off. That's a two down situation for Melon God, but it looks like they're going to play this one patiently and Starburst backing off also with 19 clams at their disposal. Uh, Ice is playing it patiently. Everybody else from Starburst didn't get the memo. They're just <laughs> starting to beat up everyone at this point. And well, somebody got clicks, kind of got lost out in no man's land around there. And all of a sudden, Starburst with Ice saying, oh, I didn't know we were doing this right now. I'll just slide in and help us get lead right here. Three power clamps go in, and this push is not over yet, Zach. Yeah, fantastic job there. We saw these fall-off shots from Biscuit in the semifinals, too, where they use the movement there of the sloshing machine, and they're still going. They have a clam at their disposal. They've gone off to pick them up. The Booyah Bombs come out as well. Ice being the frontliner here. Just one more clam to go. Can they find it? Ice the last one alive, and he'll do it. Beset upon by multiple members of Melon God. Ice with the fall-off Kobe shot to get the victory in Game 4 for Starburst. Ice, Ice, just get out of here. Let us do the rest of this. Then you can come back and start throwing some clams in. What a play by Starburst. Zero to 100 real quick. And they've just punched their tickets to grand finals in dominant fashion. Winning two games on splat zones, mind you. That might be the real story here. However, uh, before I know you want to you wanna analyze what we just saw there, Zach. But I got to say this. We've seen this story so many times. Starburst always wins these winter final sets and they go on to grand finals and then in the grand finals reset it's the other team from Japan that comes back and just absolutely curb stomps they're not even close I this is a good win yes and these are great things before you guys go on Twitter and start talking about how we closed the gap with Japan like you didn't pay attention <laughs> to anything else that went on this weekend about how Starburst can finally beat a team that's playing at 4 a.m. on Monday morning. We still got a long way to go. It doesn't mean a thing if we can't close it out at the end if you're Starburst. Well, and there's an entirely different conversation to be had about Twitter as a platform, but 
for the point that you made with Starburst. You know, we have our loser semifinal set. It will be Oro Jackson conquering their demons, taking down Alliance Rogue in game three of a best of three. And Comet ending Sayo's Cinderella run through the loser's bracket, defeating them two to zero. So there is that chance that we have the double Japanese squad taking each other on in the loser's finals. But to your point, this is where, you know, where Starburst has had to play, you know, sequential rounds. Now they're going to be doing a bit of waiting. And this is where, you know, it's almost like freezing the or icing the kicker in football where you have, you know, maybe the hands get a little cold. What do you do to stay, you know, active? Do you find somebody to scribble real quick? I know that in at least older iterations of the game, I'm sure in Splatoon 3 this happens too. Teams might hop into X rank or, or open for a little while just to make sure that their mechanical skills don't fall off in that little bit of time and that they're still keeping you know their their presence in the mindset of this game but as we shift over to the loser semifinals i'm super interested to see you know oral jackson has had a little bit of a uh run of their own in terms of getting knocked out relatively early in the first round of winners in fact losing to one to ascension you brought that up earlier pop gun that ascension you know a team that was right on the cusp of some of these games they now come all the way through defeating uh, Hex by DQ, Oro Jackson defeating Cat Meta in a Game 3 scenario, and then beating Hypnosis before going to Alliance Rogue. They've had lots more games to play through than I think both Melon God and their opponent in this match, Comet. And Oro Jackson has been playing a much more stressful tournament this entire day. <laughs> um, and that that plays, that, that that's two things. First off, that gives you a ton of momentum because every win just feeds fuel into the fire. You're shovel shoveling more coal into the engine and the train just keeps going further and further. However, when you keep getting into those decisive game threes where, oh my gosh, if we lose this to Cat Meta, we're out in losers round two and it's all over for us. We were hoping to make a podium at some point. So those things take a bit of stress onto you and it does affect you not in the moment, but it will affect you down the line at some point, especially when you're going up against tougher and tougher opponents. Now, with Comet, the team they're going to be playing who just swept Sayonara 2-0, when I was talking with Nine on my podcast uh, last month, Shameless Plug, one of the things <laughs> Nine pointed out, and I'm sure you would agree with this, the difference between Japan and the West is the adjustments that Japan makes in the middle of tournaments. That's why when you see Melon God potentially playing Starburst again and they counterpick Clan Blitz Museum, you feel like, oh, that might be something Melon God has already figured out how to fix that time around. Same thing with Comet. They've lost earlier Starburst three to one. So now they're going out, they beat Sayonara and they're thinking, what are the adjustments we need to make? What did it work out before that's gonna help us get over the hump with Oro Jackson and keep our tournament hopes alive? Well, and if I'm looking at the map pool, pool correctly, it looks like we are going to be starting with Splat Zones on Inkblot Art Academy. So we go from just seeing a game pretty recently on Inkblot to shifting over to zones. And, and to your point, Popgun, you know, in the Splat World Championships, there were a couple of really interesting weapons that ended up getting played. I know a lot of discourse was around the Tri-Stringer because it saw a, a fair bit of play in the Grand Finals, but we also saw the Reflux making a return. We saw things like the Heavy Splatling from Sugi that we also saw earlier on uh, in this tournament. So those little adaptations you take uh, just for a second, some of those meta weapons, the splash o the sloshing machines, the flings us out of the equation for a moment, and those are where uh, the, the gaps that you have to fill in those team compositions become so vital, especially in a best of three format. I know you were talking about too, just how deadly these shorter sets can be because every little mistake is that much more costly. Yeah, and when it's counter picks, winning game one gives you a crazy insane advantage because you get to decide what the decisive game three is. Maybe that's been Oro Jackson's ace in the hole in this loser's run that they've been going on up to this point. Um, but yes, this is still just the best of three. Oro Jackson, um, if you haven't been following who these guys are, you aren't paying close enough attention to competitive Splatoon. These guys have been a monster in the uh, European scene and have been playing really well in 20XX. I believe they got third place in that tournament, knocking out Sayonara in the loser semifinals before they ultimately lost to Kings. 
um, who went on to win that entire tournament. But Oro Jackson, when they played in the Proving Grounds EU qualifier, Alliance Rogue was just head and shoulders better than them. Um, and there was no there was no debate. I believe they beat them 4-1 straight up. Um, and then Oro Jackson had to survive a Game 7 against Graveyard Shift, another team that got knocked out earlier in this tournament to even advance to the Splat World Championships where they played in yesterday. Um, but Oro Jackson, again, when these best of three scenarios, anybody's beatable in best of three. That Even even Starburst. That's why when these looting sets came out and Starburst was playing in them, it's like, okay, who's going to beat them five times out of nine games? It's just not going to happen. But in a best of three, it's, it's total toss-up. It's who's playing the best at that right moment. Um, and, you know, who, who knows who that could be? Because once again, we're having... What is it with the... Okay, look. If I could go on another gripe here, which I like to do, <laughs> low ink players. I always thought low ink players were absolutely horrible with with tournaments etiquette and figuring things out here. I, I gotta say, whatever is causing these delays in these in these top level players getting into lobbies is beyond my scope <laughs> of understanding here. Low level, you guys take a win for once, okay? Yeah, there's what like. 12 divisions of, of Ludi at this point. There's there's yes. arguably more teams and, and folks interested in the competitive scene than ever. Let's see the etiquette here. Popgun's pissed. <laughs> that's that's just kind of the my uh my calling card, I guess, here. Hey, we finally got a lobby lighted up here, and we do see tr uh, five Splash-O-Matic. So if you were betting for six, you are going to lose that, but five is pretty good to go with. Hey, one of them is not using Ninja Squid. Instead, it's a special charge up to get more crabs. That's yeah, this has been uh, a little bit of a shift there where they're valuing the crab more so than the the sneaking factor. And, and besides the fact that you can see the little trail, not as easily, of course, but see the trail of ink coming at you. We see the splat there from the Tenda Missiles. Both teams going to have those Tenda Missiles on lock as we see a couple of quick trades on the zone itself. And again, the, the thing about this map is that it is quite tiny. You can get back into the zone area, in this case, so much more quickly. And you can see here part of what is nice about the flings of roller, the the basically acting as an anchor to where their teammates can jump to them and get right back into the action that much more quickly. Yeah, just staying on that ledge and literally just painting that right side the entire time, building up specials, rinse and repeat, where the flings on the opposite side is getting taken care of. So now Oro Jackson in a great position to put up some pretty serious points here. Double crab though, if Comet can just out survive these crabs, they'll have theirs ready to go and they can fire back and take the zone. It looks like they do just that. Every special coming online just in time for Comet as Oro Jackson's crabs run out, easily allowing them to cap the zone. Yeah, strong timing. So difficult to be in the right place at the right time when you're being targeted by those Tenda Missiles because the area between the end of the zone and the beginning of the wall there is not very wide at all. Nice splat there onto the crab as Comet's timer continues to tick down here on the zone. They just build up their Booyah Bomb, but Scarge not going to be able to use it there. It's a, a one down for each team situation, just barely almost having that crab online and not even feeling the need to expend it here as Oro Jackson gets it back, lose control temporarily. Oh. That was due to the play from the flings of roller on the side of Comet, but it will be short-lived as Scarge regains that high ground control and will beset upon the enemies of Comet that much more quickly. Interesting little overview right there. We had battles going on every which away except for the zone, and finally things settled down. Oro Jackson's back in control there. You had like fights going on on both plats at one point it looked like. But really it just comes down to special uses. More so the timing of it. Yeah, you're going to have crabs, but if you can just avoid the other one and fire off yours, and it looks like Oro Jackson's going to do just that. However, combined with the missiles are going to force Oro Jackson to run away right here and give control completely into the favor of Comet, and they just have to, but now, because Or Jackson waited them out, they're gonna have their specials ready to take the zone right back in the tug of war repeats. Yeah, it is amazing that there is such a juxtaposition as we see a good fall off shot with a burst bomb there uh, between, as you mentioned, all these fights happening anywhere but the zone and the zone shifting back and forth and back and forth so many times and having a good <laughs> bit taken out of it. Nice alternate fire there taking up Kyrie as well. Going to do a couple of uh, little jumping shots as well. They spot one out and they're going to be able to get the assist there. That's three down on the side of Oral Jackson. So maybe Comet's best chance yet to chip away at their penalty and start taking down the zone in earnest. Yeah, and look, once again, 
Specials built up from Comet. And the question is, are they going to be a little bit more patient right now? They don't need to burn through them because they have to hold on to the zone. Instead, they're waiting for Oral Jackson to make the first play. And look at them just swarming and busting that crab wide open. So now they're going to have the special advantage. Nice pick there on Fermano. And this should be lead into the favor of Comet. And they're in a great position. Honestly, if they get a few more splats right here to end the game right now. Wasabi Fu using that crab to the best of their advantage, trying to back off Kyrie. They have the lead and they're taking it down into single digits here. The crab on top of the zone, helping to defend things. Kyrie doing as much as they can. Same with Promano, and the effort is enough as they force a three down situation. They're not done yet. They're getting a little bloodthirsty or ink thirsty here as they're trying to back off that final member that flings the roller but now as we get close to the minute mark oro jackson needing to hold on to the zone for as long as possible they've expended all of their specials <laughs> except for the Buya bomb and the beautiful fall-off shot there from the crab is going to certainly lend to this effort final bullet kill and that might be the difference because there's a lot of crabs going on here but a perfectly placed Buya bomb is going to force that crab away and more importantly not be able to attack the zone but Comet's still able to hold on anyways with one tick left to go on the scoreboard Comet able to flip it back to the favor yet again it looked like they were going to lose zone right away but finally able to get the splash right there and this player instantly painting up the map I wonder if that's just going to give Oro Jackson more opportunity to build up some paint though they got the missiles ready to go oh they're firing their missiles already without any specials to combine with it well, they have the crab from Promano. Promano able to help on the right side of things, get control back. And with this hefty penalty, they can't afford to give it back. And no, your eyes did not deceive you. It was five to five, but the first team that got to that point retains control of the lead, bumping Oral Jackson back to six. Now we enter overtime here. The flings have pushed up all the way on top of the zone. Scarge on the left hand side on the box here using that crab. Comet trying to find an entry point and their crab will be the answer. But the missiles and the Booyah Bomb are coming out. The Tena missiles take one out. They take two out. They lose control. And that's <laughs> going to be it. They get all but two of their penalty down. But it's just not enough. Comet able to stave off Oro Jackson at the end of this one. Okay. It, riddle me this. At the end of the game right there, Comet had three crabs sitting in the zone. What, what are you supposed to do? How, what are you supposed to do there? The only thing is to fight fire with fire. But if you have one player go down and you don't have those missiles ready, you saw them displace the crabs a little bit there with the missiles coming out, forcing them to ball up and roll instead of firing off. But once those are gone and you can't just get missiles instantly anymore, it you just lose to that. And that just comes down to timing. Comet having the right specials at the right time. So when it came for their opportunity to tug in the tug of war, they were able to be the last team to hold on to zone. So they just win it there. But I mean, that is... That's, I, honestly, that's just good timing for Comet to, for everything to line up in the favor that it did at the end there. Well, and I think sort of a microcosm of what we saw in the middle of that game ended up coming back in a huge way at the end of that uh, game and it did not benefit Oral Jackson to where they had multiple members off of and, and down from the plat but behind the zone and so when you're targeted by those Tena missiles and the majority of them three four of them are coming at you and you either have to go far left or far right because you can't go onto the zone because that's only going to contribute to the effort of Comet to take it back you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place there there's not much for you to do the counter pick now coming out we see it's going to be TC yet again and it will be Mako Mart this time so uh, it may not be a Hagglefish market but another relatively balanced I think map that a lot of competitive teams constantly fall back on to see that uh to see if they can take this one to a game three in Oral Jackson's case hmm I wonder what they think gives them the advantage here and maybe it's just the machine that they were using last time but I mean I'm sure Comet is going to make some sort of adjustment unless they just want to go triple crab again you can never go wrong with that obviously but what kind of a I, I wonder what Oral Jackson feels like gives them the advantage here now Keep in mind, they've also been in loser's bracket all day long. So they've been forced to use their best possible map throughout this entire run. Because if they lose on their counter pick, they're done. So they've probably been picking this the whole time. Mako Tower Control. So they're probably just filling this map right here. But I, yeah, I'm just trying to think. It Maybe it's just the machine they feel like gives them the advantage of the other team in this particular one. Because again, this is just another kind of neutral map mode. Yeah, I mean... 
if you're Oral Jackson, maybe you do say, all right, we need a map. We need to take our little two pinchers here and just stretch the map out here. We need more real estate to work with. And we saw, you know, it benefit in some ways, you know, a team like Starburst, where if your goal is to uh, take control of the objective and then everybody push up, have that hyper aggression, really get them back into your spawn. Maybe that's your answer is try and keep them as far away from the objective as possible. But with the team of the caliber of Comet, that is likely going to be a difficult uh, bargaining chip here. And maybe too, their answer is just bring the long range <laughs> like an e-leader. Who knows? And that e-leader is going to have to stay alive and run from their life from triple crab in a bubble that can be popped on tower to deal with things as well. So that's the difference. They want to go dropping the flingza and instead going with the e-leader respawn punisher e-leader. So that's going to be what this one comes down to. Can Oro Jackson keep their e-leader safe and allow them to cook? If they can't, this is not going to go to a game three. Let him cook, as they say, as we see Crab v. Crab Warfare once again vying for high ground. One down per side, they lose one of their potential crabs, and now a second as we see the splat there onto Kamechan looking for another one, but the big bubbler can be forced out early on the side of the splatter shot junior. Oro Jackson can be the first to take the tower, but they lose two members, including what they believe is their pivotal change here in that E-leader. They have a crab, but it looks like they're just going to relent, let this tower go back, and now the E-leader the last one alive, so Comet is heavily in favor at this point. Oh, popping their crab early, forcing the E-leader out. They really wanted to get the splat on that, recognizing they're wearing respawn punisher. If we splat that E-leader now, they're going to be gone for a good chunk of time. But look at them attacking from different angles here, keeping the fight away from the tower. Crab up top there, flanking around on the right side. Whoever's riding the tower right now is probably falling asleep because everybody else is just eating up Oro Jackson in their own spawn. Call them Nightmare because they'd be eating Z's. We see the big bubbler come out on the tower, but unfortunately they will fall in the midst of it. So the push ends at 16. You can see just how close to the actual final destination the third checkpoint is. They don't really make a dent in it, but they make a huge dent in their lead. Two down still on the side of Comet and maybe Oro Jackson finding something here. They have three specials at their disposal. One's going to come out. It's going to be Promano looking for the splat there onto the crab. It's going to be Wasabi Fu running for their life as Kamechan hanging out along with Kasuyuchi on the side here. They're backed up to the Overlook, but that's not the worst place to be, especially when you have a crab at the ready like they do. Yeah, but can they find a way to get the second checkpoint? They, this is might be the only opportunity they get. They got the man advantage. They got their E-leader set up in a good spot. Oh, but recognizing uh, probably a splash player here. Oh, not even painting, just finding the one tiny speck of ink into their favor, going right forward and getting a double, shutting down everything, saving that checkpoint. They didn't even paint for, this, for that shark. They just found the, they just worked with what was given to them already. I believe the Fortnite kids call those cranking 90s as they immediately just hit the stick there and find the double kill with that beautiful turn of attention. Now the tower getting back to mid. All four specials online here for Comet, and it shows as Oro Jackson going to lose one of their splashes. The Wavebreaker, however, will come out. Look at the bottom left of your screen, a 1v1 that has to benefit the team pushing the tower here, which is Comet. And you can see just how much map control they possess. A three down situation forced onto Oro Jackson as Scarge is running for their life. And yeah, there's just nowhere for them to run to. Pramano trying to do this deep flank on the left side, but the E-leader is just not able to get into a spot to get anything going right now. They can't hit their shots, and now they've just got all these kinds of specials. You're forced to just dive bomb them to the tower. Booyah Bob comes out, but it's a little bit too late as the checkpoint does fall. And now there's just one. Oh, wow, they're able to get the trade right there. So this game will go on a little bit longer but Comet's just been dominating this entire time and look even though they don't get the KO right now they still hold control of mid and it's still the e-leader that just can't find ways to get involved in the offense because they're constantly running for their life yeah that was a player we haven't really mentioned yet Kumorina on the side of Comet who was the last one alive had the crab at the disposal and we're using it to back off the remaining members of Oral Jackson it was basically a 1v1 or 1v2 as we see a flurry of burst bombs no folks burst bomb rush is not back in the game that's just the incapacity of these splash matics here as we are under the minute mark here one now two crabs at the ready for Comet and they seem to always have them online what can you do when they have both the map control and such a devastating special at their disposal 
Yeah, and I like the aggression coming out from Comet. They have this monstrous lead. There's not much time left. Sometimes you see a team just kind of turtle up or crab up, I guess you could say, and just kind of <laughs> let things work into their favor, let Oro Jackson feed into them. Instead, they're taking the fight to Oro Jackson, and they're winning all of them. Main advantage still in their favor. They still got specials ready to go here. Somebody's just going to have to make a hero play for Oro Jackson if they want to find a way to come back in this one. Yeah, it's going to be close, and it may require overtime here. Kyrie going to get a big pick, though, to start things off. That's one of their three potential crab users taken out. They have one at the ready, and you can see just how spaced out they are. The Booyah Bomb going to go out pretty early onto what would be the second checkpoint. It will not find a KO. However, we have entered overtime. It is going to be the Wave Breaker expended here. Kasuchi having to dodge it. The E-Leader goes down on the tower. Pomaine having a bit of trouble, but finally able to cl uh, climb it while they're in their crab, being hit by a couple of burst bombs and Kasuchi just barely touching it with the tip of their toes and that will secure things here in this best of three for Comet who takes the set 2-0 over Oro Jackson. Yeah, Oro Jackson was able to control the left side area of the spawn for Comet. The problem is there was just one of the crabs ready to go on the complete opposite side of the map. They couldn't defend all the areas at the same time. And that's credit to Comet for having such a huge lead, having all that map control. They could get positioned exactly where they needed to be in overtime and close that one out. So it is going to be a, well, a all Japan with a special guest Keo in Losers Finals. But <laughs> uh, the winner will get the opportunity to take on Starburst and Grands. But Oro Jackson, a great tournament run from them. A good bounce back from losing in round one. Uh, and you look at the teams that are ahead of them, you can't feel too bad about finishing in fourth place to these monsters. Yeah, it's certainly been a strong run for Oral Jackson. They have to be proud, first off, of defeating Alliance Rogue. As you mentioned, they've had some not-so-solid history, especially recently, against them. You mentioned that 4-1 defeat, and now able to take them out in loser's quarters. Also taking down a couple of other teams that had some pretty solid matches today, like Cat Meta taking them to Game 3 and taking them out. They defeated Graveyard Shift earlier in the tournament. Um, and, you know, the other teams that may get this far as well, Sayonara also making it to loser's quarters. They had some difficult matches ahead of them, especially after getting knocked into losers round one. And remember, folks, if you're enjoying the content and the tournament here, you can contribute to the prize pool. The current prize pool, if I'm reading this correctly, is $1,000. $345.03. You can donate using exclamation point donate or paypal.me slash it one to contribute. That will be split among some of the best teams from today. Popgun, I know we have to back out a little bit in just a second here. Uh, any final comments on what we've seen today? Yeah, you said something about call them a nightmare because they're eating them Z's. Did I hear that correctly? <laughs> you've been, you know, the uh, Austi and Nine are coming up. You, you've been listening to too many Austi or hanging around Austi too much when you're making comments like that. Or, or maybe uh, playing too much Pokemon <laughs> or thinking about Darkrai, you know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that, that's my final thought. Hey, uh, no, here's my actual, my actual final thought. Uh, I want to give a shout out to the TOs for this event. This is a big undertaking that they're taking up here to run a event of this scale for Mulloway. I remember when Mulloway started out as a little launch point draft cup and look at them now hosting this big, awesome tournament, bringing in some uh, good commentators and some great ones like me and allowing all the idiots in chat to say their stupid things. So just a quick shout out to the TOs and also our streamer Jeff as well. Yeah, fantastic job from the coordinators of this tournament. It's been fantastic. It's drawn a lot of the high level talent, which this weekend itself has been chock full of. We've had Area Cup, we've had SWC, and now for y'all, we're going to be taking a quick break and we'll do some ad reads as well before we get into the action. So bear with us for just a moment. The first one is going to be for Mulloway IT's Megalodon Cup. Dive down deep into a single mode tournament. Megalodon Cup is back in the new year with a new schedule running monthly starting on the 7th of January, 2023 with Rainmaker. Get the Megalodon role in the Mulloway IT server. If you've been playing in this tournament, you were probably already in that server for when signups open. Uh, the next one will be for IPL's Splatoon Advanced Circuit. Let's ring in the new year with IPL as SAC returns this January 
for a brand new circuit. Join us on Saturday, January 14th at 2 p.m. Eastern to start earning points for your team. The eight teams with the most points by the end of the fourth tournament will be invited to play in the finals and compete to be crowned the best mid-level team in Splatoon 3. Popgun, you want to take the other two over? No, it's so messed up that you did the IPL one and made me read off the Napa <laughs> Productions ad. What's going on here? What, is this a setup? All right, fine. I'll I'll shell out for <laughs> Dapple Productions. So be it. <laughs> W. Dapple Productions is an international Splatoon tournament organization. They host tournaments for European and North American time zones, but everyone can join their various events. Dapple streams their tournaments live on Twitch and regularly uploads competitive YouTube videos. To find out more, check out their website at dapple.inc or follow their official Twitter at DappleProd. <laughs> God, we got through that. Okay. Splatoon Stronghold uh, is a competitive uh, Splatoon resource provider to long-term and newcomers alike for the competitive scene. So Stronghold is on a competitive mission to make competitive Splatoon more accessible than ever before. To find out more, you can check out their website at SplatoonStronghold.com or follow them on Twitter at SBLStrong proud of you for getting through that i know i know it was tough not to uh have the ipl in there uh but hey you know uh feel free to promote yourself as it were i know you've got lots of stuff cooking in the in the waterworks as well hey i'm gonna be recapping everything you're seeing today on this stream with the storm break recap episode of the podcast tomorrow at 6 p.m eastern standard time other than that uh, as soon as this tournament ends, my wife and I are going grocery shopping. So if the teams could get into the lobbies quickly so we can get <laughs> back home while the sun is still up, that would be awesome. But I'm looking forward to more great action from this. Uh, Zach, where can we find you? Uh, mainly just on Twitter at Shiny Hunter Zach. You know, I cast tournaments from time to time. I was in the Splat World Championships this past weekend. Uh, and my co commentator for that nine will be joining us shortly along with Austi. So I want to say a big good luck uh, to them. But thank you all so much. This has been an absolutely fantastic tournament. And you're about to see the conclusion of it coming soon. This is Stormbreak. Stick around. Losers Finals and Grand Finals will be coming up soon.
Howdy, folks, and welcome to Losers Finals. Oh my goodness, Osti. We have been in the back talking over and over about these last sets, excitedly exclaiming over every crab how much we love it. But uh, we have an incredible match for you here, Melon God versus Comet. Before we dive too far in, though, Osti, tell us just how excited you were to see five crabs and potentially a sixth in this set. Dude, I, one thing that was missing that I was thinking about was where is that six crab? Where is it? How come I'm only seeing five? I need more. And this might be the set where we actually get that six crab nine. Both of these teams have been known to run three splash dramatics, and then a fourth is like the, the jumping jacks of whatever you want to be able to throw in. But having six crabs on the floor is something I want to see. I don't know about you, but that's something we need. I, I pref would honestly prefer seven or eight crabs even if we could get it. And right. uh We'll, we'll stop pulling your leg right now. We'll actually give these teams their due. Melon God, you can see on the left side, sitting on the winner's side of losers, if that makes any sense to you all, after losing 3-1 to Starburst early on. Kyo, Shelton, Klix, and Kuro Kuro. Lots of accolades for those players, but before we dive too deep, we of course need to talk about Comet, who has had a bit longer of a run. They got a 2-0 victory over Sayonara and then a 2-0 victory over Oro Jackson in losers quarters and losers semis, respectively. Yeah, and uh, that was the team that we saw a lot of just running triple splash putt plus a different weapon. Whether they're going to be running with the Flingza, you know, for like just get some missiles from the background or whether they want to run Junior, whether it's like on tower control to get that bubbler or clamp list just for painting so you can be able to have more maneuverability. But regardless, they are definitely running that triple splash. Maddie, it looks like we're going to jump right into game number one. Nine, let's have at it. Love it when it moves quick. We'll see it right here. The classic composition that has been run all across the world coming out here from the members of Melon God. And on the other side, the Comet Special. Osti, this is one of the first teams that figured out, let's just run more splash and see if it works out. And so far, it's served them quite well in this edition of the tournament. Yeah, I mean, guaranteeing themselves a top three position. We're going to dive right now into game number one. Keo on that machine, the lone machine. This is the weapon that we used to think was going to be like the dominating weapon in the meta before we understood crab, but still has a lot of utility at the range. It has tons of range to be able to shoot from very far away. And look at this. They're just kind of going back and forth. No splat downs have been happening until finally we see that first mark coming out from Comet with that crab. Yeah, and oftentimes on this map, the way that you're going to see it is both sides are going to use their own box to set up their crab and try to pick out where the opponent's coming from. The maps really start to change when you have somebody sitting over by the opponent's crab where you can disrupt its fire rate a little bit, move it around, or punish as the other members move through. You know the crabs are going to be there, so you've got to try to stay one step ahead. Yeah, I got those whistles coming in. Looks like Orange Team Comet's going to be able to take away that plus sign for the Splat Zones, maintain that lead. And now they're starting to make this push. We got 1v1. Unfortunately, went a little bit too deep. We got two Splats coming down from the opponent's Flingza. Melon God going to be able to take that zone with the weapon. You know, a lot of times people will be playing Flingza specifically for the missiles, but you also got to be good with that roller. You got to be able to take those fights, especially when they're up close and personal. Well, and I'm sure anyone who's played it knows that it does a really, really good job not only of building special, but keeping Zoo neutralized. It's a lot like the Dynamo Roller or an Explosher in that sense. So that weapon is certainly not a weak main weapon here once you're able to use it as the lead is finally going to flip. We've seen essentially the same thing happen for both sides where once you get two or three down, when you disrupt the set play of the crabs going back and forth, you simply move through and try to make a play happen. Comet with a nice punishment though to get what is most likely going to be the lead. And Aussie, this is where it matters to you. You can see Wasabifu here on the far left side, immediately dropping back to paint. Will they be able to take advantage of what should be at least a double crab sequence? Kurokuro is going to open it up with the missiles here. Watch the run in on the bottom side. It's going to be clicks and another Booyah Bomb. And Osti, it looks like they're content to just give this zone up entirely simply to keep their lives. Yeah, honestly, just to be able to stay in the fight, be able to give up the zone, recognize that they're going to use all those specials to take it and then just come back immediately with a fight. That's something that could be on the play, but right now, Comet's still all staying alive with all their, you know, Splash Max ready to go here, trying to build up some meter on top of that, going to give them some more crabs in the action. And we see this little close-up fight right there on the left. He recognizes that someone's over there from Melon God and trying to get this pincer, gets a big spot on Kyo, tries to go for another 1v1, unfortunately does not win it. That's going to give Melon God an opportunity to continue that trade. 
a bloodbath here in the center, and it is going to be Comet that's going to come out. There's so many fine micro points there that we could point out to you all, but every single one of those fights coming out overall in favor of Comet, they had their painting still on the map. They had at least one crab in reserve as well, and now the crab's going to come out in the spot that we talked about. Pestering it is Kodo Kodo, but gets picked out. That crab went away so quickly, but that's the other part about crab. Even once you get taken out, you're still able to move through very quickly. The last two members going to attack Shelton here, and now they're pushed all the way up here. Kodo Kodo has to be careful, but you can start to see blood in the water as Comet moves forward, and they've got a crab ready for when the counter push comes. And here it comes. They got the crab versus crab. The missile's going to try to have to have, force them and push them back and just have to pull the hand off the trigger in order to try to get back in there. Unfortunately, they could not get there in time. And that's going to be game number one, Nine. Yep, you can see the sequence. I know a lot of you viewers at home who were with us throughout the duration of the final portion of Splatoon 2 finally started to pick up on some of the patterns here of how teams would push back in with missiles and ink armor. You can kind of piece together the same patterns here in Splatoon 3 with crabs, where they opt to go, where they opt to get set up. And that's why when you know that the opponent is going to have to crab from one side, you put your crab on the other side, and then once your second crab, or even just one of your splash matics with an object shredder can encroach on the other side, it means you're eventually going to outscale, and the opponent's going to have to make an incredible play to do it. And that's hard to ask even these level of players for. Yeah, and Nine, we were talking a lot before we went live with this uh, Losers Finals. But one of the things we talked about was crabs in general and how you deal with them and like what's the counterplay. And you kind of described it very well. It's like it's less, it's less about that counterplay and more about just trying to get those pokes and get them to stop firing their gun just to, so they're not as big of a threat. Try to get them to look away from their primary target so they can become like the actual true slayer. Absolutely. Yeah, that is the one nice piece of if any if you want to call it crab counterplay is that if you get them to stop their fire rate, it does slow it down ever so slightly and they have to build it back up again. Now, of course, they can also use Explosher-esque shots firing over the center of the map and they can kind of call on those whenever they like and there's great mobility, but you take the small victories where you can get them. And those are the subtle pieces that will give you an advantage long term. If the opponent spends half of their crap getting back up to what would be their original fire rate, it just makes it that much more time that you have to get back and into the positions that you need. We're going to move on to Tower Control, Inkblot, Art Academy, though. Surprise, surprise, Osti. We've had two maps, and huh, Mako Martin, Inkblot, Art Academy are the two. Who'd have thunk it? Who's shocked right now? Type one in the chat if you are, because it's certainly not me. As we go into Tower Control for Inkblot, like you said, probably going to be seeing from Comet the triple splash, and that's what we've been seeing the whole time. But instead of the Flingza, we've been seeing a lot more Junior for Tower Control, specifically for that big bubbler, dude. On Tower Control, it's a really useful tool for just trying to, like, force pushes, right? If you put a big cylinder shield around the tower while it's moving forward, there's not much you can do about it besides, like, either break the shield as fast as possible or try to just, like, sneak in through it and get, like, a back shot and just to, like, try, try to, like, figure out a way to keep that tower moving. Especially when you know that there are crabs here, it's that much more difficult to reliably get a long-term push. If you're able to squeak through one of the checkpoints with it, that is so invaluable. It means every push exponentially stronger. On the other side, Shelton going to be going off of the flings of roller and back over to that tried and true trusty sloshing machine. Double slosh, double splash. This is the comp that's been used since this game came out. Yeah, right, and what's very interesting is in the beginning of Splatoon 3, like, we've been seeing nothing but, like, flingzas and missiles and missiles domination, but right now, I'm not seeing a single missile on the map. No, and in some respects, it's just not immediate enough. You can charge up a Booyah Bomb, and that pretty well forces the opponents to get way away from it here, and, you know, Speaking it's something of. to be said for, yeah, double going out there trying to neutralize the crab and actually does get it. All it takes is two Booyah Bombs, folks. That's all it takes to get rid of it. But now that did create enough space for the other members to move forward here. Clicks actually should be the last crab on the map, and that usually wins the engagement. They're going to continue to get onto the tower here, knowing that this is the most important checkpoint on the map. Just a couple more seconds. They've moved through it. They have both of their slash machines pushed up. The specials are going to start to cycle, and what a counterpunch this has been thus far for Melon God. The game has just started, and we're already approaching the third checkpoint for Melon God. We've got Booyah Bomb going to force people to move out of the way. It's a 2v2 right now. Make that a 2v1. Only a junior left to go. A junior fighting by themselves. There's not much to be able to do in the process. They forget about the tower. They're going to get right back on it to try to break that third checkpoint. And this is where it gets scary. You can see Kyo wisely backing up here, wants to build special, knowing that one more well-placed Booyah Bomb could break through them instead. Tries to shark through, and there's just too much more ability here from Wasabifu. We know exactly what this kid is capable of, how quickly it moves. It's going to be a wipeout, a bloodbath here. 
But of course, you are A-OK -okay with a trade because that tower will move back to the center. A push to 17 at the start, Osti, and a great opening play for Melon God. If there's any defense you can bring to the table, that's exactly what Comet needed to do, right? Just saving that checkpoint alone is going to spell wonders for them in their next push whenever Comet finally finds themselves with a little bit of aggression. Right now, they have two people go down, so this is not looking the most promising for them. Melangod going to play a little bit safe, you know, would not, not have to go too far with the push. They have the ability to play defense. What, regardless, there's still three minutes left. What is that going on, dude? Look at that splash. I, it's just unbelievable. They set up their entire defense on the right side of the map. Usually conventional thinking says spread out at least a little bit so you can identify where the opponent's coming from, but I guess in some respects when you have burst bombs, you can scout from wherever you are on the map. They move forward very quickly and it meant that they could stack boost, or burst bombs on top of each other. Not Booyah Bomb, excuse me, but they could stack those for big, big chunks of damage very early on. So again, a little adaptation, figuring out how they wanted to defend and you know, this push might not have big legs here, but they got back mid and they stopped the opposing push before it could really get started. Yeah, so now we're coming right back here. Melangod has yet to even make a push of their own. Not even one singular point. Gonna take that trade against Kyo. This is gonna put Comet in kind of a weird situation, but they're still gonna go for this push still ever so slightly. They're going to do a 1v1 there in the middle of the map. Another one coming up from the center, try to get like a little bit of a pincer action. Good retreating from Melangod to just kind of get away from that tower. Go back, try to reclaim some territory and come back with more of your teammates. Yep, and this is great survivability here. Getting set up here, they could set up a pivot on this side if they want. Instead, they're gonna back up there. I guess they called out that the attack was on the other side. Shelton sneaking through with the slashing machine and kill right there with them as well. Pushing and attacking on this side. I thought they had done a great job of establishing that far left box, you so often need to claim that in order to start your pushes, but this might be the best weapon in the game at closing off high ground, Ozzy. I cannot believe that Slosher, just uh, the machine, just being able to cut through that, using the smoke screen from the Booyah Bomb to hide cover to get above the ramp because there's no paint there, and still they got caught at the very end. There still wasn't enough to make that push. And now we're seeing this chase coming out from Comet, gets the wipeout. All the members from Helicot are down, and they are still gonna come back here right it's still they still have a pretty strong lead with only 60 seconds left to go yeah you see shelton dropping down here he's probably okay getting taken down he certainly would have liked one but that's gonna mean that there's enough time left away that his teammates are going to be able to build up crab they are going to give up a lot of points in the process here and they were probably aware of that once they went four down in that spot this is what really matters here. Can they wait out some of these crabs? That's gonna be a jump. At this point, their lives, the most important resource. Kyo is going to get that crab off, is going to get taken down, but moves forward, and that might have built enough space for Kuro Kuro to move forward here, as well as Clix. They're firing at it, that's one down. Clix moving forward and fighting another. Shelton is back as well. The machine will clear the tower. Didn't even have to, though. The rest of the members did such a great job. And Austin, you talk about using your life as a resource, using the points as a resource. We see it often in fighting games, and it certainly holds true here as well. It's becoming so scary, too, because that was the push they needed. And it looks like it got stuck. That is a huge pick for Melon God. That's going to turn this into a situation where they're not going to be able to get on that tower. We're not entering overtime. No one's on it. All they have to do is touch it. And that's exactly what Melon God's going to do to stay in this series man and again the subtle piece of shelton at the very start of that push going off the left flank knowing that probably with a map fully purple that someone was going to pick him out very very quickly but when those two members turned around to fire at him that bought the rest of the team precious seconds to get some paint onto their plat give themselves some footing and more than anything set up their crab defenses at that point, it's a banner of execution. Kyo gets the huge shot on a member that had moved up and started to attack. And Melon God does just enough. They did give up that second checkpoint. It should be noted, it was in the danger zone, as Osti noted, but they knew they still had 20 more points to play with. And as long as they cycled their specials, they were gonna have adequate resources. They had so much time to play defense too. Just because of that first push that Comet got at the very beginning of that game, bringing it all the way to the third checkpoint that gave them so much wiggle room to play around with those resources right like they could give up that point it's like okay whatever you broke the second checkpoint whatever we're gonna recuperate get everyone together build our meters and then we're gonna go in with the push that's exactly what they did and now the counter pick advantage is going to be in comet side for the rest of the set because they took away game number one i would not be shocked at all if we saw yet another splat zones coming out for them because that seems to be where comet's been playing really strongly on Comet is a team in the Japanese scene that has found victory in pretty much every mode. And a lot of people think of 
the Japanese scene is, oh, area cup and very strong in splat zones. And it's true, but there are a lot of teams that are also strong all over as well. And Comet has won a Rainmaker Cup. They've taken second place in a Tower Control Cup as well. So quite strong all over the field. So if they were to go to Rainmaker here, I would certainly favor them. They figured out a strategy revolving around some Dapple Duelies and Triple Splash, meaning that you're going to see not only Crabs, but Crabs with a nice little attack cooler buff or at least splash a with a tax cooler buff, which is almost as scary. So, uh, again, would not be surprised at all to see Rainmaker come out here. Splat Zone's, of course, great, and they've certainly shown their stuff on Tower Control as well. I'm really curious to see if they do go back to Splat Zones, what Shelton is going to be picking on the side of Melangog. Because, Austin, we were actually talking a little bit earlier. Shelton, one of the most versatile players here amongst these final three teams. Yeah, it just has so much diversity on the table. I wait for this game number three. I do want to bring up, by the way, that we just got an updated prize pool. We are now above $1,500. $1,526.10. Thank you guys so much for bringing through that. And we can still continue to make that money just a little bit higher for the players. All you gotta do is type that exclamation point donate. It's gonna give you a link to click on. They're gonna be able to help support these players playing out of their minds. And they're putting a lot on the, on the stage here for us today. So shout outs to everyone here to bring Strong Break up here for a great send off for Splatoon here in the end of 2022. A send off because actually, folks, Splatoon 4 is right around the corner. This is it. This is your last Splatoon 3 tournament. Yeah, dude. They saw the crabs coming out, bro. Like, okay, let's just make a new game. Remove crabs. Ah, let's try again next time. We'll we'll get them next time, folks. We'll get them. You know, no no DLC this time. Ah. Well, I guess we can start speculating on uh, what the next idols are going to be. And actually, since we've got a little minute here, as we wait for the next counter pick and for the teams, Osti. We just got a new Splatfest announced. For those of you who may be unaware, it's Team Spicy versus Team Sweet versus I Team Sour. I can't decide. I oh, cannot come decide. On. I can what? do. I like all three. Uh, okay, uh, listen. You, you, you told me uh, there's. I did a hot chip challenge once because Nine forced it upon me. I had no choice, no option but to do it. Nine literally put put a gun to my head and was like, "Listen, man, you got to eat this hot chip, or else you're never gonna be here again." And so I put the hot chip in my mouth, and I realized I'm not a spicy guy anymore. Unless there's like a thing of milk nearby. I need like a giant jug of milk. And I don't even, I don't even like milk, Nine. That's the thing. Like I was just using it to rinse my mouth. That hot chip is... Guys, if you ever eat a hot chip, simply do not. Simply just keep it away from you. So I know for sure I'm not picking spicy, I guess, at the end of the day. I am not picking spice, Nine. Okay, well... I can at least sympathize with you a little bit on that one because I too have one that I am absolutely not picking. I am absolutely not picking Team Sweet. I am not a sweet tooth. I skip dessert almost every time that I get. Never really been a big fan of sweets, but I love spicy food and I love sour food. So I'll have a difficult time choosing between those two. Sort of leaning Team Spicy because, you know, I mean, Team Shiver, come on. But um, I don't know. I'll have to decide. Love, you don't love like a good sweet? lemon. You don't, you don't, no. you don't got like a sweet tooth or anything? You don't, no. Don't you, like you never went camping, made s'mores, and like, man, this is the greatest thing on the planet Earth. Like, I mean, I, I went camping, but I just had extra hot dogs while everybody else was eating s'mores. Okay, so you're literally when you're a kid, you're still trying to like do some, you know, get that protein intake. I feel it. I feel it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Your whole life. Are just, hot dogs are just tasty. Come on. Hot, what, do we even know what hot dogs are made out of? Mm. Do, do you? Protein. <laughs> you know what? You're not wrong. Man, I think maybe I'm going to pick sweet. I think I'm going to go with sweet nine. And not not just to, you know, because you didn't even have it on your radar. But I think I just, there's something about a good little nice dessert as a treat that you can put in your mouth that just makes you feel happy. I get the most happiness when I eat sweets. I understand that there is the downfall afterwards that you get that sugar rush, you know? I understand that, and I, I am simply a person that lives in the present. I mean, that got a little deeper there than I I expected. Um, what do you mean? I'm I mean, just, just stating the facts. I It's true. It's true. <sighs> Cannot be disputed. Yeah, you know what? I bet that, that that's why we're waiting on this map number three, by the way, is because they're trying to depict... Instead of in the middle of the tournament, they're trying to go for whether they're going for spice, sweet, or sour, but we just got word on the counter pick. We did indeed. Something that is not spicy, sweet, or sour is clams. 
It's a Glam Blitz on Museum D'Alfonsino. And we saw this earlier, actually. I believe it was Starburst that went to this counter pick earlier against Melon God. And Osti, we were in our own little voice chat. You were popping off at the plays on this map and mode. Oh, yeah, dude. I could not believe it was a 100 0 off of one push, off of one break. And it was because there was that time, dude. Like, I, I think it was, it was Silver that was just staying alive for some, somehow, some reason, just being able to stay underneath that hoop and just continue to make pot shots at the hoop and continue to score those three clams bit by bit and manage to just seal the deal. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one thing. This is a map especially where the mid is so wide and you can get back to a scoring position very quickly thanks to the spinner. It, it means that you are always assuming that if a push gets through and the opponent truly commits to it, there's going to be at least two power claims and usually a third. We see big, big scores on this map mode all the time. The real difference, as you noted there, Osti, is there's probably going to be some fighting, some scuffling, but there's always room for the opponent to jump back out, and it's hard to attack them. So any bit of survivability you can add will make a huge, huge difference as the game goes on. Yeah, now we're going to, speaking of the game going on, it's going to start right now. We've got our comps coming out. Nothing's really changed from the blast game, except we're going off of the junior into a flingza. Once those missiles, especially on a map like this museum, you got that rotating platform in the middle, which is pretty dominant spot to have, because if you manage to get on top of that, it's going to give you a lot of range to be able to shoot from anyone down below. That's going to be a 2v1 there on the side. That's going to open them up to be able to pick up some clams in terms of Melon God. And one of the other things that was noted to me yesterday in the Splat World Championship when people were talking about how you play around Splash-O-Matic is, well, just rush the gun down. If they go into it, there is a little period of time where it's not going to be able to get into its crab. You're going to be able to deal with it, but you have to be very quick and you have to make the call early on. We've seen it really twice already in this game, and it's why Melon God currently is in possession of a power claim and a decent scoring opportunity if they can get their jump in. You see Kyo having to back off here. The other members have spawned in. So for the time being, it's stifled, but already a nice pace at the start of this game for Melon God. It's a nice pace and some really good patience coming up from Melon God because now they found their prime opportunity. They waited for two of them to go down before pushing up and starting to make that opening goal. Already below 60 points. We got some more crabs coming in. Can we get some more crabs, some more clams? I, I, I'm pretty sure crabs have nothing to do with clams besides just both being underwater, but they're still putting up a lot of points here, Nine. Well, Osti, I don't know, if, but this game's kind of based around nautical theming. 47 points already as Clicks now moves in. And now with a famous Click Shark, he is famous for this, moving in and attacking and is going to be able to get a punishment started. That is going to stop the scoring, but the threat is not yet gone here. Wisely moving away and being willing to give up this part of their map here, understanding that if they try to attack this crab, they might give up another score. You see another power clam has already been built up. There's still more attacking here, and thankfully a clam in the back, or a crab, excuse me, in the back pocket to at least slow it down for the time being. But Comet hasn't gotten back into mid, and we're two minutes into this game. Yeah, it's like they're struggling to just get a home base here. Comet finally getting a little bit of uh, breathing room only because Melon God kind of backed off a little bit, trying to recuperate their teammates as they're kind of dumbing that middle grade. They don't actually have to go for a push at this point. They just kind of dominate the mid middle of the stage and just play patient, play safe, play defensive and control an economy of the clams. There's not much Comet can do if they just keep holding on to them, hoarding them. But we finally have a power climb being built here for Comet. And then the second they go for it, you notice that Melon God's also trying to go for a push as well. They're probably going to be able to get it. Yep, and you can see one member finally did jump down and was able to get somebody from behind, but that's a heavy price to pay, taking the direct from the slosh machine. Shelton moving forward, the first, or Booyah Bomb not able to take out that last member, so more points will go in the basket here. Kyo is going to try to bump back. Kuro Kuro tries to defend and gets taken out in the process. So finally, Osti, after another full minute goes by, Comet should have at least a decent look at the middle of the map. They've called out a member here, and they're going to have a crab already on this left side. At this point, it's going to be how Melon God can poke and prod and try to bait some of those out early on. And it does look like Kyo was able to at least get one out. That's going to be a little less sustainability on their push if they do score. This could be really huge for Comet if they manage to break open this basket, because not only did they collect that Pity Clam, they have two Power Clams because of it, there's still yet another Pity Clam in the back because they picked it up before it dropped down, so there's going to be so many Point Clams on the plate. Look at that number, 30 Clams on top of the Pity Clam that's still sitting back there. They need this push, and they need it right now. Yep, they might have gotten what they needed there. There was a period there where it looked like Melon God was trying to shut the door on them and dove in maybe a little bit heavy-handedly. Instead, they finally do come out on top. The respawn advantage is in favor of Melon God, being that it's closer to their side of the map. And now 
desperately. Comet moves back, tries to save as many of their power clamps as they can. They know one is back on base. This is going to be a great shot to start it off here on the bottom side. They will trade out their flings roller for it, but you are okay with that. You're going to have the crab advantage over time here. Kyo going down as well. There's just one Splashomatic left who's going to have to make a huge play. Two members are going to encroach and not even able to get a trade. There's opportunities here. Where is the power clamp? One's gonna go down, the other's gonna drop it. Austin, they lost both of their clamps even though they had an advantage. They were pushing it so far too. You saw them just push it one by one all the way into the end and they just all got wiped out. All of the clamps completely destroyed. And that was a chance for them to take the lead in that opportunity. And now things are gonna be struggle bus. There's 40 seconds left. Melon God has the lead right now with all this like terms of just controlling the map, controlling center, controlling the economy of the clams. This is going to be such a giant hill for Comet to climb. Yeah, that entire time was a defense played by Melon God. Well, they were on what I would call the back foot. They were defending from their own base, which is not easy. Now they get to defend with the idea that they also have the map on their side. That's another one down. Make it two. They're going to push forward here. It looks like Clicks is simply going to sit back, paint up, build one last crab in case any magic happens. But I think the magic show might be done here. Waiting out these missiles. One last member trying to dive in. But Melon God, an incredible game, fully in control and great defense all over. We've got an overtime here, but you get the sense it's almost a formality at this point. Yeah, it's just kind of like, you know what's going to happen. Like, this is like, even if they manage to get a wipeout at this point, they've, even if they score right now, they simply just do not have enough clams to even bring it even close to 32 points afterwards. So, yeah, things are kind of looking bleak currently, and that's going to be Melon God taking the next game on Comet's counterpick, mind you. Yep, and I would say very confidently working it against Comet that time as well. Even though I know they were defending that entire time, it is so easy when the opponent has three crabs for you to make one mistake here. You try to get a little overzealous to attack a crab, and then suddenly the opponent snowballs you, and we've seen what that map looks like. If you make one misstep on the defense, it seems like the opponent just gets points for free over and over, but a very, very smart, precise, and classy defense that time by Melon God. And where do you go now if you're Comet? Again, we talked a little bit about Rainmaker earlier. If you weren't willing to break out Rainmaker there, it, it almost indicates to me, Osti, that they aren't quite as confident on Rainmaker as maybe we'd originally suspected. It could be that they're not confident, or it could be like a metagame thing. Like, let's let, let's let them pick the Rainmaker map once we win this next one. I feel like going with the Clam Blitz was kind of like a gamble in terms of trying to play the counterpick game. And now because they lost on it, they've lost all counterpick advantage for the rest of the set. Now, now Comet has to be able to go with something here with their last counterpick for game number four. It's now or never if they want to go to Rainmaker. Well, we'll wait for it here, folks. Again, we appreciate your patience here. There is an ocean and language barrier in between our uh, our wonderful production staff and the teams right now. So again, we, we do appreciate your patience here as we work through Losers Finals of Stormbreak. As a reminder, if you are just joining us, this wonderful tournament put on by Mullaway IT. You can see scrolling across the bottom, their Twitters, their Patreons here. Support the people who support us in the scene. And of course, you can hit exclamation point donate as well if you would like to contribute to our still growing, mind you, prize pool that is currently at $1,531.18. I cannot believe we hit the 1.5k, but I know we have it in us, guys. Can we get 2,000? Can we get 2k? Maybe if we, we have a whale join in, you know? I, you know, a lot of people that play Splatoon also play gotcha games when you think about it. So I know there's a whale somewhere in the chat. I know you're there. <laughs> Gonna call out uh, Ice, the, the proud member of, uh, of Starburst that is waiting in winner's finals. Ice, you have in private, or what you thought was private, told me that you uh you do like to uh open the wallet a little bit for the Genshin characters. So listen, I uh I think there's a little little room here for you if you want to, but uh you know, I, I should probably donate a little bit myself actually now that I'm just exposing people. Listen, but in any case I, all I'm saying is that if you donate money right now and you pretend it's like a Genshin role, right? I will download a JPEG of your favorite character and send it to you directly, personally. Oh. Oh, oh it's this the same is thing. It's yeah, the same is thing. Okay, hold on a second here. What? No, I'm holding. What am I holding for? For me to do the thing you told me to do. I'm so proud of you, Nine. I could not be prouder. All right. Uh, what's it going to cost to get my character? Uh, who do you want? Uh, uh, surprise me. 
Ike. All right. How much is Ike worth to you, Nine? Don't ask me that question. How much is he worth to you, Nine? I know you bought a figurine of him. Yeah, yeah we won't talk about that. Payment has How been much sent. Figurine cost Nine. Pay payment has been sent. <laughs> Payment has been sent. I will take. I'll leave it to you, Aussie, to figure out how much I donated, and uh, we'll we'll okay. go from there. But uh, yeah, you can just send me send me on your leisure here uh, once we're done entertaining. I just, the put, in the, I just put in the Discord chat. Oh, there it is, right just, there for you, buddy. Just a Hello, render Wally. of the. <laughs> My God! All right, Rainmaker Scorch Gorge. We can finally stop stalling here because we do have Rainmaker, and we have it on really the. The map that this game was built around from an aesthetic standpoint. The, the, with Scorch Gorge? Dude, I'm a huge fan of this map, Nine. Like, literally, like you said, the aesthetic hotches it right. You got the uh, the, the upside down, uh, what is it? The, the Statue of... No, oh my god, I almost called the Statue of Liberty. What's wrong with me? All right, I'll take it over from here. Uh, so Thank Scorch you, Gorge here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, more than anything, one of the... One of the reasons I do find this map mode pretty endearing from a Rainmaker standpoint is it's one of the few maps where I think you do get an entirely different look from an attacking standpoint if you take it left or right. Of course, you can get there from the middle. You've got the grates on one side, and you can simply run it up the ramp on the other side. But the reason why it's so fun, I think, to play on Rainmaker is because if you take it on the right side, you have a little bit more protection. However, it also means that you're in almost a tunnel. It's still kind of open, but it means that if somebody has a crab, they're probably going to be able to take out not just the carrier, but anybody escorting them. On the other side of that, though, if everyone is shooting in one way, you can sneak somebody around, attack, and break through. And it appears that Melon God is not going to deviate from this double splash, double sloshy machine. And on the other side, well, you know, slightly different numbers, but it's the same idea. They got the same spirit. There are two weapons that exist on this map currently. <laughs> like, literally, that is it. Those are That's all you got. Okay, so with Rainmaker, we're going to pop that bubble here for Comet side again. They're not really going to go for that push just yet until if someone tries to find a pick. There's going to be the Crab, the Double Crab, mind you, coming out from Comet trying to find something here. But everyone's pretty relatively safe right now. You're seeing Melon God getting a little cheeky here, trying to go for it, not picking up the Rainmaker just yet. At this point, no one has gone down until they finally take a trade. Yeah, and that was an incredible trade there. I'm stunned that it was a trade. I thought both of those players had the right position. Instead, now Wasabifu is going to go down here and try to attack clicks to make sure that nobody can get behind them. It means that there will be one less person on the attack, but that doesn't matter. They took him out so quickly that it was A-OK. -okay. They're once again going to jump through here. It looks like clicks finally did go down, but it might have bought enough time. That first checkpoint does tend to go pretty quick here. It's the points afterward that matter. We'll see how they opt to attack here again. Very slowly moving up here, baiting out crabs, throwing Booyah Bombs at them. Looks like that machine going to pay for it with their life. They're going to have to back up here. And more than anything, let this Rainmaker reset and try to find a new plan. Yeah, I mean, that's what you have to do. There was such a great moment for them to be able to break that first checkpoint for Common. And even though it did reset back to the middle, they no longer have to worry about that checkpoint anymore. I'm going to throw that Booyah Bomb just to help paint it as well as just get people off the zone for this free push. Not going to be able to be as free as they originally thought, but maybe, understandably, they managed to get on there. That was such a good push from Melon God because you saw him actually going into the deep line, chasing after them, forcing Comet to push back while the Rainmaker goes in. They're trying to get even more cheeky. Look at that. Clicks going in for an additional point just to get past that checkpoint and guarantee themselves a slight lead. Yeah, oftentimes at this level, when you see people go for those few points, it's because they understand that that's all they're going to get. There's nothing more. They can't go back to mid and squeeze out a bigger push here. They simply have to get the points while they can. But three of them did go down in quick succession here, so that means that they're going to have a very difficult time on the defensive side here. Oh my goodness, three down. It's just one more already. That's a delayed wipe. They're going to run it forward here. Another no. one out, and unbelievably, it's going to be a knockout at this level on Scorch Gorge. Comet, take a bow. Did I just watch solo queue for a second? Like, I see that all the time in ranked mode, bro, but not here on the big stage. That was such a gigantic push. They went all the way from the mid, broke the first checkpoint, and then picked it up again and just carried it all, getting all of those splats in the process. Comments like, hey, we're not done just yet. You may have gotten that win on our counter pick, but now we finally brought the Rainmaker. Like you said earlier, that was the map they felt most comfortable on was that game mode. And now we're finally going to a game five, the final game of Losers Finals coming up right now. Well, there it is, folks. We talked up why Comet was waiting for that Rainmaker counter pick, and we were wondering why we didn't see it earlier. And I think, Osti, you're musing that it may have been simply to save for a game five scenario. 
may have been accurate because that looked like clear domination. They immediately off the start of the game were able to get that dunk. Yes, they gave up their own checkpoint in the process, but you can see the clear difference when you have the triple crab and when you are confident with how you want to play on Rainmaker. They really only needed two pushes. And I'm telling you folks, that Scorch Gorge against high level teams, you don't usually knock it out in two pushes. So there you go. And now we will wait on our game five counter pick. Melon God was able to take back the counter pick advantage here. So they certainly will be holding serve for this portion of it. The winner moves on to face Starburst in the grand final. But folks, this is exactly what we wanted out of Stormbreak and certainly what we wanted from these two teams. Exactly. Look at the var variation in terms of game modes. We've seen every single game mode here besides, uh, you know, Turf War, obviously. But for game number five, I, you know, if I was a betting man, I would say, let's just go back to Splat Zones, right? That's the most common mode, especially for those Japanese teams that play in the Area Cup constantly. But if you look at the past results, they did lose on Splat Zones. It was pretty domination coming out from Comet. So now it's like, okay, where are our strengths? Where are we strong on? We got a pretty strong lead in Tower Control Inkblot Art Academy, so maybe something along those lines. Clan Blitz also was very helpful for them, so, you know, it's all about what we're going to be able to bring out here for Game 5 and what game mode, because there's so much on the line here, so much at stake to be able to get this win and go into Grand Finals to face off against Starburst, because if you remember previously in the bracket, Starburst took down both of these teams. Yep, they did. Beat them both 3-1. Easy. Light work, as it were. I know they were close games, of course, so wow. don't really want to say bad things about either of these teams. But yeah, if Starburst was ever to win it, we will talk plenty about the roster that they have brought in today. Um, this would be the look here. They certainly have figured out the way they want to play around the meta, and the nice wrinkle that Noricio has brought in them as well is, is making all the difference as the games go on. But... As we wait now, once again, we want to thank you for joining us here for Stormbreak, Mullaway IT1. We have a new number for our current prize pool. Osti, they listened. You asked, they listened. Our current prize pool, $1,757.24. Folks, we still have some time left. You can hit exclamation point, donate. Let's see if we can hit 2K. We are under $250 to hear it. That's the cup, price of a cup of coffee. You go to the coffee shop there. Just $250, folks. I know we can spare that shit. I'm sorry? Wh where are you getting your coffee, sir? Um, I was really hoping that we would get information of where the counter pick was right there, and I would just be like, <laughs> oh, well, I get my coffee. Starbucks, clearly. <laughs> like you <laughs> At Splat Zones Flounder Heights. No, that's yeah, I, I know. I, I, could, I could tell you had that ready to go. I am so sorry. But the thing, <laughs> but you're absolutely right in the fact that we actually are really close to 2000 now. I was kind of making it as a kind of a joke, but the second that we got $250, I'm like, wait, hold on. This is actually totally plausible to get above 2K. Guys, can we get above 2K? Hit that exclamation point, donate in the chat to know where to put that money. You can also, if everyone here right now in chat puts down a real price a cup of coffee, I think we can make it. I think so too. And we are, I know where our viewership is hitting good numbers here. I don't have the most up-to-date data, but you know, this viewership for these these homegrown tournaments and uh, Popgun gave a, a a stunning and thrilling and beautiful ode to the Mullaway IT team for how much they've grown, how they've built up this brand and how the production value has continued to climb. Over and over and we'll we'll give our nice eulogies after the tournament is over as well but eulogies who well, died poor choice of words but uh, <laughs> uh you know sometimes you just say what comes to your mind and i think of beautiful speeches i think of wedding speeches and eulogies and you know nobody was getting married here so i, I just went with option b hey but, you know what it might be a <laughs> marriage of do, do you crab take this uh sloshing machine to be your awfully wedded wife awfully I mean, maybe. Yeah, a lot of people. I've heard people use worse words to describe what these two weapons have done thus far. Wow. You don't want you, you can't see them on the mic, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I would say I'm off the mic either. Some filthy words. Finally, right? folks. Mince me metalworks. So okay, this is this is a very intriguing pick because going to Rainmaker, of course, we've talked about comment, we just saw what they did. But this map in particular is one of the more slow spaced out maps as long as you don't go three or four down. And I know that seems like the analysis of the century. We can defend well if our whole team isn't respawning. But 
Hear me out, we all know how Stolly this map can play. And if there was ever a time for Shelton to switch to another weapon with a little bit more range, this might be the time to do it. And we won't have to speculate much longer, everybody. Game five here in Losers Finals. There we go, we got the triple uh, splash o matic with the slosh machine, we got the triple <laughs> Just, <laughs> is this real? <laughs> Six crabs! We called for it, we begged for it, perhaps foolishly, and we got it. Six crabs and a lowly sloshing machine lagging behind, folks. This is Splatoon 3 at the top level. Immediately, Shelton gonna build a crab fire to try to create some space. You're not gonna see that Rainmaker get picked up for the time being, at least until they're able to get a couple members down. But they understand the longer they take, the more that the opponent is going to be able to build up crabs for their own. Look for a lot of this jousting back and forth from other sides of the map, because of course we can. What can't this special do? Uh, literally, it can do your laundry too, but even though you have a sloshing machine on your deck. But the thing is, the problem that's happening right now is no one's really going for the approach. The second someone does go for an approach, they fall down immediately. That's going to give Melon God a slight lead here. And now they're going to be able to make up a slight little push with their Splash of Max. going to pick up the Rainmaker here for this first initial wave. Let's see if they're going to be able to make it. It's totally looking purple right now. They're desperately throwing out burst bombs. That's going to stop it before they can even reach the checkpoint. Yep, but you see them moving forward there, trying to get everybody to look that way so that if they did have a crab, they'd be able to pick out where the people were defending from and maybe extend that from a longer range. Give credit to Comet there, not biting on the bait, quickly taking out and moving back. Never slow on the defensive side, never passive on the defensive side. Now they have two crabs set up in center and there are three members all next to each other, but the one they did not account for comes from behind. Kyo, a great job to take the teeth out of this attack. Now it should be Melon God holding serve if they have their crabs at the right spot. Although it looks like Comet has done a great job as well. Once again, not taking the bait, not moving too far forward and keeping their presence on the map. Sometimes you have to go for that crab too, just to try to help you stay alive. Unfortunately, couldn't stay alive long enough. That's gonna give Melon God that slight opportunity to burst that bomb, as well as be able to try to get in here and continue this onslaught. Dude, it is looking like a war zone right now with all these burst bombs being thrown across the map. It's like, you're gonna get chipped to death. Oh, and this is big here again. They have a great look here on this side, but once again, like it was the other way. One more member, this time Wasabifu earlier, it was Kyo, got behind on the truck and took out the Rainmaker Carrier with all the crabs looking forward. Maybe there is one thing crab can't do and that's turn around 180 degrees instantly. That might be the only thing it can't do, but it means they could not tend to their Rainmaker Carrier in time. There were points on the board, checkpoint and then some. So once again, the situational awareness from Comet keeps this game close. They're gonna try to break this checkpoint right now. This give them a hefty lead to be able to go. Unfortunately, they get shot down in its tracks. Gonna fall down at a measly 77 points remaining. And now it's gonna kind of reset back. Now they're kind of playing this a little bit of a tug of war. Melon God picking up that clam, not just yet. Gonna wait, manage to go for the Rainmaker. And now we're gonna see how far away they're gonna be able to shoot this, right? Look at them desperately trying to paint that right side. No one's really going for the left side because of that great. That's gonna be a splat down in terms of Melon God. Now it's gonna be Comet's opportunity to try to get some big moves happening here. But the Rainmaker seeing life going a little bit too far away. How do they survive that? You saw them run away from those missiles, everything about it? Yeah, and this is tricky here. You, they have had this Rainmaker for a long time, and that means that counter is going to be very, very low right now. Kurokuro might not have a choice but to move forward. 30 seconds, a little bit more time than I had suspected here, so there's certainly time to reload the cannons and go for another side. You can see the crabs start to cycling and Kyo going down. All the while, Kurokuro, this would be a terrible spot for the Rainmaker to go down. They pick out Wasabifu coming in and trying to attack it and do get the punishment there on the other side. But Aussie, if this Rainmaker gets stuck on this side, they're gonna just need to grab it and move forward a little bit, and there'll be big points, and with two coming down, that might happen right now. That was a huge gamble to back up that far with the Rainmaker. He was getting a lot of picks with the Rainmaker alone. That is pretty much just a free bomb every single time, but you don't have to worry about your ink. But now, this could be the opportunity for a push. Look at them, they're swimming towards it, almost gets the checkpoint, they dunk it, and that's gonna be the lead for Melon God, breaking the checkpoint, putting himself in a hefty lead here for the rest of this game. Well, actually, not to misspeak, they actually weren't able to do it. They were halfway through the animation, oh. but you can see there on the top, they didn't break through, and that could be huge here. It means, once again, if you get to the checkpoint first, you get the victory if it's a tie. But because they didn't, if a Comet is able to take this and touch the checkpoint, they will actually get the lead. 
mere frames away from potentially securing themselves a lead in case of a tie. Instead, now, this is a dangerous spot. You can see that slosh machine slowly moving up. They're sharking. That's a lot of specials out of the way already. Two of them do go down. The Rainmaker goes down. A perfect defense that time by Melangod. And now, with just 25 seconds left, I would not be stunned if they simply leave it right there. Don't pop it. Make it a little bit pink. Kurokuro putting it there, and it's going to be very difficult for them to get the pop, much less grab this and do anything with it. And that's exactly what they're doing. Look at them. They're not going for the pop, just making it as big as possible, but not quite going for it. Two down on Comet. Things are looking very bleak here for Comet. They need a miracle or something to get this going. Some big splats. That's going to be two down going on Comet. Melagod's going to be able to take that, not even breaking it till the very end. And Melagod's going to take that set three to two through Losers Finals. Going to move on into Grands to face off against the people waiting for them in terms of Starburst. Congratulations to Melagod. Wow. And earlier at the very beginning of this, we told you folks, if there was ever a Rainmaker map where you could take the teeth out of Comet's attack, slow the game down into a tug of war in neutral, identifying when the opponent crab was gonna come out, who you would push forward at the right time, who would get the splats at the right time, and who would take the gambles and the dives when need be to slow down the opposing play. It is rare at this level, folks, that you see a game of Rainmaker 1 with no checkpoints broken, but if you're ever gonna see it at the top level, it would be Mincemeat Metalworks, an incredible counterpick and an incredible set. Congratulations to Melon God and a tip of the cap to Comet, bowing out in third place here. A great performance for them as they continue their streak of incredible placements, both in Japanese tournaments and in North American European play. But we get a rematch, Osti, of our winner's finals. Melon God versus Starburst. A whole host of players who are very, very comfortable and confident against one another. Oh, yeah, definitely. We saw this happen in winner's finals. It was 3-1. to one. Starburst taking that initial lead. And pretty dominating in the last game, especially. Going to come here into grand finals to try it, try it again. Now, Nine, this is not our typical Starburst, is it? No, this is not the typical Starburst here, folks. You have noticed here, they do not have Brand. Brand was unable to compete in this tournament, but there are substitutions and there are super substitutions. And for this tournament, Starburst has brought in Nerishio. And for those of you unfamiliar with this player, well, look back in Splatoon 2's lifespan and look at some of those Kings rosters or the Crazy Boys rosters who have come over and won these tournaments. And you'll see that Nerishio was on quite a few of them. Look at a lot of tournaments that were won in Japan over the course of Splatoon 2's lifespan, and you will see Nerishio on a lot of them. There was probably a time when you couldn't name too many players who were more successful, who won more, and who dominated games more than Nerishio. And Nerishio, at the start of this game, has defiantly moved against the splash matic and Slashing Machine Overlords, instead playing the Splatana Stamper at the highest level, an incredible pilot of that weapon. He makes it look absolutely unbeatable. And to have that here on your side to come up against a comp that you know is going to be running a lot of the meta stuff could be the wrinkle that finally pushes Starburst over the edge. And we talked about this wrinkle, Nine, about this stamper bringing up to the map, completely changing the meta of what we've seen pretty much this whole tournament, right? We've seen nothing but crabs. We made jokes about six crabs and it became true. We became profits for a second. But running Stamper of all things, such an unorthodox weapon in the current state of things, right? Like, yes, you're going to have Stamper. You're going to be able to have the ability to, like, potentially, you know, you know, object shred a little bit on those crabs. Might not be, like, a game changer moment, but you also have that zip caster. It's going to be able to get you into the back lines. You can zip behind the crabs. And you were just speaking earlier how hard it is to turn around 180 degrees. If you get behind them, it can become really tough at that point. It can, and it can be tricky. And again, if you're even able to take off the crab's full fire rate once they get it going there, that can slow down enough for the rest of your teammates to retreat, build their own crabs, and then start winning the crab v crab war in the engagement. It's the subtle stuff. And the other thing is with the Splatana Stamper, right? As soon as people saw that that thing had burst bomb, you know, the neuron started firing and we've seen in the past, okay, in Splatoon 1, we saw Slosher, which had just over 70 damage and a burst bomb. All right, burst combo, that works. And we saw the Grim Range Blaster in Splatoon 2. Did not quite the same level of dominance, but it makes sense. You have a weapon that can do over 70 damage and a burst bomb after that. Usually follows up and can usually clean up in a lot of scramble situations. So people pretty quickly pieced together that Stamper was gonna have a decent look 
in the game once it came out, depending on the damage values. And well, that is absolutely held true. This is a monster of a weapon that is struggling, maybe not struggling so much, but has had to work to find its place in a meta that seems so very established. But folks, if you missed the earlier set, Mauricio had some absolute mind boggling plays and we're gonna see much the same here as well. Now again, it is Melangod on the loser's side here, so they will have to win two sets. You folks probably know the drill by now, and we've seen it a lot. We've seen transpositions of these two teams in grand finals often. Starburst has been on the winner's side, sometimes on the loser's side, sometimes. But we will see if the stamina is there. Splat zones. Hagglefish Market. What a great place to start this off, Osti. Honestly, one of my, one of my, I have so many maps in this game that I just sparks joy, you know, Hagglefish Market, Inkblot Art Academy, uh, Mako Mart, even Mahi Mahi Resort is kind of fun. But like those three, especially like I, the reason these maps are so popular, in my honest opinion, is they feel very level, if that makes any sense. In terms of like, everyone feels like it's pretty neutral and you can run almost any weapon on these weapons and on these maps and still be successful. Lots of room here. Yeah, I mean, it's a nice thing to talk about. I don't think we'll quite see that come to fruition here. It's, no. it's funny for us to be like, yeah, it's a great map. You can play whatever you want on it. And we're going to see probably no fewer than four crabs, maybe even more than that. But Like Stamper. I, yeah, we, we will almost certainly see Stamper here. But to your point, it is a fun map. It's one of the most beloved, not only in this game, but in the series as a whole. Lots of room for flanks. We can finally stop talking about it. Because, folks, Grand Finals game number one is starting off here in Stormbreak. Let's take a look at the comps. Of course, it's going to be Nerecio on the Stamper. On the other side, count them three. splash We got five crabs on the field. And no surprises here at all coming out from Melon God, right? Kyo's going to be on that sloshing machine, which is going to be his try and true. Going to allow him to play a little bit more like a uh, aggressive backliner as well on top of that because he gets so much range. But now we're going to look a little bit here at Norisho and how he walk rocks with his weapon and why he's one of the best stampers in the game. Look how aggressive he's going in. Already throwing out a burst bomb and, and got a swipe right afterwards. That was huge for them. Even though it was a trade, allowed them to be able to try to push in a little bit. But now you're noticing this push coming out from Melon God. Throws a Booyah bomb right on top of him try to save unfortunately not going to be able to happen we got two down on both sides and that is just quite the warfare going on for this first control of the zone yep and again they're going to pay for it dearly they're great fighting and great holding a position that time on starburst it was biscuit who was able to win that and here's the other thing that this thing can do you can see the stamper has great range but you can also put that vertical slash just over the top and it will ride and be the full damaging hold and take a look at this now moving not even necessarily going attack simply knowing that the opponent can't quite pick out the position Moving forward and trying to attack all the while though the distraction is not going to net them much in this side. And actually retreating back to where the other teammate is might actually come back to hurt them for the worst. That's going to be two members going down because of where Norisio retreated to. Got everybody to look at Bagel who might have actually been rather unknown at the time. An unfortunate turn of events on that side. And now we're going to see the defense come out from the crab. You expect that we're going to see at least one crab on the take back here. Kyo in position to take rid of Bagel's crab. Has to retreat all the way back. This should be a nice amount of points so far for Melon God. Already halfway down to zero going for this potential knockout. It is a 3v2 currently. Norisha is going to go into that, uh, gonna be a jump in to try to like counteract with the crab. Work alongside them. Comes back in with the stamper. You see the stamps coming in. All the slashes are kind of just painting the zone right now. Everyone's playing a little bit too safe. But Starburst has to make a move right now, Nine. Yeah, they do, and you can see they're going to use a special and try to push Norisho in. They try to push another one in. Those missiles aren't going to find anybody. I don't know how Melon God picked out where that attack was coming from at the right time. Their only resource left is going to be ice as Biscuit goes down. They're going to jump 2-1, but nowhere close. And Melon God, if you talk about winning dominantly on a neutral, once they got a true lockout scenario, they didn't even become close. Yeah, literally, they held the zone, and they're like, okay, we got the crabs. Let's put up some shop here, right here in the middle. It's going to be really difficult for them to try to, like, even get out of zone there for a second. Once they held it at 100 points, that was a 100-0 knockout. That's going to give them a very strong lead to start off this loser's final set, or grand final set, excuse me. Yeah, and I want to point out as well, the thing that Kyo did partway through was kind of a little microcosm of how you work around Crab. We said earlier that Kyo was moving up to the tent area of Starburst, knowing that that's always where Crabs will come from. 
Well, the slashing machine can hit pretty much every relevant part of that, meaning that if you take too long and are trying to set up your crab with your opponents moving in, as Starburst was trying to do, you're going to wait entirely too long. You're going to take some damage. You're going to have to move back. And once that crab comes off of that tent area and rolls back, I know it's not a lot, but believe me, when you give up that much height, it means that your shots will come a lot, lot shorter. You can't fire onto the other side of the zone. You can't follow up as opponents try to retreat. So even that small difference makes a big, big world when you're playing at this level. And again, Melon God, we wondered if they would find an answer. They have already equaled their win total from the last set, Austin, and done it in emphatic fashion. Yeah, and the thing is, you got to remember that the last set that Starburst and Melon God played, Starburst ended up winning that game number one. I believe it was on Mako Mart, if my memory serves me right. And, you know, kind of like the same type of thing where, like, it's a beloved map that allows you to get some easy, like, ways to kind of get into the back line in, in the middle of the map for the splat zones. But now we're going to change it up a little bit. Go over to some Clam Blitz here on Museum. Clam Blitz on Museum. This was the counter pick that Starburst used to win their last game. And we talked it up and giggled a little bit earlier because of how the game went between these two teams last time where... Melon God had a little score. Starburst, you know, it seemed like they were a little bit on the back foot there. Some pushing and pulling in the middle of the map. But once Starburst got in, their survivability and their way of simply keeping one person left, switching ice over to that splash o matic of the Flings of Roller meant that there was a real opportunity for them to, again, survive. We talk so much about survivability, but on this map, the aggressor is in such a good position to continue the long range scoring, especially here on Clan Blitz. And if I was in Starburst shoes, I wouldn't be sweating too much because that was just the first game of your two sets that you could potentially play, right? So even if Melon God wins these next two maps and takes this set win, they then have to play another set right afterwards. So it's like Starburst can have time to experiment a little bit if they so choose. If they want to go for like, okay, what happens if we pick this map and this game? Okay, what happens if we do this and kind of see how they react with their comps and everything. So let's now let's jump into the next game. We got splash o -Matic. We got the same exact comps. Oh, Dark Tetris. Whoa, Hold on. whoa. Here's you your... this. Yes, yes. So this is something that Clix has used in various versions of these Kings rosters here. Clix, of course, a very talented player, can play a lot of different things. So if they were going to experiment or try something out, these Tetra Duelies are the way to go through. We have seen Tetra Duelies find success regardless of how many splashes the opponent has because it can do what we said earlier, which is disrupt and break these formations of Crab before they get started. All the while, though, another weapon that can do that pretty well, the Stamper of Nerishio going in and creating a ton of space, a flank coming from behind, and of course it is going to be Click. So uh, once again, Starburst, regardless of what Melon God's throwing at them, seems to have a decent footing right now. Going to move forward here, not able to score. It seems that Melon God's so far up to the task. Yeah, they gotta just stop them in their tracks. Gonna try to bring this back a little bit. Starburst is still, there's a potential opportunity here for a score, and they're actually gonna go for it. Biscuits gets in there, scores a power clam. Unfortunately, none of their teams there, so not gonna get too much out of it, but at least they bring up a potential lead for them as Mount God's gonna clean up shop here with all of the blue paint. And you gotta remember that Clix actually brought out da Dark Tetra Duelies before in the, against Starburst earlier on in Winner's Finals. So this is, we're no strangers to seeing him go for this weapon, right? So actually seeing them bring out, try to get some work done hasn't gotten too much value out of it just yet we just gotta wait and see what they're gonna be able to bring out here already picking up the pity clam yeah maybe opting to go for it here it could be by accident who knows for swimming backwards you accidentally touch it here but it's gonna give away a position here and maybe that was also part of the point is to try to get people to fire towards shelton so that they can move through and this is where clicks has a real opportunity to make a big play happen picking tetra Duelies is usually a good option against these splash matics in a lot of neutral scenarios where both sides have all their resources available. The Tetris is gonna be A-OK, -okay, can move around and outrange this weapon. And because it has quick respawn, you are totally fine going down and getting punished for a result. Slide away here, take more fire this way, move my crab up. This is the recipe, but can they follow up on it? They've created a pretty good situation for themselves if they can outlast these final two crabs. Clix is going for a very high ground right now, trying to get the jump on them, manages to do so. You gotta get a lot of paint here on blue, but tons of burst bombs just coming out, like almost as like an emergency, like please paint it orange. It's not gonna be able to stop that. That's gonna be Melon God going in for a push, taking the lead on top of that, putting in a lot of clams here, 62 to 80. And it looks like Starburst is gonna stop it immediately and try to turn this into a lead for them with their pity glam starting to spawn. 
Yep, they paid heavily for it, and Clicks jumped in. You saw very wisely Starburst knowing they couldn't move that far forward. They had to get rid of Clix's jump here. You do not want to Tetra behind you as you are trying to set up your crab loops. And this is what we saw earlier, right? Well, actually, no, it isn't because the score didn't happen that early last time. Now the dynamic has changed here. There's a box on the left side that Bagel's going to move forward, and you can score straight from that box. You don't even have to get up into the danger zone. Moving up at the right time, doing just enough to get the lead. Ice is going to get taken down. Or, I'm sorry, no, it's not. It's going to score, actually. I thought I saw him spawn. I guess it was another. Now, Norishio dies, and it takes out two with one slash. And hold on. They might be able to jump more in. Did they grab it in time? They did not. Aussie, for a second, I thought they were going to jump their pity clam in. If Norishio survived just a little bit longer, this score might still be going on. I was already re ready to say, okay, that's going to be the end of that push. But you saw Norishio just kind of soloing all of Melon God there for a second because with the Zipcaster just being very tricky to be able to hit as well as just being yourself a wide open spot for your teammates to be able to jump to. Gets another one on top of that. That's going to be a wipeout. Starburst, you're insane. Two power clamps, tons of orange. You can easily just swim back in. They're going to play a little bit more safe because you got to remember, they do have the lead. They don't need to. They are they got economy. They got they got clam economy. So look at they're pushing back. They don't need to go in. They don't. No, they're instead going to opt to spec. They know that Norishio moving in is the real advantage that this attacker has. And it looks like Norishio is back in at that high ground. Will be able to move in. They instead opt to go back out again. Like you said, Hosti, they know where the threat is. They know what they don't need to do. A crab is going to come on the other side. They're trying to lure each other into the other crab now. Another jump out here. They're happy to keep this power claim and give up a little bit of mid as long as it means they defend. But what they didn't count on is Shelton is already up in an attacking position. And this is where they get scary. They're going to try to shuffle it around. Maybe a little misgrab there. Shelton was clearly going back to grab a couple of those. And instead, they got picked up on the other side. Now, Kyo has to come back, is able to pick out the flanker where they were coming from. But how is Shelton going to get in? That created a lot of space. Where is he going to go? Clix is not able to sneak through. This push is already over. Slight miscues there. But at least they were able to save their power clamp. It means that they're going to have another opportunity to bring this one back. Yeah, Clix going down could potentially spill out that game. But you got to remember, even if they manage to break that basket and get a point in, there's so many power claims made in terms of Starburst that are eating up so many of them. So how many... How are you going to be able to get enough clams to be able to get enough points afterwards? Is this big difference, right? You got 50 points you got to climb in order to try to tie this up. But now we're going to enter into overtime. Last potential push. 2-1 down going from both sides. Big trade. Three people left. You see Starburst playing incredibly safe. Going to go for that crab. Going to spawn the thing. Here comes a Reef Sliders. A desperate move for Clicks to try to get back in there. Still surviving oh. using the rolls to be able to stay alive. You see the push coming in. Ops to go for the clam. They break the berry in the process. There's 4-2. to two. This could be the opportunity that Melgod has been looking for. Unfortunately, Clicks is going to go down. Now this is going to be the last one here with the crab. Managed to finally get that Shelton. smack. And they do it. They do it. They got back in. Shelton survived that entire time. Kuroko needs to toss these in. They need to get more in. They almost had enough clams to go through. It's going to be a wipeout. And Starburst, despite everything, despite the unbelievable soloing there that Shelton had, is able to hold on. There were enough clams there, held by Melon God in a dangerous position to win that game. That was so close to going the other way, but Starburst on their counter pick can take a deep breath a much more hotly contested game on that map and mode than in the previous set. But once again, the same result. Starburst evening the setup at 1-1. Bro, I need to take a deep breath after that set. That was what an incredible push there at the very end. You saw Melon God was not out of like, they were not out of like energy yet. They got into the back line. They started scoring clams. They were staying alive. That was like, I think the most important part is that they were staying alive, allowing teammates to be able to jump to them later on, not throwing in needlessly to get those lives away and scoring the little clams bit by bit, taking a pity clam, jumping in, scoring it. It's like they actually brought that almost, they got one more power clam in, that could have been the game. Whew. Well, as you said, a deep breath and piecing things back together here. As we wait for whatever the counter pick is going to be here from Melon God, we can inform the good folks at home that we have a prize pool update, $1,824.80 as we crawl ever closer to that $2,000 point total. Thank you once again, everybody, for just, again, not only watching, but being generous with your donations as well, rewarding these players for a hard-fought tournament. Uh, it appears that we are being told on high, or at the very least being text chatted at on high. Uh, TC Inkblot, is, is that the pick, or is that simply Toasty lamenting that it's almost always TC Inkblot? We'll have to put... Oh, that is the pick. Okay. Well, if it was just a lamentation, I would have also completely understood here, because it's true. 
It almost always is Tower Control Inkblot Art Academy. And uh, last time we saw this map and mode come up, the last time they played, we saw Kyo switch over to the Range Blaster. Now, if that was all in good fun, if it was a legitimate look, or if they're going to switch back, it remains to be seen. But again, we've seen some changes come out from these teams, some subtle differences that make a big, big difference over the course of the play. But we'll wait, of course, here a moment to see what the teams are opting to bring. I mean, Range Blaster alone, if he manages to bring that out, is such a good pick on tower control in general just because of that little middle tower, right? If you shoot at it, there's nowhere to hide. You're going to get caught. You have to jump off just because of that wide blast radius that goes behind walls and stuff, right? On top of that, you're also going to have Wave Breaker at your disposal. Being able to throw that out, throw out some sensor points so that you know where your, team, your opponents are going to be, that's also going to be extremely helpful while you're trying to push that tower forward. So I could see why we see a little bit of a swap from that. <sighs> Take a moment here, folks. <laughs> These teams are putting everything on the Let's line against it. one another. Take a look. This is going to be the comp we'll see for the rest of time unless we see some missiles come out. And it is going to be the double slashing machine. The range blaster will remain on the shelf for the time being. But we saw this work quite well. I love it when Shelton breaks this weapon out. One of the best at it. And, of course, Kyo not going to switch often unless given a darn good reason. Take a look here at the start. They've already moved two over to the other side and Shelton dove straight forward. And I have to wonder if that opportunity was created again because Vagel was committed to the crab tank, could not tend to that threat that was going just below the lip. Now this attack is coming in. There's a Booyah Bomb. That's going to go up there into the bats area to make sure that there's no crabs coming from that side. And hold on a minute. This is moving quickly, so quickly. That's another hit. Already has to retreat back. Another two down and a third out of the play. Usually this second checkpoint is the big contested spot. I don't know if it's going to be contested at all. Melon God looking extremely godlike as they break through that second checkpoint, going towards the third one. Look at this. Starbers can't get out of their home base. Samper's already down. It's going to be 4v3. They're going to continue this tower push. Going for yet another Booyah Bomb on top of that as we're now on the third checkpoint. Five seconds away from being able to break that. Has a crab on top of that. Two seconds. He can get back on there. Be able to break it one last time. He's desperately trying to break it. They managed to break it. 12 points remaining. Now they can back off if they so choose. 12 points, an unbelievable opening look here. Shelton is still up there trying to make Manic happen and has already, is able to get two members. Can he get the third? Can he find ice? Everyone fighting in that direction. Shelton gets three of them down. This push is not yet done. An unbelievable play from Shelton. Now Keo coming out here with the Booyah Bomb. Gonna throw it out there. Unfortunately, gets caught in the aftermath. Got a crab coming out. That's exactly the backline that we're talking about. Forcing you out of the crab. Can't makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable because you constantly have to turn. And now this could be Starburst's opportunity to get something going. Oof. <laughs> Again, when you go three down in that situation and one player has single-handedly wrecked your entire team, it is so easy to overextend, get into a bad spot, Ooh. and give the opponent the outright victory instead. Starburst not doing that, coming back in, comfortably defending against Crabs up in their bats area means that they're going to earn the opportunity to get back to mid and start things up. Again, you can see that they're all right next to each other for the time being, though. Once again, herded together means that if Shelton comes behind him and at the top of the screen, you can actually see Shelton moving in, could break open this game. Keep an eye on the top of the screen here. Shelton did go down. They attended to that issue before it could become a true thorn in their side. But it doesn't look like through all of it they were able to get a sustained hold in mid. And yep, look at that. It's just one left stuck in crab and the push going the other way. Melon God not yet done. Starburst just all that work for three points looking very strong right now in favor of Melon God. Now they're pushing this tower. They already got one down, stopping out that stamper. I feel like Nuratio has yet to really do anything meaningful in this game or has not ha been given the opportunity to do such a thing. No, and this is because it's such an open map. It's very difficult for you to get in position. And we said everything about the range that weapon plays at being strong against Slashing Machine, or excuse me, splash matic Well, Slashing Machine plays at a similar range. Shelton is up at their spawn circle. I'm sorry. How did you get up there? Yeah, game four. Let's go. Come on. Game four situation. Melon got up two to one. You saw Shelton all the way in the back. Look at this map. Look at the green on the left side. It's so, so green over there. there? Spawn where? God! Like, I, I can't tell you who was green. Which one was home base? I mean, you talk about the big time players coming out to play. In that previous set, Nerecio made play after play and was stunning. There are people who say Shelton might be the best player of this game on the planet. And in these last two games, you can start to piece together why. I don't mean to aggrandize this guy anymore than his tournament record would already do. But unbelievable plays. Opening the game up. 
at every point, beginning, middle, and end, the story was always Shelton, right? Moving below the crab to take out two members at the start of that game. Then, once the game goes on and it seems like they've stopped your big push, getting three people down to make sure you have a foothold in mid, and then at the end, pushing all the way up, taking out people as they're spawning, fighting through spawn armor, and coming back for the victory lap. An unbelievable individual effort that time. So now, things are gonna wind down a little bit here. As we jump into game four, if Melanga takes one more game, they're gonna reset the bracket and they're gonna be on fire. They might be ca carrying this energy from losers finals, right? They got a lot of set wins to get themselves to this position to be able to counteract Starburst. Starburst, no, no strangers to this team, right? We see a lot of people come up and they know this team for winning a lot of NA tournaments and kind of dominating the NAC, but now you're facing off against a Japanese team here today on this tournament at storm break and now we're going over to the fourth game mode nine what is it oh my god of course it's rainmaker here we cycle through them all at museum dalfonsino so now you start to understand all right well you know starburst coming to museum might not just be a matter of liking it on certain modes here they just want to keep coming back to the map that very first checkpoint you can touch pretty much from the spinner if you are able to do so and acosta jump right up to it that second and um, so important pedestal to get the knockout, though, not so easy to do. We see a lot of games come into that weird middle gunky zone of somewhere beneath, between 15 and 30 and somewhere in there, both sides diving forward relentlessly to try to get the points where they can. You're going to see a lot of strong defense coming out on the left and right sides of people's spawns. And keep an eye on how these teams try to attack it. If there was ever a map for Nerisho to make a case, this would be it. But it looks like we might be swapping off of it here. I'm not entirely sure. Maybe Man, it was missed. Was on a roll there. I was on a roll. Can't pick okay. the team now. Repeat. Okay. So the teams are discussing through it here, making sure that this is indeed a legal pick. So, uh, woof. Rewind. Take that. Rewind it back. As yeah. It take that, DJ. You know. Uh, you. Man, I was so engaged. What you were saying too. <laughs> I thought I had something there. I was cooking. You did, and it just fell all over the floor like all the spaghetti. Uh, well. It happens to the best of us, man. I've, 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 I'm not like you, Ostia. I've never worked in the service, never worked in the food service, so I cannot claim to be a cook, nor can I claim to be a server, a maitre d', a hostess, or anything in that spot. So I should have left that portion of the game to you. It's okay, man. You can still serve those words. We're going to figure out what we're going to do here for game number four. It looks like they're asking to repeat the stage or they can't pick it because of a repeat stage. But while they figure that out, guys, I do want to add in. We are so, so close to the $2,000 goal. Literally less than $200. If we manage to get, let, I think it's 100 and quick maths, $176.20. If we can get that much, we hit the Fable 2K. And if Melon got anything to say about that win this next game. We'll have plenty of time to reach up there. And I will note, we have not had many tournaments hit that 2K mark. This is still an incredible number for us to hit. So, okay, we can finally do it. Rainmaker on Undertow Spillway. So, oh my goodness, this is a fun one here. A lot of the angst that is put forward about Undertow Spillway is about its Splat Zones variant. And in fairness, I don't like it either. Y'all can have that one. But what I would argue mean? that once Tower Control and Rainmaker show up, you really start to see the fun portion of this map design. There are so many avenues to attack the opponent on, so many flat areas where if you get the right player up there with a crab, you can really make it difficult for the opponent to defend on. But this is somewhat counteracted by the safer path of the Rainmaker being on the left, being longer, safer and I think it's so nice when you have something that nice push and pull you'll oftentimes see teams go on that left side to try to get the longer sustained pushes but oftentimes you'll also see them go to the right side simply to pop the pedestal and then try to bring it up the left side later on for the bigger point totals the multiple pathways is what makes the game enjoyable to watch in my opinion whether they're going to go for the riskier option or the safer longer option like you said especially when they add like grades onto the maps but regardless we're going to jump here into game number four probably not going to be seeing any swaps from anyone and that's exactly what we're going to be seeing for the rest of this game <laughs> here we go <laughs> Congrats, folks we i mean we're trying our darndest out here you know we are but this will be another test. Again, we saw it in that first Rainmaker game, or I guess the second Rainmaker game once we went over to Mincemeat. Melon God can control the pace of a game when it's in this push-pull in middle, where both sides are trading crabs, not going down more than one or two. They understand how to defend on that side, so they have to feel confident here. On the other side, though, if you are Starburst, you understand that you have a 
a, an element here of the dish that you are cooking that is different, and that is Norishio. There are so many avenues here for Zipcaster to get up and attack the normal defensive spots that other weapons simply can't challenge. Now we got Zipcaster here ready to go. It's all about when they're going to make go for that initial push, right? Because that's going to be the sender to be able to, okay, here we go. Throw it out there. Here's a Booyah Bomb. Force him to retreat. Opts to go for the Zipcaster. Tries to get behind them. Gets a splat. Goes for another one. This is going to be really huge. That's going to be three down in favor of Starburst. Things are working out really well. If they don't get this checkpoint broken, the paint's already pa painted for them. The pathway's already there. They're going to jump in there, slam dunk it, and break that first checkpoint. And I know Norisho didn't get any of those splats outright, but make no mistake, the havoc that was called there is what broke through after they waited out those two specials. Now this is where it gets dangerous. One crab is already down and Kyo is already down as well. So now if they're smart and if they wait, they could actually get the knockout here. Moving forward ever so slightly, Bagel ducking and dodging to 19. That's an incredible push on this map. It is not nearly as easy as Starburst made it look there. I would not be stunned if this is enough for them to win this game. Honestly, that push right there, knowing that they were going to die before they could even get to the enemy base, was purely a way for them to just get that significant lead for them, right? 19 points remaining. They have three minutes to be able to bring it back, but right now, they're just kind of trading like crazy. Yep, and again, because of how quickly they got a respawn there when two or three of them went down, they were able to jump back in mid and control mid as well. That's the big deal when, again, if you have one person go down and your Rainmaker carrier is still up, Sometimes it's okay for the Rainmaker carry to move forward and everyone else to drop back. It means you'll maintain a more favorable board and you can get things set up for the broader portion of the game. Take a look now. Norisho was moving behind and was able to find that Rainmaker. They were trying to set something up with the old seen threat, unseen threat. Kyo was moved up with click sharking, but Norisho getting behind them puts a wrench in that machine before it can even get humming. And once again, Starburst going to have the opportunity to make a push. The Crab, this is the spot we told you about, folks, can absolutely make defense a nightmare. And they had all three specials ready to go. Going to pop two of them, waiting on that Zip Caster before offering to go for it. Here it comes. This could be the opportunity to do it, right? Trying to get these splats. Need to get the, That's a killer one right there. Looking for a second one opportunity. Unfortunately, it's going to wear off in time for them to be able to push that even further out. But that was such a good push coming out from servers, and they're still holding on to that Rainmaker. Yeah, an incredible play there by Kyo to survive this long. Kyo might be saving the game for them here. Got the Booyah Bomb off just in time to slow the push forward and then survived that entire attack and then went forward to make sure that it couldn't go through here. That doesn't mean that the game is yet over. It simply means that it might not end in the next 10 seconds, which is what it was looking like for the time being. Yeah, two minutes left to go. Melon God still has plenty of opportunities to bring this back, right? Yes, they do have to break the checkpoint, but even beyond that, that's there's still plenty of time. For them to be able to break that and continue the push. But now that Rainmaker, looks like they're going to let that uh, despawn to be able to go back towards center stage. That's exactly what they're going to do, is they're going to come back, back into the fight. Yep, and look at this. A crab goes up on top there with Shelton. Norisio immediately there to take it out. Bagel's going to jump out. Not able to. Okay, Huge. that could be big. That means that that crab's going to take a little bit longer to come out here. Clix is going to grab it. They sense that there's a short period here where they might be able to get this first checkpoint. Moving forward and attacking. Shelton needs to get up there as well and does move over to the grading here. This crab is in a great spot, but of course the counter crab is going to slow it down as well. Wonderfully timed there by Ice having it, but getting through that checkpoint is a little victory for here or for Melon God here. Ice going to play the Rainmaker off the side, so they're going to lose mid. They're going to get another opportunity to make a push, but another solid defense by Starburst. This is why we said that 19 was such a great opening look. You can saw how much they had to sacrifice simply to get to 60. And now we're seeing a repeat of that last push going the exact same way. This time, no checkpoint impeding their approach, right? It's all about what they're going to be able to do. Surrounded by yellow ink, there was no way for them to get out of there. They were just completely yellow. That's going to be able to stop it in its tracks. Melon God on the opportunity to, be able to try to challenge that big opening. Unfortunately, it gets called out by the slosh. This is going to be huge for Biscuit. Yep, and uh, you saw right there, there was this horrible moment where they weren't sure if they wanted to pop their crab at that time or wait for it later, wait for the teammates to spawn in. And Ice, I want to say it was Ice, broke through that entire opportunity by moving the crab around on that grating. Once again, having the crab on the defensive side and to put it there of all places, knowing that your back is exposed, but knowing that it's okay because of where the opponent is, they are going to successfully get the Rainmaker off the side, which means it'll go all the way back to the middle instead of being up there at the top. They are going to get an opportunity to pop it, though, because Starburst was the last one to hold on. They're going to need a miracle here, Osti. And, and it's, not <laughs> it's not coming whatsoever, man. The second they pick that up, there was a burst bomb already coming their way, chipping them down bit by bit. Folks, we got a game five. Uh, and of course we do between these two teams. What else could we expect? 
Starburst, Melon God, these players, all eight of them, very familiar with what the others are bringing to the table. We talked them up here earlier, but even between simply a North America versus Japan, a lot of these players have played on different Kings rosters. This is not one of the normal Kings rosters being on their side, but three of these players come to a lot of our North American tournaments. And of course, playing against Starburst in grand finals is kind of a foregone conclusion when that happens. And of course, on Starburst's side, they have Norishio, who has done the same song and dance. And of course, we don't need to talk anymore about how familiar Kyo and the members of Starburst are. Uh, they, they've even played on the same team once. So to say that these are eight players who know what the others are bringing to the table, it only makes sense that we would go to a game five here in our first set. And I'm starting to see a pattern here, Nine, if you look at this. It looks like whoever's counterpicking is the team that ends up winning that map. So if history repeats itself, Melon God should win this game five, right? Well, we'll have to see. This would certainly be the time to break serve, as it were. Um, folks, this might be it. This might be the end of this wonderful tournament. Stormbreak put on by Mulloway IT. So again, just one last ping here for the donation side. Still at $1,824.80. <laughs> hey, listen, I wondered in the back of my head. It worked the... Hey, it worked the last time you had to win when you had a game five and it was on your counter pick. Why not go to it a second time? Oh boy, folks. Uh... <laughs> if you're going to pull it out in grand finals game five, you know, more power to you because you still have to win the game and then win a set right after that. So you know what? If you're going to pull out this like random card, you, you, you got to do it now. Uh, I don't know what number is going to be higher, Osti. The number of crabs that we are seeing or the number of people who are getting ready to print screen and try to harvest some Twitter clout by all being mad at the same thing we all are. Folks! Game five of set number one here. Count them up. We only have two because thankfully Norishio is staying true. But on what the other savior. side, we knew what comp this would be. Five crabs. Or sorry. Yeah, five crabs for game five. It's a little poetic, I would say. Yeah, honestly, it is. Like, I, I felt like a little bit of Shakespeare came out of you. <laughs> okay, let's jump into this, shall we? Taking a look here on the left side. We know that this is the part of the map that teams will try to control early on. And... Sometimes in that last game, Osti, when we did see a team start to lose control, it was when they got a little overzealous, usually jumping off of this truck to try to make a play on somebody on the opponent's flat. I don't suspect that either of these teams are going to go through it unless they feel like they've got some great backup. Yeah, and if we saw this in the previous set, right? Oh, no, that's going to be a huge pick for Melon God. going to take down Norishio. That's going to be their opportunity to go for this push. It's looking really pink there on the right side. Booyah Bomb coming in to kind of force them out. Interesting opportunity to be able to push that right. Throw exactly where they are instead of trying to impede their path. Going to stop them in their oh. tracks down on the mid side. Big damage coming up. Big damage already, and Shelton was able to take two members out there. Kyo backed up really far there. I guess they thought that the push was maybe done before Shelton got that pick. There was actually probably a little bit of an opportunity for Kyo to grab that and maybe even get it. It's, of course, impossible to know all these little intricate details when you don't have the overhead view that we do, but Shelton, once again, making the presence known and making the argument that he's been the player of the tournament thus far. Now, look at him on the other side. It's going to be Starburst that's moving forward and attacking, leading with Norishio. How are neither of these players dead? Finally! <laughs> Kyo is going to go down there. Biscuit already forward there. There is a crab in position, and it's going to last just long enough. Kuro Kuro is going to go down. Stopped it, but that gave enough time for another crab to come through. Biscuit going to opt to jump out. There's nothing more to be done in this push. Another successful defense by Melon God in that scenario, and it's looking like a repeat of the first game thus far, Osti. Yeah, I mean, so again, no one's breaking that checkpoint. On Mincemeat, it is like nigh impossible to break that first checkpoint unless you get a wipeout. Like, I feel like it's just there's just too many angles to be able to get shot on that right path. Everyone always goes for the right path because there's so many grates in the way. That Booyah Bomb's going to be able to shut down that Rainmaker by itself. You're going for that solo YOLO. Uh, Booyah Bomb is going to be able to shoot up that Rainmaker yet again. Got some more action come up here. Zipcaster is online and ready. It's all about when the opportunity is going to be able to present itself. Then there it is. Going to be able to zip, zap, zoom all over the place. Trying to be a very tricky target, which is, I think, something Nerisha is really good at being able to do, right? Not getting caught. No, not getting caught and surviving long enough to make sure that the other members of the team could get up into good positions. Norisho is still there and a threat, but the crab actually got all the way on the other side, and suddenly this is a legitimate opportunity here. They're going to move forward and attack. They have enough people, and Biscuit was not able to get over in time. There will be a break of the checkpoint, and now the entire dynamic of the game has changed. 
This is big. They are going to be able to take out one of the threats. They get rid of Shelton, but it gave enough time for the other members to move up. They are going to sit around it. They're going to puppy guard this for their life. Clix is at top, and they're still in attack forward. Kyo is going to win that 1v1. Could be big. Can Narishio stall it long enough? Narishio grabs it. An incredible play at that spot. The only correct play that was left available, meaning that they're going to have to take a little bit longer to grab it, and this could really slow down what was a push. They barely got any more points out of it. I cannot believe that Nereisho had the ability to get in there and pick it up last second to just prevent Melangon from picking up and getting those additional points. But now that they did, this could be really tricky for Starburst to bring this back. Yep, they are still going to have to work through that checkpoint and then get a couple points on top of that. We've seen that that is no small feat on the other side. That's going to be a splash trading off with a machine here. Double Crab firing in this direction. They are going to solo YOLO, as you called it here, right over to it, and they will break it. They're still going to need more points, and they're going to need to pop on top of it, but they've got enough members up here in mid that they're going to have a legitimate opportunity if they get rid of one of these crabs. One of the crabs is going to drop down. That's Kuro Kuro. They're going to try to pop it here and let it reset onto the other side. Is anyone going to try to dive in and make the hero play? This is a lot of specials being used to stop just that. They're actually going to grab it and try to take it back. They don't want to be passive with it. Kuro Kuro going to move it over on this side. And we actually saw this in the last game. Maybe they're hoping that they can defend it from this spot. If so, it would be a daring, daring play to make. And the thing is... You've got the Zipcaster ready to rock. Here comes the big play. Unfortunately, oh, can't get to it. Gets one pick off of it. Going for the trade instead. It's going to stop the crab in its tracks. are going to be able to pick up that Rainmaker. It's 3v2. Look, that's going to get jumped on. Trying to survive. Ice holding on to it for dear life. Finds an opportunity. Cannot find the way to get past that ink. And unfortunately, could not take that lead. Oh, and that's another one going down. It took too long. They got another crab. The jump in is going to try to make a play. And you get the sense that with that jump, Starburst knew that that was their one opportunity. Mere seconds away from getting the lead. You can see where it's at. Shelton's going to grab it. 20 seconds. They're going to try to jump back and camp it here. For those of you maybe unfamiliar with the mechanic, the Rainmaker timer does tick down much, much faster if you're in a Rainmaker free zone or retreating. So he's going to opt to move it up to try to melt a little bit of time off it. Right now, that's the only thing that could get this Rainmaker away from Shelton. Actually, no. Narishio is going to try to dive in and is going to force an overtime. I don't think anything's going to come from it, and it won't. We are moving on to our second set between these two teams as Melangod once again wins on their counterpit, Rainmaker on Mincemeat Metalworks. I cannot believe Noratio's ability to recognize the situation and just go with the correct decision, right? Like, yes, you're going to lose, but you're still going to go for it anyways because what happens? What if, you know? Picking it up at the very last second to force an overtime, picking it up at, at, earlier on when they first originally broke the checkpoint to prevent it, pre pre prevent the other team from picking it up to get those additional points because if that either of those plays worked, that would have put Starburst in the running to try to make a comeback, but unfortunately, they just could not find that answer. Bracket reset. Game five for the first set. Are we going to see a game five for the second set? A potential game 10? Well, if we do, I would wager. And if the counter picks pick out right, I would, uh, I would wager I know what it's going to be. But folks, take a deep breath here. Take a stretch. We are hitting the reset button and moving on to another best of five between these two Titans. The first set won by Starburst 3-1. The second set being won by Melon God 3-2. And we're going to start... And the all-important game number one, as Asti pointed out last time, the teams all won on their counter picks. It might not be an exaggeration to say that whoever wins this game will win the set. And of course, it's on my own personal purgatory. Oh my god, I hate this map, Asti. Nine, I have a question. Did you uh, watch the Friday tournament at all? The Proving Grounds? Of course. You saw the the set that had four Surgeon Shipyards? I bleached it from my mind. Oh, word, I'll remind it for you. But yeah, the thing is, we had four Surgeon Shipyards that entire set, and now it's going to be the final set game opener here for the bracket reset. We have yet to see this map since we've been on the mic, man, and now this is the opportunity for Nine's favorite stage to, you know, rise and shine. Well, and one of the reasons why I think maybe even more so than on Splatoon 2, it's so difficult to play this map on Splatoon 3 is... You can probably guess it's it's four letters. It starts with C, ends with Rab, and is a special on the splash matic You can hit so much of where the opponent is trying to spawn from relative safety. And 
Expect no different if these two teams are able to get in. The big question will come up, though. What are these backliners going to play? There's not going to be missiles coming out from ice. Will Shelton opt for missiles? No. Neither side opting for missiles. Missiles are too slow right now, folks. You wanted missiles to get power crept. Well, here's your monkey's paw curling. Dude, seriously, that, that is, if there's a monkey's paw that I've ever seen, it's this, right? Okay, fine. No more missiles. Bet have crab battle. Oh my goodness, and look at this again right off the get-go. It's an immediate attack. Shelton and Kyo moving forward fearless right now. Will get punished by Norishio, but they're fine with that because it means that they're going to have a decent look early on. They're certainly going to get their jumps in this time. This crab battle is going to make a big, big mark on the rest of this game. If they aren't able to find anybody, this could be a knockout. I don't mean to exaggerate. They are able to get one member down, and that should give them some stability to work with. If that crab fight had gone the other way, there were not many resources for Starburst. Instead, they win it, they crash in, and now it's their opportunity for a real nasty lockout once they close the deal. Oh my god, three splats in a row, a triple, and they still don't have control of the zone! I may have spoke too soon, finally. Okay, there's nobody left on the map. Thank you, thank you. It was. It had to have been killed or somebody else at the top of the map there that was painting it and working through with stealth jump and the way that these players move. It's so tricky to know where the last one is coming in from, but keep an eye on that timer, folks. That's a lot of points that they maybe shouldn't have gotten. Now Shelton's gonna move up to make sure that crab can't find anything and it's actually gonna use a Booyah Bomb at the zone as well. They aren't gonna be able to take it off, but they have a decent foothold here. Clicks moving up as well. They're gonna jump somebody over here and make sure to protect that jump. Norisio crashing through to try to punish it as well. And again, these teams cannot seem to get the zone flips we're so accustomed to seeing at this level. Yeah, it's just not happening. Starburst holding on for dear life with this zone almost this close to being able to take that lead and add some penalty points. It's going to hold on for just one more second, and they do take the lead and continue to add on some 3v3 happening right now. Managed to finally lose control. Here comes a Booyah Bomb. Probably going to be able to solidify that. Turns it into a 4v2. Melangod has the lead. They're going to take over that zone and flip it with a little bit of penalty points. And now this is the important part. During that entire piece of it, you saw that Melon God was able to poke and prod with one more member left in mid to make sure more points didn't come off and a true lockout scenario wasn't achieved. This time, on the other hand, though, I think that Melon God was actually able to do a better job of establishing a true defense, which means that if they can get rid of Norisio here, they should have the opportunity to aim their crabs the way they want. They're not able to. They weren't able to clear him out quickly enough. And even though only one member went down, they lose the zone. Huge penalty points coming back the other way. They're going to have to try again they have enough members on the map to make this a true punishment but once again a wipeout as we go through what does starburst have i mean they're gonna try to get out of the zone because look how far they're pushing up forward right no one's even near to the back line got tons of opportunities here ice is gonna go off of the right side to try to potentially go for a flank gets seen by the crab has to back up in the process gonna go for a circle around on your issue just kind of got hide still for a bit try to build up a little bit of meter they're gonna lose the lead melon god holding on to this defense for dear life opting to pop a crab of their own avoids the booyah bomb and now we're gonna see how they're gonna be able to paint this orange as possible because melon god is holding on so hard here comes a zip cast and ratio trying to get something going against that crab tries to get clicks cannot find its Mark gets called out in the process, and that might have been their only chance to be able to take it back to this zone. Hold on a second. Ice. Ice so clutch, they're working in from behind. The other members had collapsed on top, and Ice is going to do it single-handedly, keeping them in the game. One of 1v1 stayed alive and gave Norisio enough time to jump in and get a follow-up, just enough to put a penalty on. I need to stress that it is still not looking good for Starburst, but the game was done if Ice didn't win that 1v1. A trade would not have been enough. A huge, huge play there from Ice as these players continue to fight it out. It may not be looking good, but at least you're still in the fight, but I might have just spoken too soon. That's already down three down on Starburst's side. Melon God pushing them back into their zone. They can't get out. This might be a wrap. This might be Melon God taking away game number one here on Sturgeon Shipyard. Oh, just a few more seconds tipping away, and Ice no nowhere way. near the zone right now. There's nothing to be done, and Ice with the incredible individual effort to keep that in the game, but... You know, to bring out some old logic here, if your player has to make the play of a lifetime simply to put penalty points on the opponent, it means that you're probably being outpaced in most aspects. So once again, game one, the all-important game one that determines the back and forth of these counter picks, going in favor of Melon God. And here we go. It seems to be the same story thus far. Will it have a different ending? We'll have to wait and see. It's all about winning on the game that's not your counter pick. The thing is, winning game one is so important purely because you get counter pick advantage. Just having that one additional stage to be able to counter pick on top of that, because you both get to pick two stages now, but if you both win two, the one that won the first game wins. So, like, that's why the first game is so important when it becomes a counter pick war like this. <sighs> 
Taking another breath, folks. Taking another, another breath. And for Starburst here, I know it's not their traditional roster. They pulled in Nerecio, but it has to be in your head right now. Is this really going to happen again? Are we really going to be sitting in winner's finals of one of these tournaments and an opposing team primarily composed of the Japanese superstars are we really going to lose this again? They have to stay composed, especially after how that game number one looked. We have a pretty good idea of what one of their counter picks is going to be. They've won on it both times against Melon God. That will be Clam Blitz on Museum D'Alfonsino. Not saying that it's been picked. I'm simply putting my money on it being picked. But what else do they have in their back pocket? What stage could they potentially take back from Melon God? lot left to be decided and they're taking a little moment to decide it here Austin. and i genuinely think that it's going to be less about what they end up deciding because i think they're just going to win on the counter pick it's more about how they're going to be able to react to melon god's counter pick can they win on melon god's counter pick that's the only way they're going to be able to take the set that's the only that's their only path forward Boom. Folks, this may be one of the last times I get to say it, but uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us here at Stormbreak thus far. A lot of action left to be had put on by Molaway IT. Thank you so much to the entire team who's been behind this, putting on a great show and giving these players a stage, a platform to showcase their stuff and the highest level of our game. Our prize pool still currently at $1,824.80. And we have been informed. Surprise, surprise, folks. Clam Blitz on Museum D'Alfonsino. We knew it was coming. We just didn't know when it was coming, but here we are. It's a game two or game four. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, we already made a pathway here. Clam Blitz coming out on Museum. This is when Starburst is like literally their love letter to this game. They play on this map. It's almost a guaranteed win. So this is a very important game too, right? Because if Melon God wins this, I think Starburst is done. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. This is the... This is the counter pick. This is your one, I would argue, your one guarantee. I know the last game was close. The first one was not so close. So you figured something out. And what is Clicks going to play here? This could end up being the interesting thing. Last time, it was the Tetradulis. Was that a one-time thing or a for the rest of time thing? It's not going to be that. The Tetras are back in the holster instead. It's going to be going with this same 2v2 that they've been rocking with for the majority of these tournament or of these tournament sets so take it away Osti. this is do or die for starburst it's do or die for Nerecio. you saw that for a second he pushed in yeah. super deep he did but look he actually got out and was able to get a punishment off of that too so hey you bait the opponent to attack you you've got a burst bomb here you can push him back and you've got range as well sorry that is three down a delay Shelton no finally way. back from the spawn saying hey wait a minute i just went down and i'm sorry what clicks of course the flight master himself Nobody does it like this guy. That might have been a quad from Clicks, And the entire game, and perhaps the entire set, flipped entirely on its head. Dude, when you get flanked on a crab, bro, like that is like one of the worst feelings ever. And Clicks manages to just be able to do it time and time again. Look at this. Melon guy, like you said, he took a completely 180. Gonna be able to score off of the top, breaking the first barrier against Starburst putting a second one into boot and continually to climb with even more singular clamps. 54 points remaining. They're still in their home base. This is an opportunity for Melgo to be able to jump in. They are. They're going to try to jump in too. And Kuro Kuro now gets the fight as well. The barrier back up, but the threat is not yet gone. Kyo is there. His old teammate Biscuit clicks him out very, very quickly. They're now going to crash on that, but did Shelton respawn in time now to get the punishment on this? They do take out Nerecio. And now once again, this push, this aggression is not yet done. They're going to push him back even further. And now where are the clams? Kyo's going to be the one to carry it here. They've got a crab and Kuro Kuro in a great position to use it. Gets taken down very quickly. So a great job by Starburst. But it has been all Melon God thus far. Yeah, literally just all on top of their back base. Finally going for a retreating. Realizing it's better to stay alive than try to make for a second push here. Here comes a Booyah Bomb coming out from Kyo. Going to try to throw it right at the clam. To try to like force the power clam user clicks to be able to back up. Here comes the Stamper trying to find its mark. Nerecio is going to back up instead. Recognizes that he's in a 1v3 situation. Going to go back towards his teammates. As we're going to take that pity clam from Kyo a little bit further up. We'll see how this is going to be able to play out. 
Yeah, and you see they used the crab there and weren't able to get a ton of value off of it there. But oh, Biscuit with two indirects that time was not able to secure that splat. That could end up being big there. That meant that any momentum that they had built up or attack on one side moves away. Hold on, Nerishio coming out of a spot where almost everybody would jump out and now attacking instead. Will they be able to maintain a foothold on this side of the map? I think they are. Again, these players coming up with the improvisation to make this work. No. They're going to get a score off of this. Can they get even more? Nerishio using his Zipcaster to stay alive, go back to his spawn point to take that win. It's going to give them plenty of opportunity to be able to go in there and bust open that base. But now that timer is taken. They're not going to get too much mileage out of that. Now Melon God's going to get a power camp clam out of pity there at the very end. And unfortunately, Starburst's push was a little bit lackluster. No, yeah, it's hard to look at that and say if that was a missed opportunity or a successful defense there by Melon God. They'll take it either way, but that's another member going down. That's two going down. Will this Booyah Bomb find anybody? No, and that's huge because they're going to be able to jump up patiently waiting. Will the score go through? They will pay for it dearly, but they are inching closer and closer to taking back this lead. Where's the attack coming from on the left side? Shelton dives. There's nobody to make the punishment on the dive. Now Shelton moving through. Will they close it out? They do. Another trade going off. But Starburst Austin, you can tell, has never gone down more than just a couple. They understand what the possession of this map means to their chances. They're still continually painting it yellow as much as possible. They're in the home base. Going to go back and try to get a power clam again on top of that. There was actually an opportunity for Melon God to pick up the pity clam before a second one spawned, and they did not go for that opportunity. Instead, opting to go for the fight instead because they're recognizing that they're in their home base. I feel like Melon God can't get out. No, they can, and this is a masterclass of aggression over time without sacrificing yourself. They're going to take the lead. They're going to pay for it dearly here. Everybody who was near the basket threw their power claim in and then took a one-way trip back to the spawn. But this is where you start to do a little math in your head, Aussie. There's less than one minute left. You know that one power clam is almost going to get you through the end. You have a lot more work to be done after that. And when two of you go down immediately and you lose mid, it makes it all the while. Finally, Ice saying, hey, I can make some flanks too. Take a look at me. Yeah, he literally going for that opportunity. All of this happened purely because of Melon God's clicks. Uh, flank at the very beginning, trying to get that opening gambit against them, and it's not working out for them in the future. The gambit worked out in the beginning, but we're seeing how strong Starburst works out in the long game for this one, because now there's only 20 seconds left. Melon God going for a clam blit, another crab to try to get some more painting. It's starting to get a little bit blue there in the enemy base. Uh, going for a desperate booyah bomb to prevent a push coming up from Melon God. Gonna go for a trade on top of that. 2v3. This is an opportunity for Melon God trying to go push out here. Gets the stamper. This is gonna be huge for Clicks. Clicks is in the back lane. He's got a power clam. He's gonna force us into an overtime. He got two Two pair of on top of that. Looking for the opportunity. Throws it towards Clicks. The Starburst is going to be able to spawn back in. Overtime has been achieved. Clicks looking for another answer. Gets in there. Scores it. They need one more pair of and they manage to take it. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> what can't these players do, Austin? What can't they do? A scramble situation at the very end where everybody knows where the power clams are. Clicks not entirely sure if I should go in. Wait, I've got a crab. I need to use my crab here. And then at the end, Clicks doesn't even have use in the crab. It's too slow. It would take too long for me to get into this crab. I have more important things to attend to. And one game away now from Melon God. We said earlier that the one thing Starburst needed to do was to win on one of Melon God's counterpicks. This was the one that we had penciled in as a win for Starburst. But every single one of these Clam Blitz games Melon God has clawed closer and closer, figuring things out, trying different things out. And finally, they come up with the Einsteinian feat of simply adding another crab tank to their roster. So, you know, maybe I'm aggrandizing this for nothing, but so many ways that that ending could have gone poorly for them. Asti, you and I take a dive to try to be the hero and we throw the game for our teams. All of these players knew exactly what was required of them at the end and executed upon it. What an incredible comeback victory here in Grand Finals. And I don't want to downplay them too much, Nine, because while they did go for that additional crab to throw into the mix, I think that opening gambit was what actually solved it. Yes, it was a crab, but it was a flanking crab. And I think that's a very big difference in terms of being able to get that opening because that's something Starburst really likes. The, the reason they like Clam Blitz on Museum is because they get that burst opening gambit, get in there, score it, shut it down before anything happens. And speaking of doing that, we're going straight back over to Rainmaker. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is what they won on the other game. So if your first counterpick didn't work, you may as well go to the other one you won on here. 
makes perfect sense on paper and they did win this game by a pretty fair margin so we're not going to talk this one up too much you all know the script at this point what response does starburst have here the comp going to remain the same the pace of play starting to get away from starburst as they try desperately to rewrite the ending to this tournament that they've played through so many times not only in tournament but in their heads they want this so bad Getting a win against a Japanese team would be such a thing to put on their resume, especially with a tournament win. They so desperately want this, be able to just try to get this win against Melon God, because right now it is two to zero. Even if Starburst wins this game, they then have to only play on Melon God's counter picks. That's gonna look really frustrating for them to be able to play this out. So now while we wait for this opening start start to get, you know, going here, we got a special ready to rock here from Zipcaster. Unfortunately, Norishio is gonna go down. It's gonna give Melon God plenty of opportunity to get that big push. Keep an eye on the right side of the screen there where Clicks is fighting against Biscuit. This was the way that they wanted to push. Not only was Biscuit able to win that fight, was actually able to take out another member here too. So an incredible individual effort there by Biscuit means that this push is going to be dead before it can really even get started. Now Kyo trying desperately to get away as Norishio continues to pester there. It doesn't look like there's going to be a ton of follow-up, so Kyo will earn the opportunity to reposition and make another play. Will he be able to make them pay for not finishing the job? It doesn't look like it thus far. The Crab is going to get out. This is going to be mid in control. Now Kyo finally goes down. Norishio going to grab it. Starburst finally I would say maybe the first time in these last couple of games, firmly in control of the flow of this game. They'll walk on over here and would love to take this checkpoint out in the early stages. It's looking like it might be very promising, right? Look how much yellow it is. Unfortunately, gets called out by that bomb. A lot of people would be thinking, why didn't he just push forward? They were definitely waiting for him to do such a thing before trying to get that pickup. So that's why he's playing a little bit more patient, but unfortunately gets called out by the blast radius of the crab. Now we're gonna see another push coming out from Melon God. Jumping in, weaving in, smoothing all over the place. Got Booyah Bum as a smoke screen, be able to shoot off that Rainmaker Blast. Now this is going to be a potential opportunity to then be able to close this out. It is 4v2. This is looking very promising. Managed to break open that first checkpoint. Melon got literally one push away from stealing home their victory in this tournament. Oh, and you can see they immediately moved away there. They wanted to try to build up a Booyah Bomb to deliver the knockout blow. That would have been the one thing that could have got rid of that nest of crabs. Ice has no choice but to reset this right now, but that's going to give up a lot of space. That's their other splashdown, and hold on a minute. I know that those things build up special fast, but if they don't get back quickly, they're not going to have that resource on the defensive side. The Booyah Bomb might be the only thing that can slow this down. Kuro Kuro able barely to get ahead of it, but they were able to spawn just in time. Ice got around. No crab needed that time on the defensive side. 60, not a big push. And actually, on the other hand, they might be able to walk it up to this first checkpoint, depending on which side they try to go to. Looks like they're trying to mix it up right or left. Up to go for the left. we got a retaliation coming out with a crab from Melon God, trying to paint up a little bit of that left side here. Looking for this potential opportunity. They're going to try to make this push. They're about to get caught. They're stuck in the purple. They have to back up. Burst Bomb's coming out. Going to be able to seal the deal. And that's going to end their push. Not going to be able to get that checkpoint. Look at this 1v1 happening. Going to go for a trade. Comes right back in with the Stamper. A wipeout in favor of Starburst. Narishi, are you kidding? He's gone. That's going to be able to another push. Melon God's going to be able to take that and bring it all the way back. And such a scramble situation. The burst bomb's on this, the only avenue of defense in a lot of these pushes, but it slows down the Rainmaker enough so that you can get your sloshing machines over, which is what you would rather be attacking the Rainmaker when it's in that position. Now the Rainmaker actually too, getting into the mix here and doing a little bit of fighting on its own. The sloshing machine jumping out, It'll be a rough landing, I would wager, and it does indeed go down. But Clicks <laughs> actually did a pretty good job of fighting off here. Shelton might be able to move it through here. As they're looking at the Rainmaker, Clicks pops out once again. Narisho going to need to come up huge here to slow this down. More points ticking off the timer. That Rainmaker is in a precarious position. It's an uninkable surface, but it does look like the members of Starburst will hold on to this. I know that trade went the other way, but again, the points start to fly very quickly. That's the one trade we talked about earlier, Osti. That right side, the points fly off, but it's less safe. Yeah, but at this point, you might have to play the more dangerous route, right? That's going to be another fall for Starburst on the Rainmaker. 3v2, trying to paint it back up. You're only by yourself. There's no way you can pick that up and survive. So you're going to have to back up. Going to wait for this opportunity to see how they're going to be able to play this out. Got some crabs ready to rock here. They picked up the Rainmaker yet again on terms of Melon God trying to look for this opportunity. They have that 10 point lead on top of the checkpoint. They definitely want to get a little bit more, at least stall them out because guess what? They have all the time in the world to be able to play as defensive as possible. Going to eventually get pincered by Starburst. And now it's their turn to be able to try to paint as much yellow as possible. They're going to try desperately to break this checkpoint in the last 30 seconds. 
Oh, and they might just do it here. You can see all three members are pushed up here. Bagel's gonna have to get out of Crab here to grab it, but all the other members are pushed ahead. That's another member that they've taken out here. And hold on, they've gone after Kodo Kodo. Did they send too many people after one player? It doesn't appear so thus far. Click's moving ahead of here. They've got a Booyah Bomb. They've got all the protection to get through this checkpoint. They still need a few more points. That Booyah Bomb coming in perfectly timed from the other side. Shelton in a position to make this through. They're gonna have to grab it. Will it be enough? Shelton is there. Kodo Kodo's there. They're gonna grab it. I'm sorry. One point. Unbelievable. Melon God gets it with one point left. One frame left. And they will win 3-0 and be your champions here in Stormbreak. The entire tournament being decided by one singular point. One singular frame to push ever so slightly. If you could just make that move at the very end, they could not pull it off. Melon God with the three to zero win a dominating set win mind you by the way you gotta remember that they were the ones that lost winners finals they won it 3-1 they won it convincingly i you and i hopped into our chat together to watch the back half of that set and there were some close games but it really feel felt like starburst had their finger on the pulse of how this matchup was going to end up going and then so often, as we see happen when these eight players or some transposition of these eight players match it up, we have a very hotly contested set number two and set number three starts to get away. And Melon God making the reset, making the run through. They will be your champion. Again, a salute to Starburst for fighting as hard as they did, losing two games at the very, very end. It almost makes you forget how dominant the Splatoon Sturgeon game was. Both of those other two games, a coin flip, and that's exactly the level that these two teams were playing at against one another. Dude, and now they're gonna take a big, big chunk of that $1,824 prize and 80 cents on top of that. So congratulations to them coming out here, picking on quite the show, which I honestly think is a great send, no, I said send off again, a great finale to 2022 as a year for Splatoon 3. This is gonna look outstanding for them. Looks like first place is gonna take home $820 in 80 cents of that. That is such a big number for Splatoon. Yeah, incredible. Second place, 20% is going to take $364.80. Third, 15% of the prize pool, $273.60. Fourth place, 10%, $182.40. We are paying all the way out to the fifth place teams here today. They will both be taking home $91.20, which is just over 150 Jack in the Box tacos. So don't knock it till you've tried it, my friends. Yeah, so guys, before we send off the stream, we do want to talk a little bit about some upcoming things we got coming up. A lot of future tournaments, a lot more circuits, because even though it might be the end of the year, there's still plenty more on the horizon here for 2023. So first off, I do want to talk about the Megalodon Cup. Uh, this is Millaway IT's own tournament. Same people are bringing it here. This is purely just a Rainmaker tournament. So you already know it's going to be mad aggressive. Dive down deep into a single boat tournament, which is the Rainmaker. Is back with a new year and a new schedule running monthly starting on the 7th of January, which is actually coming up. It's almost New Year's. So go ahead and get that roll in the server for when signups open. Honestly, uh, I don't mean to bust your chops, but it, it's Do pronounced it. Megalodon. Megalodon? Megalodon. Why are you saying Megalodon? it like that? Did I, did I say it right? Megalovania. Did I say, that, that's, that's I'm taking I, the rest of the ad reads. Get out okay. of here. Get out of here. What? IPL Splatoon Advanced Circuit. Ring in the new year with us, folks. IPL SAC returns January for a brand new circuit. Join us on Saturday, January 14th, 2 p.m. Eastern to start earning points for your team. The eight teams with the most points by the end of the fourth tournament will be invited to play in finals and complete to be crowned the best mid-level team in Splatoon 3. And folks, it is hotly contested. Don't get it wrong. That means a lot, especially as all of these new teams in this new game come together to really forge themselves and earn their keep. Dabble Productions, an international Splatoon tournament organization. They host tournaments for Europe and North American time zones, but everybody can join their various tournaments. Dabble streams their tournaments live on Twitch and regularly uploads competitive YouTube videos. To find out more, check out their website at dabble.inc or follow the official Twitter at dappleprod. And Splatoon Stronghold, a stronghold for competitive Splatoon, providing resources to long timers and newcomers alike. The Stronghold is on a mission to make competitive Splatoon more accessible than ever before. To find out more, check out their website at splatoonstronghold.com or follow them on Twitter at SPLStrong. That's all so the ads, folks. So professional, yeah. Nine. Well, th thank you. Well, I'll give you the opportunity then, Osti, here at the end to thank the people who did the work behind the scenes. 
Dude, so this tournament would not have happened with so many people coming up here to be able to put on this great show. First off, I do want to give a shout out to Jub. Jub holding it down with the stream man, driving that spectator cam. I was a huge fan of that camera, by the way. I don't know if you were feeling it, Nine, but I loved so many overhead views. Absolutely. Jub did a fantastic job and give them all the credit in the world. There has been much talk as of late about both commentary and the spectator cam and i hope you can respect the players who are working their hardest to try to make new innovations it's not so easy it's a subjective art form but i very much enjoyed the views that we were getting and when we got them as well yeah it's not an easy job and jub you know stood up and they managed to put on a great show for us so thank you again to that thanks so much to the mit staff just in general for bringing it up toast oh my god toasty you were the greatest man i'm so glad you hit me up for this there was a little bit of a now, back and forth, because I might not have been able to make this tournament because of alternative plans, but I am so, so glad that I was able to fit this into my schedule and work alongside Nine. And so thanks again, Toasty, for hitting me up. I had an absolute blast with this tournament. Thank you to you all, the viewers as well, for making this such an exciting event for us. We put on a show for you all, and the players put on a show for us. We will be doing a little raid here at the end, but before that happens, folks, the truest thanks that you can give is sticking around and watching the credits for all of the folks who put their heart and soul into making this happen. So without further ado, stay fresh, everybody, and roll those credits.